Members, if you are just joining us, there has been a call of the House. Please make sure to push the button at your desk indicating your presence and remain in the chamber until the call is raised. You can continue your conversations, however. Mr. Schiebel, I believe it is the time to start reading the names of those who have not yet returned to the chamber. Representatives Bacon, it's right here. Bird, Representative Bird, Representative Bottoms. Representative Bird is excused. Okay. Bottoms, Bradfield, Catlin, Doherty, DeGraff, Dixon, Holtorf, Luck, Lynch, McCormick, One moment, Mr. Schiebel. Members, if you're just returning to the chamber, this is a call of the House, so if you have not yet done so, please press either button at your desk. Mr. Schiebel, please continue. Okay. Uh, Michael Sin Janay. Ortiz. Sirota. Representative Sirota is excused, and Mr. Shiba, it looks like Representative Morrow is with us remotely. Snyder. Story. She's back there. Woodrow. Representative Young. Just press either button on your desk. Representative Basenecker. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pro tem, I move that the call be raised. It has been moved that the call be raised. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the call is raised. Uh, members, we are going to read a few quick reports before uh, we get started on other business today. Uh, Mr. Schiebel, reports of committees of reference. Committee on Business, Affairs, and Labor, after consideration on the merits of the committee, recommends the following. House Bill 1174 be amended as followed, and also amended to be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Committee on Education, after consideration on the merits of the committee, recommends the following. House Bill 1198 be amended as followed and asked to amend to be referred to the Committee on Finance with favorable recommendation. House Bill 1207 be amended as followed and asked to amend to be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Committee on Transportation, Housing, and Local Government. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 57 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. Message from the Senate. Madam Speaker, the message the from the Senate will be listed in the journal. Message from the reviser. We herewith transmit. The message upcoming. from the reviser will be listed in the journal. The House will stand in a brief recess. The House will come back to order. Members, our first order of business is third reading of bills, final passage. Mr. Schiebel. We are Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of 11 House Bill 1179. House Bill 1179 by Representatives Morrow and Winter, also Senators Hendrickson and Simpson, concerning the maximum uncommitted reserve that may be retained in the Agricultural Products Inspection Cash Fund. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1179 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1179 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Hamrick, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hamrick votes yes. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Morrow votes yes. What are you up to? Thank you, Representative Young. Thank you. 
Representative Catlin excused. Please close the machine. With 55 aye, three no, and seven excused, House Bill 1179 is adopted. Co-sponsors? Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 50. Senate Bill 50 by Senators Simpson and Roberts, also Representatives Holtorf and McCormick, concerning modifications to the Colorado Agricultural Future Loan Program and in connection therewith, modifying the eligibility requirements for the program and eliminating the repeal date for the loan program. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 50 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 50 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Hamrick, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Hamrick votes yes. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Morrow votes yes. yes. Please close the machine. With 56 aye, three no, and six excuse, Senate Bill 50 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1042. Oh, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to lay over House Bill 1042 until tomorrow. Thank you. House Bill 1042 will be laid over until tomorrow. Members, that concludes our third reading for today. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the following bills meets, meet, made special orders at 1.30 p.m. House Bill 1219, House Bill 1202, and Senate Bill 077. Seeing no objection, the bills listed by the majority leader will be made special orders at 1.30 p.m. Ah, uh, Representative Mabry. Woohoo! Members, you have heard the motion. Seeing no objection, the House will now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special orders, and Representative Mabry will take the chair.
The committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be read by title unless there is a request for a reading of a bill at length. Committee reports are printed and in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and on your iPads. Bills will be laid over upon motion of the majority leader and the coat rule is relaxed. Yep. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 23-1219. House Bill 1219 by Representatives Froelich and Amable, also Senators Sullivan and Hansen, concerning establishing a waiting period prior to the delivery of a purchased firearm. Representative Amable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you guys all for being here today. We are here to talk about House Bill 1219. I would like to move House Bill 1219 and the committee report. To the committee report. Uh, in the committee, we passed one amendment, and it, it narrowed the title of the bill. It um, took out a section that refers to local control, and it, instead of stating that in the bill, it referred to the statute that already allows that. And we changed one statistic in the. We changed one statistic in the ledge deck. We thought Colorado was the sixth highest suicide, but it turns out there's some good news there. We're actually the seventh highest. Ask for an I vote. I asked for an I vote. Any further discussion? Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move amendment L029 um, for the committee report and ask it be displayed. Okay, the amendment is before us, please continue. The, uh, I'm not discussing some of the other stuff that, that was changed in this, but I do want to jump to um, page one and strike line eight uh, in the committee report. And um, it, it, not only did it seem redundant, it's, it, it seemed to kind of push, and I actually think the, maybe the reason that uh, this amendment was added, I'm not sure, but maybe the reason this was added is because I did mention in the, in the committee question and answer that uh, the, the bill seems to say that there's going to be a three-day waiting period, and then it says, uh, and the C uh, CBI report, or the, or the longer of the two. And I said, so a three-day waiting period is not necessarily what we're talking about here. It could be 10, 20, 30, 40 days and, um, and both representatives agreed that that was a possibility. And so I think they wanted to make sure that the, that the minimum of three days was in here. And I think we just need to strike that back out. So I move Amendment L029 to the committee report. Any further discussion? Representative Froelich. Thank you, members. I ask for a no vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L-29 to House Bill 1219. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. No. The amendment fails. To the committee report. Representative Taggart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to um, amend the committee report with L014. Move, excuse me, move L014, and if you display it, please. Thank you. The amendment is properly displayed. Representative Taggart. Yes, thank you again. Um, this isn't going to surprise anybody here uh, because I always talk about local control, but in this particular case, local control is problematic. 
And that is, again, with that situation where we have communities that um, cities that border one, um, one to another, giving local control also manipulates the market because one, one community can uh, abide by the three days and another community can do five days or six days. And the next thing you know, one community has a, a market advantage over another. And I don't think we should be allowing for that. Representative Amale. Oh, did you want to speak to this amendment? Oh, yes, please. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, local control, I'm all for. But in this case, it, uh, it's, what you're going to end up having is a, uh, a hodgepodge of regulations going across the state and absolutely no continuity. And what you're asking, what you're looking to do is you're looking to give local control over something that is, is already an infringement. So you're looking at, uh, you're, you're just looking at assigning uh, local communities the ability to infringe on, on the Constitution of Colorado and the United States. Representative Amable. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We already have local control. It's in our statutes, and I ask for a no vote on this amendment. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question for the bill sponsors on this particular amendment to the committee report. So, as the committee report is written, without this amendment, could Boulder County, for example, or the city and of Boulder rather have a 30-day waiting period, 180-day waiting period, a 365-day waiting period? Could uh, any other municipality have any number of days? Because it matters. Um, and we can have a patchwork of days. And is that what we want in the state, further confusing the citizenry with a patchwork of laws? Representative Froelich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm sure Representative Holtorf remembers the debate on this bill that already set this precedent, so we urge a no vote. Representative Holtorf. Mr. Chair, with all due respect, if I remembered the conversation, I wouldn't ask the question, so I would like a little bit of uh, decorum and professionalism to please answer the question. Please. That's what we're supposed to do here, ladies and gentlemen. It's not supposed to be some kind of ping pong match without a ping pong ball. Representative Amable. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the answer to the question is that my county could enact a longer waiting period they can now, and they will still be able to uh, if this bill passes. Representative Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I urge a yes vote on this amendment. As Republicans, we're always for local control, but local control don't trump um, God-given constitutional rights. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on Amendment L014? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L014 to House Bill 1219. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. no. The noes have it, the amendment fails. To the committee report. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the committee report to House Bill 1219. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. The committee report is adopted. To the bill. Representative Amable. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I think a lot of you are sick of me telling my stories up here at the well, but um, I'm just going to give it another go today. My interest in this bill, you guys are all so tall. My interest in this bill is because I have a son who five years ago told me I'm going to get a gun, I need to kill myself. 
He was in the middle of a mental health crisis, and um, he mentioned that several times. At the time, I had access to his debit card account online. And one day, I was looking at it, and I could <coughs> see that he had made a charge at the local gun shop across from Boulder High School. And it was for about 12 bucks. So my, his dad and I went running down to that store and said, what's happening here? And they showed us the background check that he'd filled out. And they showed us the gun that he had decided to purchase. But for whatever reason, the background check did not come back instantly. And they said, well, we'll probably get it back later today, and then we'll call them and we'll sell them the gun. And we were obviously beside ourselves, and we begged them, please don't do that. Please don't sell our son a gun. He wants to kill himself. And they were nice. They were really great people. And they were all there, the, the dad plus his sons, who were the owners of this store, and they signed. They wrote on the background check, don't sell the gun. But I believe that if he had been able to purchase that gun that day, he would be dead now. And instead, five years have gone on, and he's still alive. And I'm really grateful for that. And I don't expect any of you to care whether my son lives or dies. That's not your job. But I do think it's our job here in the legislature to do everything we can to try to prevent preventable suicides. And in the committee, one of the arguments that was made against the bill is that people who want to kill themselves will just find another way. And I want you all to know that before he tried to buy the gun, he tried to hang himself. And we found him in his room, lying on the ground with a noose around his neck, and the light fixture broken on the ground around him. He was still alive. And then he tried to swallow a bottle of pills. And it turns out you can't kill yourself with Risperdone. And so we took him to the hospital, and they monitored him, and he lived. But had he gotten the gun that day, I, think, I don't think we would have had the same outcome. And I talked to him about this bill a few days ago. And he's really glad that he's alive. He has a life worth living. And he is, the gun shop owner said to me, he seemed like such a nice young man. And the thing is, he is a nice young man. But he has a terrible disease. And sometimes it causes him to do things that aren't great. And one of those things was to try to kill himself. So I urge all of you to really think about your own families and what may or may not happen for you in your life. And what is the role here that we're, we're all asked to, to, to do? And I urge you to vote yes on this bill. Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. While I, while I don't think it um, would be shocking to you, the representative from Boulder, uh, while I will debate against this bill today, I do want to put on the record that I genuinely do care about the life of your son. I genuinely do. I may disagree on the policy that best protects the people in our state, including your son, but I just want you to know from the depth of my heart, that I genuinely care about your son. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to start by saying this is a difficult bill for the, re the reasons that have been uh, raised already here this morning. And uh, for that, I would like to uh, thank Representative uh, Vigil for uh, discussing the language around this, uh, this bill, with because uh, it, it does deal with very sensitive topics. It deals with very sensitive topics. And I think it's fair to say that 
I do, I know I do, and I think we all do care whether anybody in this state lives or dies, especially, especially someone, uh, a member of this, of this body. But I do care. I care deeply that this would affect anybody. So this is a difficult bill. And it is, there, is a, there is a basis, a very, very good intention basis. And mental health and suicide are serious issues, and they need to be addressed. But there is a significant history, and there is a significant reason why our, the framers of our Constitution bounded our decision making in the Constitution the way it did. And whether that's the Second Amendment, the First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, or the Fourteenth Amendment, there is a very, very, there are, there are many historic reasons why our Constitution, why our lawmaking ability was framed in that matter, in that manner. Our power in this body, our just power, not our only power, but our only just power comes from the consent of the governed, and the consent of the governed is what we told them that we would be taking an oath as we took an oath to the Constitution. So there will be disagreement today on the value, on not on the, certainly not on the value of life. The value of life is, is primary. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life is first. We can't negate life. We shouldn't negate life. So this is not about, this is not about whether this is not about whether any one person's life is valuable, because each and every person's life is valuable. But this is, a, this is a matter of how we govern. And our just powers, <clears throat> according to the oath we took, are derived from the consent of the governed and from the constraints of the Constitution to which we took an oath. So the entire premise of the, uh, the bill is based on a study and a, a, from Complete Colorado, a David Koppel color, discusses the Colorado bill forcing the delay of firearms acquisition and states immediately that it's on shaky ground. And this was the testimony, uh, his testimony also for 23-12-19. So I'm just going to read it. And this testimony considers, covers two subjects. First, the constitutionality of forced delays on firearms acquisition. And that goes directly to the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment. Second, House Bill 23-1219's claim that one study estimates that mandatory waiting periods to receive firearms led to a 7 to 11 percent reduction in suicides by firearm. The study also suggests that the delay that delaying the purchase of firearms by a few days reduces firearms homicides by 17%. So regardless of the constitutionality of this bill, that is something that's worth, that is something in itself that is worth discussing. The bill is on very shaky grounds constitutionally. Forced, forced delays in firearm acquisitions by adults did not exist when the Second Amendment was ratified in 1791, nor in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was ratified and made the second, and made the Second Amendment enforceable against state governments. Forced waiting periods are therefore unconstitutional under the Supreme Court's 2022 Bruin and 2008 Heller precedents. As for this study, the lack of confidence that the drafters of HB 23-1219 have in that study is shown by the choice to not even mention the study's name. And I can attest to that because I asked for the study, I asked for the location of the stats, and they were not provided. Lest interested parties find the study and read what it actually says. The study by business school professors Michael Luca et al. was published in the Journal of PNAS. The study finds that background checks have no statistically discernible effect on homicide or suicide, and actually may lead to a statistically significant increase in crime and suicide. Now, I don't know how that would be possible, 
but what it does is it shows that there are flaws in this singular study. And you also have to look at what this study was trying to prove. The study was trying to prove that there, were, that there was value in that. And any time you set out to try to prove something, you are automatically at risk of what's called confirmation bias and just simply, simply reasserting your own, your own bias. Thus, persons who had genuine confidence in the PNAS study would be introducing legislation to repeal the 2013 Colorado statute that expanded background checks to include non-commercial firearms transfer and loans. So again, the study actually statistically found that, it may lead, that the delays may lead statistically significant increases in crime and suicide. So the logical conclusion would be to eliminate the del delays and eliminate the background checks. While well, finding that background checks have no beneficial effects, the study claims that handgun waiting periods reduce the gun homicide by 17%. If true, then in states that do not have waiting periods, about 17% or one in six of all gun homicides are perpetrated with a handgun that was purchased just a few days before the homicide. If this were true, then the bill's proponent should be able to list hundreds of examples of recent Colorado homicides in which the person went to a gun store, passed a background check, bought a handgun, and murdered someone within a few days. However, according to the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, not a convenience store, and explosives, fewer, only, fewer, only about 10% then only about 10% of gun crimes in Colorado were acquired within three months of the crime. So now we're looking at three months before there's a statistical advantage and the sponsors have already said that their bill would allow local control to, to up this just on whim. So anybody, anybody citing any study would now be able to just increase, increase the infringement on the Second Amendment based on this. So this is, this, is, this is not a closed-ended infringement on the Second Amendment. This is an open-ended infringement. Thus, it is implausible that 17% of gun homicides are perpetuated with handguns purchased just a few days before the murder. Finally, the PNAS article does not distinguish between offensive criminal homicide from defensive justifiable homicide. Therefore, we do not know how much of any homicide reduction was because victims were denied the means to defend themselves against attackers such as stalkers. We discussed this in the committee, and there are quite often times, and the uh, detective did mention that there are numerous times when somebody uh, requests a, an emergency concealed carry permit or emergency carry permit, and then the detective has to tell them, it's like, you can have the permit, but you can't have the gun. So we also don't know how many people were killed in the process of waiting this three days, and that's significant because we are looking, we're, we're saying, we're, we're basing this around the value of life, and we've determined that life is valuable. And if life is valuable, the life of a victim is also valuable. Whether that victim was at their own hand, or whether that victim was at the hand of somebody else. The people that seek an emergency restraining order, that seek an emergency concealed carry permit, are living in terror. And what is, what is given to them when they come and they say, my life is in danger, is they are given the opportunity to run and hide. Again, Firearms, what firearms do is they equalize the playing field. Playing field may be a bad word in this case, but they equalize an imbalance of force between somebody who would use force against you and your ability to protect yourself. The Constitution calls on the laws of nature and nature's God. So we look to the Constitution, and the Constitution says, look to the laws of nature and nature's God for these rules. And you can look at any animal. There is, there is no place that in nature that we do not expect self-defense. Self-defense is an innate value in our Constitution as founded and recognized through the laws of nature and nature's God. There's, there's nobody 
that would fault any animal. If you walk up and you assault an animal, that animal has every right to assault you back. If you go up and assault a person, that person has the right to defend themselves, and the Constitution recognizes that. Since 1992, Mr. Koppel goes on, I've been a research director at the Independence Institute in Denver. I am also an adjunct law professor at the University of Denver, a senior fellow at the University of Wyoming College of Law Firearms Research Center, and an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute in DC. My scholarship and briefs have been cited in seven Supreme Court options and seven US Supreme Court options by Justices Alito, Bryan, Kagan, Stevens, and Thomas. Most recently, in Justice Thomas's opinion for the Court of New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, I have also been cited by 29 U.S. Circuit Court of Appeal decisions, including three in the Tenth Circuit and by 28 state or territorial appellate, appellate courts. In the 2008 Supreme Court case, District of Columbia versus Heller, I sat at the council table and assisted the presentation of the oral argument. My late father, Jerry Koppel, served 11 terms as a Democratic state, sen state representative from Northeast Denver. He and I are co-authors of the book, Jerry Koppel's Rules for State Legislators. So that just establishes some of the credentials of the gentleman writing this testimony. As Bruin rules, Bruin's rules, in the 2023 case, a Bruin case, the Supreme Court instructed lower courts to use the same Second Amendment methodology that the Supreme Court had used in Heller in 2008 and in McDonald versus Chicago in 2010. Namely, when the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual conduct, the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. The government must then justify its regulation by demonstrating that it is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. So again, when the Second Amendment's plain text, and we do have plain text in the Second Amendment, shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed is pretty plain. When the Second Amendment's plain text, saying shall not be infringed, covers the individual's conduct, the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. The government must then justify its regulations by demonstrating that it is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. The right to keep arms necessarily implies the right to acquire arms. HB, so if it implies that it must be a choir arm, then you would have to make that statement and say, the right to acquire arms shall not be infringed. So that's, not, that's nothing in terms of the gravity of the situation that the good representative brought up, but the Constitution, to which we took an oath, very specifically says the right to keep and bear arms, which implies the right to acquire arms. And those are the constraints that we've set. It's not, again, to say that this is not a problem that we, need, that we don't need to solve. It's just saying that we have a problem that we need to solve, and we need to solve it within the bounds that were assigned, that we agreed to. Those are the rules of the game that we play here. We have a set of rules. We have a set of boundaries. We, we solve problems in accordance with those set of rules. Otherwise, there are no rules and we're just making it up as we go along. That is not good for anybody. The right to keep arms necessarily implies the right to acquire arms. 23, uh, 1219 bill implies, HB 1223, 1219 bill applies only to firearms, not other goods. The bill delays all acquisitions of firearms by three days. Now, I don't think in this case he's advocating that we now put a three-day waiting period on everything. He's just saying that we don't have a three-day waiting period on anything, so the three-day waiting period on purchasing a firearm is an infringement on the right to acquire arms and therefore an infringement on the Second Amendment. Therefore, the government must then justify its regulation by demonstrating that it is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. According to Bruin, judges, may not engage in policy-based interest balancing, nor may they defer to legislative judgments. Rather, 
the deference is due to the fundamental right that the people chose to safeguard by ratifying the Second Amendment. That we ratified the Second Amendment, a very specific right, a positive right, made sure that was in, in there instead of just relying on the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but specifically designating the right to keep and bear arms, the right to acquire arms. Rather than making policy judgments, judges must simply decide whether a particular gun control is consistent with a nation's historic tradition of firearm regulation. The burden of proof is on the government, which must affirmatively prove that its firearms regulation is part of the historic tradition that delimits the outer bounds of the right to keep and bear arms. Direct quote. That tradition is based on the understanding of the founding era but it may be elucidated by later developments according to the court. Developments close to the founding era are most important, those of the late 19th century much less so, and those of the 20th century not at all. Some modern gun control laws are very similar to earlier laws created in established tradition. For example, the laws against shooting a gun towards the sky in a crowded area where the falling bullet would injure a random person. Similar many states historically provided extra punishment for crimes that involved the misuse of certain types of arms, just as modern laws do. Other modern laws may be justified by an analogy to older laws. For example, starting in the 1830s, a number of states enacted laws requiring that persons carrying handguns must post a bond. If a court found that the person had been behaving in a way that threatened to breach the peace, these laws could be analogized to some modern restrictions on carrying arms by persons who have been acting dangerously. So there is a precedent that there could be some restrictions on persons who have been acting dangerously, but not on the general populace. This bill does not address whether people have been acting dangerously and pursuing something like a bond on their, on their actions. Instead, it addresses a general infringement on the right to acquire and bear arms. To justify a gun control, the government must show a well-established and representative historical analog, not a historical twin. So even if a modern day regulation is not dead ringer for historical precursors, it still may be analogous enough to pass the Constitution. Constitution, it still may be analogous enough to pass constitutional muster. Considering that this bill is very contentious, it would be appreciated if everybody would keep their conversations low, and at least since you haven't probably read the paper. Two key factors control analogies under Bruin's rules, why and how. How means whether modern historic regulations impose a comparable burden on the right of armed self-defense. Why means whether that burden has been comparably justified. Why looks for similarity in the purpose of gun controls. For example, the surety of the peace statutes mentioned above were enacted to discourage dangerous behavior while carrying firearms by persons who had been proven to act have been acting irresponsibly. Again, this bill, this bill does not purport to address people who have been acting dangerously or irresponsibly. What it says is it wants, it is a restriction, a general restriction, a general re infringement on everybody. How considers the scope of the burden imposed? For example, the surety laws applied only to the small part of the population that was found in court to have been acting wrongfully. We have a judicial tradition of being innocent until proven guilty. And so this the restriction that was found that you could say was constitutionally justified applied only to the small part of the population that was found in court in court, deprived by due process. They were found in court, they were convicted of acting wrongfully, the law and irresponsibly, because rights incur responsibilities. 
the laws forced either, per, either the person to stop carrying or to post a bond, yet they did not forbid the person to keep arms at home. So this is, the, this is getting into the tradition. What about waiting periods before 1900, a little closer to our Constitution, before judicial activism? What about waiting periods? Under the modern Supreme Court doctrine, this is an easy case. There were no waiting periods on firearms or other arms anywhere in the United States before 1900. The first waiting period law was enacted in California in the 1923. A one day wait for a handgun sales. A minority of other states enacted handgun waiting periods, period laws in the 1920s and 1930s. Under Bruin, analogies from the 1920s are far too late to offer any insight into the original public meaning of the Second Amendment. Historic laws, law analogies to waiting periods. Because there was not an iota of pre-1900 historical precedent for waiting period laws, the next question is whether there might be other historical laws to which analogies might be drawn. Were there other types of laws that in some way delayed an adult from being able to keep a firearm in his or her home? Yes. Yes, there were. And this is important. These laws that required some people to receive a license in order to keep a gun at home. These laws did not necessarily require waiting. A fortunate a fortunate applicant might apply at the county courthouse in the morning and walk out with a license before lunch. However, it seems plausible that, as with lots of other government licensing, the licensing authority might not issue a license immediately. It's worth noting that all of the pre-1900 licensing laws were systemically racist, an enduring problem for some gun control laws then and now. Why were they racist? Because the gun control laws were about subjugation. With one exception, Florida in 1893, all of the licenses were textually applicable only to people of color. The Florida law was textually, textually neutral, but was never enforced against white people. That should be concerning. That should be very concerning. The first gun control law in America was enacted by the colony of Virginia in 1619. Blacks and Indians who were not housekeepers nor listed in the militia were generally prohibited from bearing arms. However, these blacks and Indians living on frontier plantations could possess arms if they were granted a license to keep and use guns, powder, and shot. Again, these laws were racist, they were about subjugation. The first session of Mississippi's ter territorial legisla legislature declared in 1799 that no Negro or mulatto shall keep or carry any gun, powder, shot, club, or other weapon whatsoever, offensive or defensive. And that might seem a little crazy, but we know that countries in Europe, you are not allowed to carry a gun, and then you are not allowed to carry a knife and then you are not allowed to defend yourself whatsoever. And crime skyrockets because everybody's just a target. In some of these countries, people will just walk into your house in the middle of the day, take whatever they want. It's just open shopping because there is no threat. And it's easier to get the stuff when somebody's home. However, the commanding officers of legions could grant free black householders up to 12 months license to own and carry arms. Slaves could also receive a permit on application of their owners showing sufficient cause. Why such indulgence should be granted? If, if their owners showed sufficient cause, why such indulgence should be granted? In 1822, a statutory revision gave licensing powers to the justices of the peace for slaves and to county courts for free blacks, and did not limit the duration of licenses. The licensing system was replaced by a prohibition in 1852, because once you go down the road, historically, of infringing, you're going to get more infringement. 
Just like in everything else, we need to read history like it's a warning from the future. Maryland's 1806 statute forbade any Negro or mulatto within this state to keep any dog or gun. However, a free Negro or mulatto could keep apply to a justice of the peace for a license valid for no more than one year, or to keep, or to keep one dog, or to carry a gun. So no weapons, no dogs, no guns. Once you go down the road of infringing on somebody's constitutional rights, your governments, your local governments, will find more reason to infringe on your constitutional rights. It seems to be pretty much 100%. That's probably not the intent here. But history shows it will be the result. Maryland's 1806 statute forbade any Negro or mulatto within the state or to keep one dog or carry one gun. North Carolina in 1841 required that all free persons of color must have an annual license from the court of pleas and quarter sessions in order to own or carry firearms, swords, daggers, or bowie knives. So if we think they're just coming after our guns now, history would tell us otherwise. Because the laws the restrictions on guns won't have the they won't have the desired effect and then so the the infringements will continue to escalate the law was challenged and upheld in 1844 state versus newsom a trial court had ruled that arms licensing was a plain violation of the state constitutional right to keep and bear arms the state supreme court unanimously agreed however said the Supreme Court, free people of color, because they were a subordinate caste, this is what they, the Supreme Court said of the subord, what kind of class, caste? It's a subordinate caste. What was the purpose, what was the purpose of these firearm laws? Subordination. Free people of color have been among us as a separate and distinctive, distinct class requiring from necessity, in many cases, separate and distinct legislation. It was up to the control of the county court, oh, passing these laws down to the, giving the control, giving the option of further subjugation down to the county, giving them the power to say, in the exercise of a sound discretion, who of this class of persons shall have a right to the license, or whether any shall, whether any shall have that right. So here we have a constitutional right, and it's passed down, it's passed down to the county court to see if anyone shall have the right to keep and bear arms. Now, if you know the, about rights, rights are not granted by the Constitution. Rights are recognized as granted, as endowed by our Creator. The case is an example of mischief that results when judges think they can invent reasons for not following the plain text of the Constitution. What is the plain text of the Constitution? The plain text of the Constitution is that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And what did that assume about, and that was assumed to, uh, to apply to purchases for acquiring, acquisition. This case, the case, is an example of the mischief that results when judges think that they can invent reasons not to follow the plain text of the Constitution. So here we have today, we have reasons. We have reasons. It's not a bad reason, it's a good reason. We want to protect life. We want to protect life at every level. But this is what happens this is an example of the mischief when judges think they can invent reasons to not follow the plain text of a constitution. The North Carolina approach foreshadowed the U.S. Supreme Court's 1856 decision in Dred Scott versus Sanford and held that free blacks were not citizens of the United States. Otherwise, warned the county court majority, free blacks would be, they would be what? they would be entitled to the privileges and immunities of citizens. 
So their citizenship by, in Dred Scott versus Sanford was eliminated, and it was declared that free blacks were not citizens of the United States. Otherwise, the court warned the court majority that free blacks would be entitled to the privileges and immunities of citizens, including, and in quotes, carry arms wherever they went. So why were, why were free blacks, why were free blacks decide, or were they, were they restricted? They were restricted from carrying arms wherever they went. So not only were they restricted, they were denied citizenship for that very reason. Gun control laws, regardless, we're not, we're not talking about the intention of this bill today. What we're talking about is the, the second order effects, the third order effects of what happens downstream. What happens when somebody else that has less good intentions can all of a sudden say, you get to have a gun, you get to be a citizen. Not you, these people get to be citizens, these people don't get to be citizens. Indeed, a key legal distinction between free and slave is the former is armed and the latter is not. Representative DeGraff, can you please stick to the bill? I am on the bill. This is, this is the study. This is the study that is cited. This is the testimony and analysis of the study that was in there. And so this is the background of that bill. And as we noted earlier in the session, as Huey Newton, the, the, uh, anybody, an unarmed man, is a slave or subject to slavery at any minute. Obviously, so this is going into the history of the decisions that were cited in the bill. So, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate your leadership, but this is directly related to this bill. After losing the Civil War, the former Confederate states grudgingly accepted the abolition de du jour by law slavery via the 13th Amendment which historically was only passed because of the three-fifths compromise. However, they aimed to keep the former slaves in a condition of de facto servitude. The antebellum laws about slaves and free blacks were reenacted as black codes, imposing many of the incidents of slavery of the freedmen. Among these incidents were prohibitions on arms possession without advance permission. And the antebellum laws, of course, are what the, uh, the ending of which was the celebration of Juneteenth. The first session of the Florida legislature following the Confederate defeat provided, it shall not be lawful for any legal mulatto or any person of color to own, to own, to use, or to keep in his possession or under his control any bowie knife, dirk, sword, firearms, or ammunition of any kind. Which goes against Frederick Douglass of saying that we have three boxes. We have the, the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box. There was an exception if a probate judge had issued a license based on the recommendation of two respectable citizens of the country, county certifying the peaceful and orderly character of the applicant. The penalty was forfeiture of the weapon. Forfeiture of the weapon plus 39 lashes. I think, the, I think the penalty in this case is $5,000 or something like that. Or one hour in the pillory. White supremacist Mississippi required a license from the county board of police. If the defendant could not pay the fine, he would be hired out for labor to a white person who was paid the fine. Again, Re Representative DeGraff, I will ask you to please stick to the bill. This, is, this bill is about a three-day waiting period. We appreciate the history lesson, but well, please is, stick to the bill. This is going to the history of the laws of the waiting periods that are whether, because we need to, we need to decide, we need to determine whether these laws are even constitutional. And this is their study. They, they cited this study, the, the, the proponents of this bill cited this study, and this is an analysis by a very esteemed, I'm assuming Democrat, who 
did an analysis of all the applicable laws, has been cited in Supreme Court, and it seems that we are doing ourselves a disservice if we don't analyze all the laws, because this law will be challenged constitutionally at, at no insignificant cost to the state. So we should listen, we should listen to the analysis and the reasons for some of these gun control laws. The Florida-Mississippi laws and other forms of con former con Confederacy restricting firearms possessing the freedmen lead, led to corrective action by Congress, the Civil Rights Act, the Second Amendment, freed the Second Freedmen's Bureau Bill, and finally the 14th Amendment. Every one of them was explicitly intended by its sponsors to protect the rights, protect the arms rights of the freedmen. So the Civil Rights Act was aimed at, keep, at protecting the arms rights of the freedmen. Because of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, racist gun control laws after the enactment of the amendment in 1868 now had to be rewritten in a language that was formerly racially neutral. The closest historic analog was forced, for forced weights. So this is a historical reference to the waiting periods that we're looking to impose and infringe upon the Second Amendment rights. So this is directly speaking to the bill. To exercise the right to keep arms was an 1893 Florida statute that required owners of Winchesters and other repeating rifles to apply for a license from the Board of County Commissioners. In 1901, the law was extended to also include handguns as amended whoever shall carry around with or have in his manual possession in any county in this state any pistol, Winchester rifle, I suppose that would be their equivalent of an assault rifle at the time, not that that exists, or repeating rifle without having a license from the county commissioners of the respective counties of the state should be fined up to $100 or imprisoned for 30 days. In 1941, a case arose as to whether a handgun in an automobile glove box fit within the statutory language on his person or his manual possession. By five to two, the Supreme Court held that it did not. No license was necessary to carry a handgun repeating rifle in an automobile. A four justice majority granted the defendant's petition for habeas corpus because of the rules of lenity. lenity. In case of ambiguity, ambiguity criminal statutes could should be construed narrowly. Justice Rivers, Buford concluded with a four justice majority opinion. His opinion went straight to the core of the problem with, statute 30, with the statute. The Florida Constitution of 1885 had provided the right of the people to bear arms in defense of themselves and the lawful authority of the state shall not be infringed. In defense of themselves, the right of the people to bear arms in defense of themselves and the lawful authority of the state shall not be infringed, but the legislature may prescribe by the manner which they may be born. Concurring, Justice Buford wrote that the statute should be, held, should be held to violate the Florida Constitution and the Second Amendment. I concur in the judgment of discharging the relator because I think Section 5100, 7202 is unconstitutional because it offends against the Second Amendment. Uh, to the Constitution of the United States and Section 20 of the Declaration of Rights of the Constitution of Florida, which would be similar to the Constitution of Colorado. Proceeding in habeas corpus will lie the discharge of one who is held in custody under a charge based on an unconstitutional statute. The statute, supra, does not attempt to prescribe the manner in which arms may be borne, but definitely infringes on the right of the citizen to bear arms guaranteed him under the section 20 of the Declaration of the Rights of the Florida Constitution. He explained the history of the exorbitant licensing laws of 1893 and 1901. I know something of the history of legislation. The original act of 1893 was passed when there was a great influx of Negro laborers in this state here for the purpose of working in turpentine and labor camps. The same condition existed when the act was amended in 1901 and the act was passed for the purpose of disarming the Negro laborers and to thereby re reduce the unlawful homicides that were prevalent in the turpentine and sawmill camps and to give the white citizens in sparsely settled areas a better feeling of security. 
So why was the gun control law? Rep Let's Representative see. DeGraff, hang on one second. Members, it's getting pretty loud in here. If you guys could uh, keep it down, take your conversations uh, outside. Uh, thank you. Uh, continue, Representative DeGraff. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. These were not, these restrictions were not ill-founded. The same condition existed in the Act of 1901 for the purpose of, of disarming the Negro laborers and thereby reduce the unlawful homicides that were prevalent in the turpentine and sawmill camps and to give the white citizens in sparsely settled areas a better feeling of security. The statute never intended to be applied to the white population and in practice has never been so applied. We have no statistics available, but a safe guess is to assume that more than 80% of the white men living in rural section of Florida have violated this statute. It is a safe guess to say that not more than 5% of the men in Florida who own pistols and repeating rifles have ever applied to the County Board of Commissioners for a permit to have the same in their possession, and there, there have never been any effort to enforce the provisions of this statute as to white people because it is generally conceded to be in contravention of the Constitution and therefore non-enforceable if contested. So here's the problem with creating a law that violates a precedent of being unenforceable if contested. One reason that a person might need a firearm right away in defense against violent mobs from whom the police cannot or will not control. In 1893, Florida law appears to have enacted to prevent pe black people from their right of self-defense against lynch mobs, lynch mobs being they were extrajudicial murder. The first anti-lynching mob was in 1918 by Congressman Dyer in 1918, and they were sat on and filibustered away all the way to 1938 with uh, Roosevelt's fourth term. And lynch mobs were not a casual affair, over 4,000 victims, torture, and dismemberment. Why? Because they were disarmed. They did not have the right to have guns. They were subject to torture and disarmament. And when Roosevelt and his vice president had the opportunity to do something about it, they did nothing. When a white man, having been killed by a Negro and threats of lynching the prisoner from the Duval County Jail being made, a large concourse of mob of Negroes assembled around the jail and defied and denied the sheriff of the county to ingress the building. This mob, refusing to disperse upon reading of the riot act by the sheriff, he called for the assistance of the militia to aid them in enforcing the laws. Again, an unarmed person is a slave or subject to slavery at any minute. Representative DeGraff, I the will Bruin ask you again to please stick to the bill. I understand when you were reading past laws that had to do with gun restrictions, how that related to the bill. What you were talking about now is not that. Please stick is, to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is still the analysis of the study, and it is a, an in-depth analysis. You could say the, you could summarize it, but it was already summarized in the Constitution that it shall not be infringed, yet here we are today contemplating whether we should or should not infringe on the Constitution. So before we go down that road, it seems prudent to discuss the history of the laws. So yes, Mr. Chair, I do appreciate your leadership, but this does speak directly to the bill. The Bruin opinion, to pre, because it's often also, the Bruin is also often repeat, uh, cited, the Bruin opinion repeated the Supreme Court's wis, words of wisdom from the 2010 case of McDonald versus Chicago, which, so this is fairly recent, which held that the city's handgun ban was unconstitutional. The constitutional right shall, to bear arms in a public place for self-defense is not a second-class right, subject to an entirely different body of rules than any other, than the other Bill of Rights guarantees. We know of no other constitutional right that an individual may exercise only after demonstrating to the government officers of some special need. So what they're saying is that there's there is no other constitutional right that we restrict. And also the warning, the implied warning that if you're going to restrict one right, 
you're probably going to be willing to restrict other rights. Nowhere else in American law are there arbitrary delays about when a law-abiding American adult may, be, may acquire an item to exercise constitutional rights in his or her own home. If there were no Second Amendment rights, then HB 23, 1219 would not violate the U.S. Constitution. Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg and his various lobbying entities attempted, are, who are supporters of 23, 19, uh, 1219, they previously tried unsuccessfully to convince the courts that Americans have no Second Amendment rights. The effort at the constitutional nullification failed to impose an arbitrary time period forbidding an adult to exercise a Second Amendment right to keep arms is unlawful. So this is a, this would be considered for all the best reasons in the world, for all the valid reasons in the world, for all the reasons that we want to protect life at every single level in this country. But it is not constitutional. Going back to the PNAS study, 2319 oddly does not name the study to which it indirectly refers as the, only, as the only empirical justification for waiting periods. Here is the citation for the study that HB 23-1219 dared not name. Michael Lewis, Michael Luca, uh, Christopher Palquin, and Malorta. Handgun Waiting Periods Reduced Gun Deaths, Volume 114 of PNAS Issue 46, pages 12,162 through 65, November 14, 2017. So this is not a new study. The authors are, professor, are professors at Harvard Business School. Notably, the PNAS authors do not distinguish between criminal homicide from justifiable, justifiable defensive homicide. Both are, being, are treated as equally bad. So the study here, the study that is the only empirical justification for waiting periods does not differentiate between self-defense and criminal offense. They are both treated as equally bad. One way that waiting periods can reduce homicide, one way that waiting periods can reduce homicide is by preventing victims from shooting criminals because those two are classified in the same manner, reducing homicide also includes not stopping a criminal assailant. For example, a waiting period to prevent a stalking victim from immediately being able to defend themselves while the victim is forced to wait, the criminal is not. Whether the criminal has a gun or not, the criminal is not, a, is not forced to wait. Most likely, the criminal has an advantage in force. The purpose of the gun, the purpose of the gun is to equalize the level of force. Oh, thank you. Well, the victim is forced to wait, the criminal is not, because the criminal can buy a gun on the black market. Gun laws are likely to be followed by people who follow laws. You can say that more succinctly, but if you make guns, if you criminalize guns, only criminals will have guns. The result might be one fewer homicide since the victim of rape and assault was prevented from shooting the perpetrator. Now, as for me, a rapist getting shot, I'm okay with that. They brought that on themselves. The PNAS article makes no claims about how much of the gun homicide reduction was from fewer homicides by criminals rather than fewer justifiable homicides by the victims of criminal attacks. It would seem that that is a characterization that is worth making. To combine, to combine self-defense with criminal offense is, is, really, is really unconscionable. Conscionable, but that is what the study did. And that is the only, this study is the only empirical justification for waiting periods. Similarly, the PNAS article does not investigate whether non-homicide crimes, such as attacks by stalkers, increased in states that adopted the waiting periods. Again, 
somebody going to get an emergency concealed carry permit could be issued an emergency carry permit and still be required three days waiting period. Well, guess who else knows that that person has a three-day waiting period before they can legally obtain a gun? The criminal. The criminal knows exactly that and they will take advantage of that law. Social science studies that aim to test the hypothesis, such as whether a particular item, example, waiting period, affects a particular outcome, gun homicides, must further con must control for other factors that might cause the outcome increase or decrease. The PNA authors controlled for alcohol consumption, poverty, income, urbanization, black population, and seven age groups. That is a good start but the authors failed to take into account other factors that have major effects on homicide. Changes in police resources, more police per capita tend to lead to less crime. Incarceration rates, more criminals in prison generally associated with reduced crime on the streets. Educational attainment. As education improves, crime tends to fall. We already had a bill on that earlier this year. We allocated money, we allocated funds for the prisons to to increase the education rate and to decrease the recidivism. And crime rates in general, if all types of crime are falling, then chart changes in gun control laws might not be the example explanation for a fall in gun crime. One does not need to delve into control variables to decide that the PNAS business professors are not only credible on gun, po are not credible on gun policy. So most likely, they would be considered to have an ax to grind. Yet their study is the only, cited as the only empirical love justification for waiting periods, and this study was from 2017. Hardly new. The very performance proponents of HB 23, 1219, who cherry pick quotes from the PNS, PNAS article, are obviously do not believe the article. It's either all or nothing. The article is valid or it's not. It's the only one cited. Representative, Representative DeGraff, please do not impugn the motives or beliefs of other members of this body. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I did not think I was impugning. I was just specifying the, uh, about the nature of the article being all correct or all not. The PNAS article finds that background checks have no statistically discernible benefits in reducing homicide or suicide. Yet, the background check is cited, well, it's really step one, but it's cited as step two in the bill because it is the controlling one, and we've established that that background check could take 30, 60, 90 days. That's 30, 60, 90 days that somebody might have to be in hiding. One of your loved ones might have to be in hiding because they applied for emergency concealed carry permit because they're afraid of an assailant, and now they get to wait 30, 60, 90 days. They have to be in hiding. No statistically discernible benefits in reducing homicide or suicide. In fact, some of the data show that background checks to be associated with statistically significant increase of 15% in non-gun related homicide. I don't think anybody really cares how they got homicided. They were, homicided is now a word. I'm gonna call it out, I'm just making that a word right now. As they were, as they were homicided. I just want to see if anybody was paying attention. Besides Madam Majority Leader. And with a statistically statistic significant increase of 11% in total suicide. So here we're trying to, we're in introducing a bill that violates the Constitution that shows a significant increase in homicide and an 11% increase in total suicide, including nearly 20%, 0.199, increase in non-gun suicide. I don't understand this, the way they did it, but that's, that's the results of the one study of the only empirical justification for waiting periods. None of the tables or models show any statistical benefit for background checks, yet we pay for them. According to the PNAS article, background checks have no statistically significant benefits and might actually be quite harmful. In contrast, waiting periods 
In contrast, waiting periods are said to have large benefits. If the lobbyists who write up talking points based on PNAS art actually believed the article, they would be lobbying to repeal background checks. And background checks are part of this bill. They're part of the two-step process. To believe in PNAS, you have to believe that a law prevents some people <coughs> excuse me, from ever acquiring guns lawfully. I'm not a preacher, so I don't do this all the time. Background checks accomplishes nothing and may even increase the danger, especially for the victim. Whereas in contrast, the law delays acquisition by several delays days by people who pass background checks has enormous benefits. This defies common sense. The background check statute enacted by the legislature in 2013 applies to far more than the purchase of firearms. It even applies to temporary transfers of more than 72 hours. For example, a person who is going out on vacation wants to store the guns, his or her guns at a neighbor's house to prevent them from being stolen while their home is empty. Under the current Colorado, Colorado law, the gun owner and the temporary holder must both to the gun, go to the gun store, there the gun will require both parties to fill out all paperwork and pay for all fees if the temporary holder were buying an arm from the store's inventory. The process must be repeated for every single firearm. Then when the gun owner returns from vacation, she and the temporary holder must return to the gun store. They must fill out the same paperwork and the same fees apply as if the gun owner were buying new guns from the store. This bureaucratic burden is already ridiculous, and HB 23, 1219 would bring the burden to the point of absurdity, or well past. When the guns were being loaned for safe storage, the owner would have to return to the gun store three days later to pick up the guns. Likewise, when the vacation had ended, the gun owner would have to go to the store twice, three days apart, in order to get his gun, her own guns back. The fiscal note for the 2013 background check budgeted for 200,000 additional background checks annually for private sales and loans. Instead, the number of checks on private transfers would be barely changed. Obviously, the Colorado system is too burdensome for a compliance by most people, including with the ridiculous rule that, if a, that a person needs to fill out paperwork and pay fees to get her own gun back. Adding an additional visit to the gun store in a three-day wait for private sales or two-day or two additional visits to the gun store and six days of wait, as a minimum, because we already discussed that this bill, the three day is a minimum. 30, 60, 90, 120 days are envisioned. They are envisioned in this bill. That's why they put the local control. I'm all for local control, but the reason that local control is in there so, is so that it will get out of this committee and then the local control can crank it up to whatever they want. Adding an additional visit to the gun store in a three-day wait, 30, 60, 90-day wait, for two additional visits to the gun store and six days of, six days, 90, 120, 150, will discourage even more people from going through the cumbersome Colorado system rather than fixing the problems. This gets to the point of bring me the man I'll give you the crime. That caused the failure of the 2013 statute to lead to more background checks. 2319, 231219 makes an already dysfunctional system even worse. We should be solving problems in this body, not trying to patchwork over previous failures with further legislation. The 17% gun homicide reduction claims is not plausible. If a handgun waiting periods reduce gun homicides by 17%, it would necessarily be true that in states without waiting periods, 17% of the gun homicides are perpetuated by people who buy a handgun in a retail store, pass a background check, and kill somebody a few days later. If this were true, the lobbyists for the anti-gun organizations would be able to cite thousands of such cases nationally, and hundreds in Colorado alone, but the lobbyists do not because they cannot. At most, there are occasional anecdotes about a handgun buyer who commits a crime within a week of buying a handgun. These are far too, these are far too few to support a purported 17% reduction in homicide. The best data from the federal government provide further reason for skepticism about PNAS. 
Below is the 2021 Colorado Firearms Trace Data. And again, the report was from 2017. From the Bureau, so as a predictor, and that's how you tell if something's valid, does it predict the future? Does it predict what, if you're gonna have a model, it should be predictable. It should predict what's gonna happen. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the data reports the time between the resale, retail sale of a firearm and when the ATF was asked by law enforcement to trace a gun. Time to crime rates for firearms with the Colorado recovery, January 1, 2021 through December 31, 2021, under three months, 609. Three months to under seven months, 479. Seven months to under a year, one, uh, 524. One year to under two years, 815. Three years and over, 2,875. The average time to crime, in that time, the Colorado average time to crime was 6.59 years, which it seems like is envisioned in this bill because the local control can add to it and make it 6.59 years. National average time to crime nationwide is 6.24 years. Thus, about 10%, 609 of 5,699 of all Colorado guns traced by the ATF in 2021 had been sold at a retail store in the preceding three months. We do not know how many were sold in the preceding three days before the trace, but the figure will be much smaller. So that's a maximum of 10%. The ATF data, it also does not reflect how many, how many crimes were prevented. The ATF data are further reason to conclude that the extravagant 17% of the PNAS article is the result of flaws in the author's methodology and does not reflect reality. So again, the absolute max that could be is approximately 10%. But the only empirical justification for waiting periods cited is grossly off by at least by approximately 100%. It is approximately 100% wrong. In a, blatant, in a blatant defiance to the United States Constitution with empirical support that even HB 23, 1219 supporters do not treat as credible the bill seems to be far more focused on the culture war and aggression than on reducing suicide or criminal homicide. No, you'd be a Representative DeGrab, please do not impugn the motives of other members of this body. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just reading the conclusion of the testimony that in blatant defiance of the Constitution with empirical support that HB 23 supporters do not treat as credible according to the witness because they do not find they they do not find they do not cite all of the bill the bill seems to be more focused on a culture war aggression than reducing suicide or criminal homicide so so at this point that is that is the PNAS study that is cited that is the only study that is cited that study is cited from 2017. There should have been more studies since then, but there are not. The study's conclusions are contradictory. The study's conclusions do not conclude what the bill sponsors state. The foundation of this bill is therefore invalid. And we need to go back to the drawing board before we go down this path. Otherwise, we're just inviting expensive legislate litigation against the United States. You ready? Hey, you ready? Oh. So with that, I conclude your remarks. I hope everybody will remember that study. It doesn't say what it says it says. Thank you. Representative Armagast. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna take a different uh, direction on this and talk about what we covered in committee. Um, when this was presented in committee. First and foremost, I'm a NRA certified firearms and tactics instructor. Uh, I'm a retired combat veteran, retired law enforcement. In the military, I was able to serve as a suicide intervention uh, non-commissioned officer or leader in awareness and in suicide intervention. 
in military and in law enforcement, we do have guns. It is part of our culture. Um, so that is something that is naturally and inherently there. We do also have suffering from depression and people that are affected by that with access to guns. Um, so suicides, whether by gun or by other, other means, are uh, part of the, uh, the, the nature in that beast as well. In that time, as a suicide intervention uh, specialist, I did see uh, and train people on what to watch for as far as the long-term plans and, and goal setting for people that had uh, suicidal ideation. And with that, looking at the long-term ideology that, that happens and people getting rid of uh, personal belongings, uh, valuable things, um, selling or giving things away, otherwise kind of speaking of the end, sudden changes in behavior, whether good, uh, positive or negative, um, and overall, the possibility for someone having a short-term or impulsive plan. Long story short of that was, there are just some of those that are not preventable. There are some of those that are going to be the impulsive right then and there moments, and there are gonna be those that, whether or not they are impulsive in the moment, have been part of a long-term plan. And with those long-term plans, uh, there can come any sort of premeditation, and that premeditation can come from going and purchasing a firearm, whether it be three days, whether it be two days, or 365 days. That is something that we had to focus on. Working as a uh, corrections deputy inside of a jail, <clears throat> I did that for the majority of my time as a law enforcement officer. We did see people that were struggling in the, their worst times of their life, dealing with some of the worst potential charges that they were facing uh, in trial and otherwise. And we constantly in those situations had to watch for those suicidal ideations. And the people that had those had a plan. They might have communicated a plan, otherwise they could demonstrate a plan, and they had opportunities to do that. But they obviously did not have access to firearms. The point that I'm getting to as it pertains to the bill is that uh, there are going to be mental illness cases. There are going to be situations that need to be addressed as far as mental illness is concerned. But when you're affecting law-abiding citizens' ability to purchase a firearm, uh, to have a firearm for protection uh, if needed in an urgent notice or otherwise just for long-term planning, that is impeding on the Second Amendment rights. That is the infringement of those seconds, Second Amendment rights and shall not be infringed. But getting away from Second Amendment, we need to focus more on victims as well. Are we protecting victims of suicide or victims of homicide? And if so, are we putting them ahead of other victims by doing this? because we also have other victims, whether it be of domestic violence, victims of stalking, which is the, the scariest. I think victims of stalking and domestic violence are important to address because of the fact that those people, especially in stalking cases, you don't know the person that might be uh, following you, stalking you, threatening you, or otherwise menacing you through their behavior. What is that person capable of? That this prevents somebody from going and getting a firearm, they instead have to wait three, day, three days, which could be more than enough time for their perpetrator to have access to do whatever they're going to do to them. So this is giving an upper hand to predators, taking rights away from potential victims of those situations by assuming that we're protecting victims of potential suicide or homicide by putting an arbitrary number on a, a waiting period. So those time frame specifics are arbitrary, why three, why not two, why not 365? This is something that is not going to have enough of a difference in those situations where it is going to make a difference on people that need or want a firearm for their own personal protection, for hunting, for sport, for whatever. That is their right as a law-abiding citizen. We keep adding more and more to control and dictate when and how people can purchase or own firearms, and why? We have bills that we've pushed, that, like the red flag gun law, that have, don't have quantitative results that we can measure 
to say we need this as well. We're adding things to something, a, a building something that isn't working. We keep stacking on these additional restrictions for law-abiding gun owners. It's like painting over mildew without addressing what's under the paint that's going to keep bleeding through the paint. We're adding things that are unnecessary for those of us that want to exercise our rights as Americans to own, to purchase firearms. If we could only focus half as much as we're focusing as a body on restricting gun laws, if we could only focus half as much as we are on that, on the actual underlying issue of mental illness, which our state is last in the country for treating mental illness, if we could only focus on that, I think we could actually be attacking the problem that we're actually trying to get at by removing these rights and restricting these rights for our law-abiding citizens. For everyone's ability to carry, own, purchase a firearm for their own protection, for sport, for hunting, for whatever reason, that is up to the owner and purchaser of that firearm. Removing those rights to address the underlying issue when we're still not spending near the energy we need to on the underlying issue of mental health and mental illness. So I ask everyone in that today and everything that you're gonna be hearing about not only our constitutional rights that shall not be infringed, but also focusing where we need to focus, not on gun owners' rights, not on constitutional rights, but on the focus of mental illness and victimizing. Who is the victim that we're going to give the priority to in this case? Those victims that need a firearm and they need one urgently, they need a concealed carry permit urgently, which they can get, but they would have to, in this case, wait three days to get a firearm, which could be more than enough time to have God knows what happened to them. We need to focus on which victim is more important to us in this case, because the victims of mental health need to be addressed by addressing mental health, not gun laws that affect every American that chooses their right to protect themselves with a firearm. Thank you. Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to uh, back up in time a little bit to address this. And I, I thought about starting with um, in the beginning God created, but I, thought, I moved ahead a little bit further than that. Uh, the Second Amendment, let me read it to you because it's, it's really getting lost in this bill. In fact, it's not getting lost in this bill, it's getting deleted in this bill. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Now we're gonna talk about, for the next two or three days, we're gonna talk about all of the things that have to do with this Second Amendment and with uh, the rights of the people and, and the rights that go back even before the Second Amendment about this. But it's interesting that, that the starting point for this is not actually um, being able to go down to the local gun store and buy a gun to protect yourself. Although we're gonna talk about that quite a bit because this, this does infringe upon that. But it says being necessary the security of a free state. My, my rights as a citizen is to be able to protect myself and according to the Second Amendment, the first protection that I need to have in my mind is I need to protect myself from the government. Now, when we say that we're going to, you know, limit this to a three-day thing or something like that, um, we are, we're saying that that's, that's an infringement of my right. To do what? The first thing is to Defend myself from the state is what the Second Amendment says. Then it says the right of the people to keep and bear arms. And this is a general thing that is for every single person out there. Uh, if you don't um, want to own a firearm, you don't have to. Nobody is making you. Um, but I do have that right and that right is instilled, and in many, many court cases, and we'll probably read them all tonight, but in many, many court cases, 
That Second Amendment, we just keep coming back to it and it says, no, I have that right. Well, I don't want you to have this gun. Well, I have that right. Well, I want you to wait three days. You can't do that. I have that right. The last part of it says that this right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And that's what this bill is about. This, we're going to talk about, and I'm gonna even going to give you stories here in a couple hours of uh, some personal uh, stories of people that were dealing with needing a gun immediately because of domestic violence, because of a, of a stalker, because of a lot of different reasons. But the, and, and we're going to hear uh, stories dealing with the uh, suicide issue also. Um, there's a lot of statistics about that. We're going to try to give you throughout the evening, um, having to do with the fact that there's, and, and I'll throw this out here, uh, but this is gonna, we're gonna give you pages and pages of stats on this, but there's the idea that somehow a three-day waiting period uh, potentially takes suicide off the table or, or abates it some or something like that is, there's way many studies. As, as my representative from El Paso County said, uh, we do have the one case study that was mentioned here um, by the uh, majority in the bill, but we've got hundreds of studies that show that that's, that first, that particular study was completely flawed. The study itself that uh, representative from El Paso County got up and read the whole study, the reason he's, he read it is because that was a study, majority party, cited and the study itself disagrees with the stance that the bill is uh, establishing. So it says that you cannot infringe upon my right to do what? Keep and bear arms. So my right to bear arms, if you say, well, you need to wait, that's infringing upon that right. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how long the wait is. Um, in fact, let me pause here and digress to a study that shows that California, their 10-day waiting period, now they had 10 days, we're, um, we're working toward California, but we're still kind of um, Colorado, -ia. but we have we have a 10, we have a three-day, this is a 10-day waiting period, and it says here, um, that the Second Amendment civil rights in California, a federal judge ruled the state's 10-day waiting period for firearm purchases is unconstitutional. Now, that will be the same ruling in Colorado, too, okay? Um, there are already plenty of groups that have the uh, lawsuits waiting. I've, I've seen uh, some of these lawsuits and this will be overturned, but I would like us maybe to possibly, um, maybe through the soothing sound of my voice to just override this today and vote this thing down and let's move forward. But we can wait for the court if we have to. In the decision, Federal Eastern District of California Senior Judge Anthony W. Ishi, appointed to the bench by President Bill Clinton found that the 10-day waiting periods violate the Second Amendment as applied to members of certain classifications, like Sylvester and Combs, and burdens the Second Amendment right of the plaintiffs. Now, why does it burden the Second right, uh, Amendment rights of the plaintiffs? That's, that's actually a very simple answer. We all know the answer, actually, is because it's infringing upon those rights. I have the right to bear arms and, and no one can infringe upon that. And the reason that it's in the Bill of Rights, I think you guys understand, let me, let me uh, say this a little bit about the Bill of Rights, but you understand that the Bill of Rights is not actually, if you really study the Bill of Rights, it's not rights that you have as an individual, it's rights um, acknowledged to the individual saying the government cannot mess with them. Because why? And I will get to this a little bit later, but the reason is because um, these rights are not given by a government. Do you realize the government can't give you rights? The government can only take rights away. It's not possible for the government to give you life. 
Only thing we can do as a government is take it away. Well, we're doing the same thing by infringing upon the Second Amendment. That's why the Second Amendment exists, to say you cannot infringe upon my right to bear arms. If I want to, to go and, and purchase a uh, firearm today, you cannot infringe upon that. Okay? So it continues. Um, Combs, who serves as the executive director of the Calguns Foundation, said the decision by Senior Judge Ishi proves California gun owners are not second-class citizens, and the Second Amendment isn't a second-class right. And here is something, if you guys want to really process what I'm saying here, this is why we're standing up here. And this is why we're going to stand up here until the cows come home. I, I don't even know what that means. But because uh, this, we're not a second-class citizen because we have the Second Amendment and we want to own, to bear arms, that doesn't make us second-class citizen. Infringement upon that makes us a disenfranchised group, but it doesn't make us second-class citizens, and owning a gun does not make us a second-class citizen. Having the Second Amendment does not make us a second-class citizen. We have these rights, and uh, we're going we're gonna to fight for these rights because any, any of this... This bill and all the others we know that are coming, they are trying to take our rights away. Not a right that a government has given us, but a right that God has given us. And I'll get to that in a minute also. He says the decision lays a strong foundation from which other irrational and unconstitutional gun control laws will be challenged. Guys, listen, let me read that sentence again because this is directly what we are gonna be doing, not just today, but we're gonna be doing this through this whole session, and we're gonna be doing this as soon as these bills are enacted, we're gonna take them across the street to the Supreme Court, and we're gonna nail them. It says that he said the decision lays the strong foundation from which other irrational and unconstitutional gun laws, that's what these other uh, five, four or five laws coming down are. They're irrational and unconstitutional. This one, irrational and unconstitutional, says a senior judge. And, and he said they will be challenged. And he says we look forward to doing just that. The court order mandates the California Department of Justice to change its systems to accommodate the unobstructed release of guns to gun buyers who pass a background check and possess a California license to carry a handgun. The unobstructed release. If I go down tomorrow and I want to buy a handgun, I should have unobstructed release of that. Why? Because anything else but that will be an infringement. This bill is an infringement. Of what? The constitutional right that I have to bear arms. Sylvester called the decision a great win for the Second Amendment civil rights and common sense. Adding, adding, he couldn't be happier with how this case turned out. Now, getting back to my main point. We understand that the Second Amendment gives us this right. Now, if now, uh, we can build a bunch of scenarios. We've already heard testimony of some scenarios, and, we're, and I'm going to give some more here in a little bit. But let's build a scenario where the government says to us tomorrow, martial law is declared, everybody has to be locked down. We can use COVID. We can use whatever we want for this. But the whole government, I mean, the whole country has to be locked down. If, if I want to purchase a gun to defend myself from that government, this three-day, and, and by the way, I think I've already established this. We talked about this quite a bit in the, um, in the um, committee, uh, but this three-day is, is really, it's um, kind of smoke and mirrors because it's a minimum of three days. It can last a very long time. In fact, during COVID, uh, even the CBI uh, background checks were, at, were lasting two, three, four weeks. That, was, that actually was fairly common. Um, some of them had to wait, some long extended groups had to wait, people had to wait um, even a couple months for these things. So to say that this is a three-day waiting period, so I need to go down to, tomorrow and, and purchase a firearm and I have to wait till Tuesday, that's, 
That's being pretty naive. This bill actually makes it possible that it can be as long as we want because it says um, a three-day waiting period or the uh, CBI report, whichever is longer. To me, that doesn't make sense. Why, why would we want, if we really want a three-day waiting period, why don't we say no more than a three-day waiting period? The reason is we don't want a three-day waiting period. We just don't want you to have a gun. That's the point. We just don't, we, you, don't, you don't need a gun. Why? Because I've decided that. Well, I'm sorry, that's an infringement, direct infringement upon the uh, Second Amendment. It's a direct infringement upon my right. My, my personal right to my, am I allowed to say my own name? I know we're not allowed to say names. I'll just say representative from HD 15. My right to have a gun is going to be infringed upon uh, because I'm an individual. Well, you don't have that right. This law is unconstitutional because of that. Okay. Now let's go back into the history stuff because this deals directly with this, um, this idea of infringement. Because here's the reality. The Second Amendment is actually intuitive. It's common sense. It makes sense and, and uh, was established for specific purposes. You realize none of us could be in this room right now doing what we are doing without the Second Amendment. None of us. We could not be presenting. Now, this is, this is a circular reasoning, but this is reality. We could not be presenting anti-gun, anti-constitution bills like this one unless there was the Second Amendment, which is what we're trying to tear down. That's a, that's a reality. That's a fact. So the Second Amendment protects the individual, to, to, uh, right, the individual right to keep and bear arms. The concept of this right existed within English common law. Guys, this, this is something that predates our country, that this was a common law mentality in, in a British common law. Why? Because it's common sense. You have to be able to protect yourself. Not, not three days later, not a week later, not, not a month later, but you have to be able to protect yourself when you want to be able to protect yourself. And I'm going to give you some um, testimonies of some people that their lives were actually saved because there was not a three-day waiting period. Not, not one or two cases. We've got, we've got a lot of these cases. Okay. This was first codified in the English Bill of Rights, um, and this right was enshrined in fundamental laws of several American states during the Revolutionary Era. Why? Think about this. This is the Revolutionary Era. They need to have the right to bear arms for what? Not personal protection of their homes, but against the government. When we start putting three days, that infringes that. You, you can't get around the fact that anything you deal with um, with the Second Amendment deals with infringement. Any, anything, any little scratch you take at this, it's infringement. It's not constitutional, it's against the law, and it's, it's going to be struck down in court. The, um, the, uh, this, this revolutionary time frame, the, I, I got an email from somebody the other day that said, well, it's, uh, vote yes on this three-day period because when the Bill of Rights was written, we didn't have all of the same guns that we have now. And so you don't need access to these guns be, uh, within three days now. I, that's, that's insane. That makes no sense. Three days is three days. It doesn't matter what the gun is. It doesn't matter what the gun is. In fact, I've got some information over there I may, I may uh, do later tonight that has to do with... Um, what different types of guns there are that we're trying to restrict on a three-day basis that these things are actually fairly important, okay? Let me, let me give you something I think maybe you guys haven't processed, and this is pretty, this is pretty good, I like this. Um, we talk about first responders, and I love our police, I love our, uh, all of our first responders, and I'm not trying to change their title or anything, okay? That's not what I'm doing, but I do want you to process this. If you talk to first responders, if you actually talk to them, they will tell you that you're actually the first responder. The police, the EMS, none of the, those are second responders. Why? Because for them to even know something has happened, somebody else had to be on the scene. Somebody else had to know something, be privy to this, or in close proximity to this. So when it comes to your home, you're the first responder. 
So you have somebody trying to attack you, tear you down at your home, kill you, whatever the case is. Uh, you're the one that has to be responding. Some of the quickest response rates in Colorado are the Denver police. I, I, was in, I found that interesting. And their response time is somewhere between 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, once you get outside of Denver, it gets much, much longer. Once you get out into the rural areas, and I've experienced this. In fact, I experienced this in Colorado Springs. Um, somebody broke into my house. We thought they were in the house. We called the police. Two and a half hours later, they showed up. I thought I could already have dinner with this guy and moved on. But, but why, why is response times important? Because you're the one that needs to protect yourself first. You do. So this is actually a little commercial plug for us here. Rather than say, let's take a three-day waiting period, why don't, we, why don't we have a bill that encourages all of us to get a firearm so that we can defend ourselves? because you're the first responder. If the police shows up 15 minutes later, guess what? You're dead. The police show up and now this is a homicide, this is not a self-defense. So the three-day waiting period only hurts the average citizen. We've seen this with the uh, mentality of stalkers and everything else. That, um, that and, and, and I've experienced this personally years ago, like 25 years ago, I worked with the police department in the city that I was pastoring a church. And this was sort of more rural. And, um, and they had me work with them on domestic violence issues. And so I went to the, the this, they, nobody would do this today. This was closer to 30 years ago. But they would let me go into the house first, before the police did. I was young, I was naive, I was like, I can save the world. And I walked in many times where um, there was physical, the, the life of somebody was being physically threatened. Uh, most of the time women, but not always, surprisingly. And, um, and I walked into to one of them in particular where they were, one, somebody was about to die, and I walk in, and I'm trying to fix the situation, and did. It actually became a successful situation. The, the, uh, the people involved, the, the woman that was being abused, needed the ability to go get a gun and to try to accomplish that. Um, and it was being made difficult because of where she lived and all that. I mean, there's a lot of details here. But the idea that if she could have just gone and got a gun, that whole situation would have been uh, changed. It would have been changed for the positive. These, this, these are real things. These are real people. This is not made up stuff. These are real people. Some, I, I did this for quite a few years where I was the first person going into domestic violence. Okay, guys, these are, these are people that are oftentimes, most of the time, like I said, women, but they have been, been beat horribly. Well, why are we saying you don't have the right to defend yourself? Or you got to wait, or you got to do this, and all these other things that are coming down the pike that we know you don't have the right to defend yourself. This one particular case, her husband was 6'8". How, how does she deal with that? Well, she should wait three days. Come on. These are real people dealing with real circumstances of real bodily harm and real danger. And, and we're flippant about this. We're just going to make a law to fix all this. This, this, this is a different situation, by the way, than suicide. That woman was not choosing to be in that situation. She was being forced into that situation. This is not the same thing as suicide. The reason that we have the ability to bear arms is so that we can defend ourselves. Now, again, primarily, we defend ourselves from the government. I was explaining to a guy the other day, and the government, he's like, what do you mean the government? And I said, us, in this house, we're the government. We make a, a lot of bad rules and, and, and cause people a lot of problems, and this is going to be one of those, where we're actually going to put people in danger. That instead of saying, you know what, why don't we just, this is novel, but why don't we just go with the Second Amendment? It's already been established for us. No infringement upon the Second Amendment. <clears throat> I want to read uh, something else to you that I thought was kind of interesting. Because there's no bills about this. 
We're trying to, we're trying to make three-day waiting periods for this, but I, I, I found this statistic that says um, knives are responsible for almost three times as many deaths as rifles. Why are we not making a three-day waiting period for knives? That people kill themselves with knives. People kill other people with knives. Got to think about this. Thank you, Monsoor. <clears throat> Here's another report that I found pretty interesting when it comes to this idea of a three-day waiting period. Um, now, now this, is, uh, this, this is a report that was put together by the uh, Department of Justice. Okay, so they're, it's, not like they're, it's not like they're leaning anywhere toward my platform, all right? The Department of Justice uh, went into prisons and started asking people about when they bought guns, when they committed crimes, what they did, what kind of guns they use, all of this kind of stuff is included in this. Because part of this, part of our narrative here is that, um, that crimes are being committed. If we can have a three-day waiting period, there's two things. We can have a cooling off period for crime and we can have a potential cooling off period for, um, for suicide. A Department of Justice report, and I'm going to show you some statistics out of this report because it actually is pretty interesting. A Department of Justice report shows that only 7%, think about this number, this is, this is, we should think about this stuff when we're putting bills like this together. It says that only 7% of nearly 300,000 state and federal prisoners who possessed a firearm during their crime, purchased the gun from a licensed firearm dealer. Only 7%. So, um, let me do the math for us. That means 93% of the guns used by 300,000 state and federal pr uh, prisoners got that gun underhanded, illegal, or by some kind of private situation, but not by a, a gun dealer. And so, so we're going to go to these dealers and say, now we need to make sure that you guys uh, put a three-day waiting period on everybody that comes in because we're going we're gonna to rescue people and we're going to save people from this. Except the bad guys are not going to gun dealers to get their weapons. So... Who is this bill really going to affect? It's not going to affect the bad guys. It's only going to affect people that are not the bad guys. And, and that is an infringement. That is an infringement. The bad guys, if they're, if they're really bad guys and in the system, they can't buy the gun anyway. This is going to affect the not bad guys. And I am one of those. So this, this survey of prison inmates, this was um, pretty interesting. It says that <clears throat> one in five of all state and federal prisoners reported they had possessed or carried a firearm when they committed the offense of which they were serving time in prison. Of the almost 300,000 prisoners, uh, I'm sorry, of the 300,000 prisoners that were surveying this, 200 and 7,400 prisoners have possessed a firearm during their offense. Now remember, only 7% of them got them from a firearms dealer. Uh, somewhere like Cabela's or Shields or a gun range or something like that. So the three-day waiting period would affect a very tiny, tiny percentage of the people uh, of that are, that are proven to be doing something bad with this. Not the alleged or the maybes or whatever we think, but this is really the truly bad guys. We know that because they're in prison for it, okay? Um, <clears throat> some more statistics that I found interesting here is that um, about 29% of state and 36% of federal prisoners serving a sentence 
for a violent offense in 2016 possessed a firearm during the crime. About a quarter of state and federal prisoners serving time for a violent offense used a firearm during the crime. Firearm use is defined in this report as showing, pointing, or discharging a firearm during that setting. It doesn't, it doesn't even mean that the firearm hurt somebody or whatever. Um, maybe prisoners are not good shots. I don't know. But they, the, of, these, of these prisoners, um, that, were, that are in there for serving robbery, two and five, 43% possessed a firearm during the fence. Now again, this is 7% of these people actually bought the firearm under, I mean, to, from a uh, dealer, which would be affected by this bill. 93% of the bad guys are not affected by this bill. Federal prisoners who possessed a firearm when they committed their offense were much less likely to have killed, injured a victim with the firearm that they used. They have a whole section here that talks about how these uh, criminals get their firearms. It's not from dealers. So the idea that this is somehow taking um, a, a three-day waiting period stops crime is... It's not even there. In fact, the this, this study cited by the bill shows that's not true. Um, you, you, the, the, the bill took a couple sentences here or there and dropped them in, but it didn't actually deal with the reality of what this means, which is it didn't do that. The statistics were actually the opposite on all of this. So now, let's go back to the... Uh, some of the things having to do with the Second Amendment on this. <clears throat> now this is, I'm, I'm gonna start a little different here, but stay with me and you'll understand I'm not disagreeing with myself. There is no legal right to own a firearm in the, in the United States. No legal right. The Constitution does not give citizens the right to own weapons. All right? Some of you guys should be writing this down, but I'm about to debunk it. And no legal or historical argument supports the idea that it does. There is no legal precedence that says that you have a, a um, legal right to own a firearm. Instead, a much deeper and more important philosophy provides for gun ownership, and this is what's called natural rights. Okay? I, I don't really like the term natural rights. I understand why it's used. It's used because God, uh, people don't like the word God, but it's actually God-given rights, and that's actually the language within Declaration of Independence in the Constitution. These rights are not given, but they are protected, and this is what I was talking about earlier. Sometimes the people think the Bill of Rights are rights for the people, but it's actually um, a, a, an acknowledgement of rights the people already have and the government needs to stay out of the business. The government needs to leave the people alone. When it comes to the First Amendment, the government needs to leave the people alone. That is a right, a constitutional right. When it comes to uh, the right to bear arms, that is a, that is a God-given right that the, that the Bill of Rights acknowledges. It doesn't give me the Bill of Rights doesn't give me the right to bear arms. That is a, in fact, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an interesting thing when it comes to the uh, Bill of Rights and the Constitution. This is, um, this is something I think that should be processed, is when it comes to the, to the Bill of Rights, let's go to the Second Amendment where, it, where it, it specifically says the right to bear arms. Do you realize it doesn't say a constitutional given right or a uh, state given right? It says the right. In other words, they acknowledge by writing it that way that this right existed before they wrote it down. This is the right that we all understand intuitively as something, the right to bear arms. They, the Bill of Rights only acknowledges it. It doesn't say a right that has been given, it says the right. And it says you cannot infringe upon the right that we all acknowledge existed before we put it on paper. 
In other words, the framers of the Bill of Rights did not come up with the idea that people should be able to own arms, bear arms. They didn't come up with this. Humans did not come up with the, the, the idea that you should be able to defend yourself, your family, and your property. The only thing that the Constitution allows, and what well, the Declaration says is too, but the Bill of Rights acknowledges is that God gave us these rights. We're just acknowledging that. The same thing going back to life. God gave us the right to life. The only thing human beings can do is take that away. Life is something that God gives. The state does not. We have the right to defend ourselves. That's a right that God gives. The state does not. And that's, by the way, that's in no legal precedence anywhere. Nobody will ever argue the Second Amendment on some kind of legal precedence because it doesn't exist. It's a constitutional precedence because the Constitution acknowledges it. Okay? Um, instead, um, uh, these rights are not given, but they are protected, not to expand citizens' rights. And, and this is... We, I talk to uh, young, well, pretty much anybody, but specifically younger people nowadays, and they do not understand. First, they don't even know what the Bill of Rights is. But when you finally get to that point, they think that that's a right. That's a list of rights you have. No, it, it, it only expands, the Constitution only expands this, but um, not, not to, I'm sorry, not to expand these rights, but to limit the government. The Bill of Rights only limits the government. That's you and I. And we're stepping outside of that with this bill, and that's why, that's why not only is it unconstitutional, we know that, that we know it's unconstitutional, we know it's not legal, it will be, it will be uh, knocked down because you're trying to, to limit people's rights that have already been given to them to limit the government. The government is who is being limited by this. Gun ownership is so integral to the United States DNA because armed Americans overthrew the most powerful military empire using guns. Um, in fact, I, I consider myself a modern, uh, what's called a black robe regiment, a pastor that would preach on Sunday and pick up arms on Monday uh, against the British government. That's how I see myself. Um, I, I have the right to bear arms and the government cannot take it away because the government is the reason I have the right to bear arms. When the government comes for us, we have arms. And uh, that was mentioned by another representative recently uh, in a very uh, much followed tweet. The freest, most prosperous nation in human history and a good deal of prosperity around the globe owes its origins to guns. This is, this is something that also seems to be lost on us. Um, without, without the ability to bear arms, countries can destroy other countries. It's interesting that, that we're sending uh, millions and millions, even up to the term, to, to a tune of billions of dollars to Ukraine for the exact opposite reason this bill exists, for to defend themselves. You cannot infringe upon that in America. And a good deal of prosperity around the globe owns, owes its origins to guns. But the issue is far deeper than guns. It's about rights. In a properly functioning America like the founders envisioned, a repeal of the Second Amendment would be virtually meaningless. And, and if you think about this, this is kind of like uh, social civics. If, um, if, we were, if we were operating as a country like we're supposed to be, you wouldn't need the Second Amendment. But the reason it got put in from the very beginning is because people don't act right. They don't do right things. Governments don't do right things. Our government does not do right things. Federal level, state level. And now we're saying you've got to wait for three days for, for that to matter for you personally. That makes no sense. The right existed already. The Constitution merely secures it. Unfortunately, our society has loosened its grasp on natural rights philosophy and devolved into dependency on government-sanctioned rules. Today, however, even unambiguous text is under scrutiny, um, e even within this state, by the majority, because they're trying to separate what 
what can be controlled or potentially people think they can control as, a, as opposed to what I already have. Again, the three-day rule says you, can, you, you cannot bear arms the way you want to. It's somebody else is going to make that rule for you, and somebody else is going to take and pause that until they feel good about it. Three days, 10 days, 30 days. You, you have to pause. Now, you've already, you've already purchased something, but you can't uh, obtain it because we have government rules that are going to say, it's your property, it's yours, but we're going to hold it. That's an infringement. That is the epitome. That is the definition of infringement. The Constitution mentions both natural and legal rights, and the distinction is critical. Within the Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment, some activities, like speech, are innate. We understand that the uh, First Amendment gives us the right to speech. But if, if we don't have the ability to bear arms, free speech can never be protected. Your speech, my speech, can never be protected. <clears throat> the Founding Fathers understood natural rights to exist independent of, or actually, I, I believe, in spite of the government. Natural rights... Natural rights are almost always contradictory to the government. This is why the three-day rule is not constitutional, and it's why we're, we're fighting against it. Because natural rights say you already have the right to own that firearm. Government comes in and says, in spite of natural rights, we're the government, and we will make decisions for you about this. You have the rights. the same thing with life. We do the same thing with life. You have the right to life. Why? Because God gave it to you. The government says, no, we're going to take that away from you. You have the right to, to own and bear arms. Well, no, we're going to make you wait. How long? Well, at least three days or whichever is longer, 20 days. They simply exist, these natural rights, for free people walking the earth. Legal rights are granted by men. They can be altered or destroyed by changes to the law or structure of government. The natural and legal rights in the Constitution are so fundamental that the Bill of Rights was added as an explicit bar to encroachment from the federal government. The right to keep and bear arms is a natural right. And the reason they said it cannot be infringed upon is because I believe even from way back then, well, they had experience right in their lifetime. They had experience before this was written down. But the reason that they say that it cannot be infringed upon is because they know that there will always be somebody like a King George or the United States government or Colorado state government that is going to try to infringe upon that right. And that's not okay. Thank you. This right is beyond the reach of any person or government. Individuals can protect themselves using any necessary tool or actions. What are the other tools that we're going to infringe upon the ability of people to defend themselves? There, some of these are not mentioned in the Bill of Rights. Guess what? Arms are. You can defend yourself with guns. That is the expectation. The reason they wrote that is because they expected you to do that. They were expecting you to do this from the British government first, but to expect you to be able to defend yourself from government, from, from bad actors in your life, in your world, in your circumstances, and that cannot be infringed upon. Individuals also have the natural right to own property. The reason the Second Amendment exists is because if somebody tries to take away your ability to own property, you can defend that. And that gets attacked constantly at national and state levels. That gets attacked. But I have the right to defend my own property. It's my property. I, I worked for that. I purchased that. I own that. And I should be able to defend it. And the Second Amendment gives me the right to do that. Not, not only just free speech, which which I, I'm a strong opponent of, and I will fight anything about free speech. In this house, any kind of rules, any kind of making me say certain terms, I will fight that because I have free speech. Well, the only reason that we can do that is because the government knows if, if the government pushes us far enough, we have the ability to defend it with firearm. 
unless we have to wait three days or 10 days or 20 days or a background check. Thank you, I, I left that one out. <laughs> Owning a gun is, keep feeding me stuff, that's good. Owning a gun is well within the canon of natural rights that any free people should enjoy. Now, I've been, I've been all over the world, and I've, I've been in many different situations. I've, I've spent time in China, and we see where infringement kills people. We see where not having this freedom that we have in America, and we're, we are so spoiled by this that we can take it so much for granted that we can actually come up with bills that will try to attack our own ability to protect ourselves because we think it's a good idea. Except we're actually hurting ourselves and we don't realize it. We're hurting our own abilities and we don't realize it sometimes. Natural rights are so critical because they are innate. And, and I think intuitive, not just innate, but intuitive. You, we all get it. We all know now, in, in every, when everything is going well and everything is perfect, um, then, well, okay, we, we don't need that right. We don't need that right. But I have sat in the house of people, of, of women that have been horribly abused, and all of a sudden the rules seem a little different at that point. We have the luxury of making these rules sitting in here, but that's not what's really going on out there. And this three-day limit really is, or the 10, or the 20, or the 30, is really going to put some people at risk. We, that's not, that's not um, anecdotal. That's reality. There'll be, there will be specifically women will be at risk because of this three-day waiting period. And some people will lose their lives because of this three-day waiting period. That's facts. And you can talk to our, our, uh, our uh, law enforcement people about that. But I'm actually going to tell you a story here in a little while. The righteous tax, task of the founding, therefore, was to craft a government impotent to crush these rights. We tried, we, we have worked at this in America, and it's getting worse now, but we worked at the beginning of this to actually create a government that would not do this, and it was intuitive within them to not do this. Now, we've come so far now that bills like this sometimes seem good to the government. But the government was actually creating design by our founding fathers to recognize that this is a bad idea, that these are dangerous ideas that we come up with. <clears throat> this is also why we have the Ninth Amendment, which preserves other rights retained by the people. You know how those rights retained by the people are protected and secured? By the Second Amendment. It's not because we have a good country with good people. It's because we have the Second Amendment. In other words, I have the right to protect myself from the government, except for three days later, or 10 days later, or 30 days later. Combined with the rest of the Bill of Rights, the federal government is clearly prohibited from trampling on free citizens' natural or legal rights. According to the Ninth Amendment, a free citizen retains the right to self-protection and property. Well, how, how are you going to self-protect and, and protect your property? How are you going to do that? With a, a good intention? A, a good idea? Ten days later? Thirty days later? No, you have that ability because you have the potential. Nobody's going to make you, but you have the potential to go secure a firearm so that you can pretend, protect, uh, self-protect and also property protect. <clears throat> a free citizen retains the right to self-protection and property among a vast reservoir of other rights, and the government cannot affear on, infer, interfere with this. <laughs> whew. <laughs> I, was, I was getting to the end there, and whew, thank you. <laughs> At its most basic level, <laughs> a gun is a tool, and I think we kind of know this, guys. It, it, at the basic level, a gun is a tool. It actually accomplishes something. Now, some people buy guns because they want to go and shoot them at a range or, or whatever. Okay, I get that, but, the, but a gun is actually a tool. In, in the Revolutionary War, which set up the Second Amendment, this was not a, uh, this was not, um, a, a, a hobby. It was life and death. And oftentimes, even life and death for food and things like this. 
Well, we're now we're saying you can't have that tool um, except maybe three days later, or 20 days later, or I don't know, a month later, six, six months later. A repeal of the Second Amendment should not truly harm gun ownership in a perfect world. But there is a reason that it exists. And, then, and, and think about this. Uh, if, you, if you've ever uh, studied constitutional law or any of that stuff, which I have not, um, the, the reason that the Bill of, in the Bill of Rights that the Second Amendment is put so high up is because the first one is freedom of speech, the next one protects that and all the others. Because this is important, not three days later, not a week later, but because as an individual you have this right. You cannot be infringed upon. You have this right. <clears throat> Today it is all too clear. Now I, I was, um, I'm 52, so I was born in 1970. I barely escaped the 60s. But at that time frame, the idea that we would be discussing some of these things about the Second Amendment as I was growing up, my dad was a Vietnam vet, as I was growing up, I, I couldn't fathom this, that somehow we're saying you don't have the right to own a gun or you have to wait this time frame or you can't do this. This is America. This is the land of the free and we're taking it and making it the land of the kind of free. It's an infringement upon the Second Amendment to say you've got to wait. It's all too clear that if the Second Amendment were not so explicit, the tyranny of the majority, and I don't mean this majority, albeit I kind of do, would have suppressed the right long ago. The government did not create the right to own a gun. You're going to hear many people say that. The government only acknowledges that you already have that right. The, the idea that we're going to try to uh, infringe upon this, change this, carve a little piece of this out or something else to me is, well, okay, so I've already established it's unconstitutional against the law. Um, but I would also like to establish the fact that it's egregious. And so here's how I would like to establish that. Um, I have some, uh, some information that it directly deals with the idea that this three-day waiting period would be dangerous. I have a letter. And uh, she says, my name is Nina Brewer. And I write this to express my opposition to House Bill 23-1219. I'm a Colorado native, I'm a woman of color, and I'm a, an attorney. And I have grave concerns regarding the legality of this bill, as well as, as the danger it, it, to the community that it poses. First, the passage of this bill would be illegal under the, both the Constitution of the United States and the Colorado Constitution, which uh, which read in relevant part, and so she includes this, I want to read this. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of free state, the right of the people um, to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And she italicized, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. She also um, goes to the Colorado Constitution and, she's, and, re, and writes out of the Colorado Constitution, the right of no person to keep and bear arms in defense of his home, person, and property, or in aid of the civil power when thereto legally summoned and italicized shall be called in question. This is the Colorado Constitution. And this attorney is saying this bill is, going, is breaking these two laws. And we know this. We know these are... Um, Two rights, not laws, these are rights. While this committee in this House has shown a propensity to ignore these laws, I think it prudent to remind the committee that the citations above are, in fact, the supreme law of the nation and of this state and cannot be infringed upon. As I don't understand, I really don't, I'm not just being pejorative or facetious here, I really don't understand how we can submit a bill that actually goes against the, the Federal, the National Constitution, and the Constitution of the United States, and the Colorado Constitution. I really don't understand that. Um, but here we are. Here's what we're doing. Further, the Supreme Court of the United States have ser has served to clarify and flesh out the right to bear arms, um, holding specifically in Heller. And I'm sure there are other people that are going to um, update, uh, keep us posted on 
what Heller says. But this little part of it says the Second Amendment protects an individual right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia and to use that arm for traditionally lawful purposes. And that is District of Columbia versus Heller. Uh, this ruling was then held to apply to the states through the 14th Amendment in the case of McDonald versus City of Chicago in 2010. And I mentioned that the 14th Amendment is part of our rights. The Second Amendment protects it unless, you know, now we got to wait three days or 10 days or 30 days. This bill would illegally impose a three-day waiting period on an individual receiving a lawfully purchased firearm for the vast majority of traditionally lawful purposes. This bill, if passed, God forbid, would blatantly violate the rights of the citizens of Colorado. And again, this is a, this is a, a letter from Nina Brewer um, about this bill. The State House of Colorado does not have the authority to strip rights away from Coloradans based on their misinformed ideas of public safety. Indeed, the attempt to put a waiting period on the purchase of a firearm will do nothing to improve the safety of Coloradans, but will do much to put them in danger, especially women of color like myself. Firearms are the great equalizer and allow black women like me to protect ourselves against men who would seek to assault, rape, or kill us. I, along with thousands and thousands of black women across this country, have purchased firearms to protect ourselves over the last few years. Black women are the fastest growing group of gun owners in America. And then she actually cites a, a website that you can go to. If you're interested, I can show you that. Um, but wait till I'm done talking. In a country where we cannot trust our police to protect and serve us, as evidenced by George Floyd incident and so many other instances of police brutality, it is extremely dangerous to place limitations on Coloradans' right to keep and bear arms. As a black woman, I only feel safe walking around the streets of downtown Denver or of Aurora knowing that I am armed, trained, and ready to defend myself at a moment's notice, unless somehow she, he, it, she's going to have to wait 10, 20, 30 days for this to happen. Should this ridiculous and harmful three-day waiting period go into effect, you can expect gun violence against women, especially women of color living in the lower socioeconomic areas to rise dramatically. And, and, and this is actually, we're gonna show you tons of statistics that will prove this, okay? If a stalker becomes obsessed with a woman and that woman needs the protection of a firearm, this bill would force that woman to wait, she says three full days, but she didn't read it close enough. It can be much, much longer than three days uh, to acquire the means for her self-defense. And my question here is why? Why would we do that? Why would we make it difficult for this woman to be able to protect herself? Why would we make her wait? Why would, in a, in a, in a stressing situation culminating quickly in her world, we're saying, no, you've got to back up and wait. With all due respect to the committee, if a woman needs protection from a violent stalker, attacker, or rapist, three days is too long to wait. And we all, we all know this, okay? We may not accept it or vote for this, but we all know this is true. She will be raped, beaten, or dead by the time bureaucrats allowed her to exercise a human right guaranteed to her under two constitutions. If the committee thinks I am exaggerating, I welcome them to review the stories below of what happens when women do not have access to the means to protect themselves. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over some of these um, tonight, but there's quite a few. I can't, I can't go over them all. We would be here till Tuesday morning, and we, we want to get out of here by Sunday afternoon at the latest. So, so I can't read them all, but I will be reading some of these as we get a little bit further along. Um, that, are, that are places that she has cited that says, if you institute this three-day um, waiting period, it will affect this. It will harm this. Okay? The right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental right of... <laughs> I, feel, I feel like we're not respecting the process here. 
I'm doing something important. <laughs> the right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental right of self-defense that exists outside of the government. It is not equivalent to a driver's license or some uh, such government-issued permissions. Guys, th this, is, this is an important statement that she makes right here. The right to keep and bear arms is constitutional. If you want to put some time limits on on uh, your driver's license or such, such things that the state gives you right to, that's different. Do that. Um, may fight against it, may not, but that is actually the role of government. You can fight against those state rights. You can put guidelines. You can infringe upon state rights because they're given by the state, but you cannot infringe upon the natural rights or the God-given rights that we call the constitutional rights and specifically the Second Amendment. You just can't do it. I know we're trying to, but it's not constitutional. It is illegal and dangerous to put a waiting period on the ability to exercise a constitutionally protected right, especially a right which is vital to women's safety. The committee should oppose this bill, signed uh, Nina Brewer Esquire. <clears throat> the New York Post, October 28, 2022, had this, uh, this report. Woman stabbed 100 times, beheaded by drunk boyfriend. Representative Bottoms, please stick to the bill. I, this is the first five words. You don't know what I'm about to say. Okay. I'll give you, it does sound gross. I'll give you a few more words. I w thank you. I won't say that sentence again because I don't even like that sentence. But this article talks about the fact that this, let me, let me explain why it has to do with the bill first and then I'll, I'll read the whole article. That um, she was trying, she was being stalked by this guy and she tried to, um, she tried to secure a firearm but she couldn't because they have waiting periods in this time frame. I mean, in this, um, in this area, okay? Um, again, there's an, another little bad part. I won't read that. Um, she was stabbed a bunch, and bad things happened to her. Uh, let me jump down a little bit further. It's pretty gross. Okay, it's like halfway down now, so... Okay, so let me sum it up. I think that would be the better idea. <laughs> so, because it's bad. So, um, so he, here's what happened. She, she was trying to protect herself. This guy was harassing her. This guy had been stalking her. Um, uh, she had been, she went out to purchase a gun, but there was a waiting period. There was a, a background check and a waiting period for this. So she called her father and her father said, I will bring over a gun to you. He did not get there quick enough and she was brutally murdered from, the, from this process. And she had also called 911 ahead of time. So it's not like the police were not on their way, they were. But again, and, and this is not a jab at the police. I, I can't imagine, you just take in, Den, in, um, in Denver here, there's a, a shortage of police. And, and the more we make these kind of laws and these kind of things, it's gonna get worse. The, the police tried to, to get there. The police arrived um, about 40 minutes later, and uh, um, the guy was taken into custody. The rest of this is her life would have been saved, potentially. Her life would have been saved if she could have just got the gun when she went to the gun store in the first place. It's that simple. It's that simple, and we've got lots and lots of these stories. Uh, another one out of the Daily News, Christina Yuna Lee, um, woman stalked and murdered uh, in Chinatown. She was not allowed to get a gun expeditiously. Okay. Uh, this one's a little bad, too. She was brutally attacked and murdered. Okay. She actually fought for women that are in these situations. She had spent a, uh, quite a few years fighting for the, the right 
for women that are uh, being stalked, being pursued, being uh, potentially um, under uh, threat of domestic violence. She had fought for these people quite a bit. She was, uh, let me give you her, where she is. Well, I'll get to that later. But uh, she fought for these things, and the person that was fighting for these women to be protected from, from domestic violence, from stalking, and all this other stuff, she was murdered by a stalker because she could not get a firearm in the right amount of time. Um, and I will give you, the, I'll give you the information of who she is in case you want to... Um, look it up. Uh, it is, it's, it was a, uh, an article off of Yahoo. You can, you can, uh, look it up. New York City woman stalked, murdered in Chinatown. She was stabbed over 40 times and, and the rest is pretty bad. So I won't go over that. Now, let me get back to this idea of the three days and the infringement of this. As we are going to be putting, we are going to be putting women in danger if we do this. Now, I know we're going to address the uh, suicide um, side of this in a little bit, but just to let you know some of the things that you're going to hear here, statistically, well, this is the, the simple, we're going to, we're going to, have pages of this information, but let me give you some basics. Anywhere that a waiting period is introduced, these are hundreds of studies, not just the one study that, was, that we've debunked, but anywhere that a waiting period has been put into effect, homicides go up and suicides go up. In all of those areas, every single one of them. And we've got tons of uh, statistics to vet that out. The other thing that happens is, and this, this is a corollary that I think we would all recognize would be uh, common sense, but anywhere those waiting periods go up, not only did um, homicide by guns go up, but homicides in general went up with all other types of weapons. So now we're just, we're just spreading it all out. But, at the, but the reality of this is that uh, this infringement causes uh, lives. It, it hinders people's lives. It puts people at risk. It puts women at risk. Okay? So coming back to the, uh, the constitutionality of this. Again, the Second Amendment says that the primary reason for this is that you have the right to defend uh, yourself against a list of things. But the, the one that is specifically mentioned there first is that you have the right to defend yourself against the government. Then you have the right to protect yourself and to protect your property. Anything that goes against this is an infringement. We're attacking the actual Second Amendment. You could, you could put a lot of different things on here, but it's an infringement mentality. So... <clears throat> Um, this infringement mentality that this three days does has uh, obviously long been a con controversial issue for a very long time and uh, in all kinds of different levels. But here's, here's a few basic things. In the United States, this is going all the way back to 1876, having to do specifically with the infringement mentality, not just the right to bear arms, but the bigger picture of this. Um, in 1876, the court ruled that the right to bear arms is, is not granted by the Constitution, neither is it any, in any manner dependent upon that instrument for its existence. Part of the reason that's important is because we don't have the ability to fringe upon it. Why? Because we didn't create it. This is what the Founding Fathers are trying to say. We didn't create this right, so we can't infringe upon it. The, the same concept with life. You didn't create life, you can't infringe upon it. Now, we do, and we have... But you're not Adams, allowed to do that. Representative Adams, please stick to the bill. I do feel like I strayed a little there. <laughs> the Second Amendment means no more than it shall not be infringed by Congress. It will not be, and it cannot be infringed by this House. Three-day waiting period is an infringement. 
And, and this ruling in 1876, ha, it's, it goes on, it continues to say, and has no other effect than to restrict the powers of the national government. We, the, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, is restricting the powers of the national government. Why? Because the government needs to be restricted. And this is a textbook case of when the government, the local Colorado government, needs to be uh, restricted. This, this three-day period is an infringement. In 1939, United States versus Miller. The court ruled that the amendment protects arms that had a reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia. Now, we get into all kinds of gun stuff, and we'll explain this as some of these other bills come up. But the idea that certain guns bad, certain guns okay, whatever the case is. Uh, if you're saying you've got to wait 310, whatever, th this is still an infringement because the, the, the Supreme Court said that whatever, the, whatever arms are necessary to the preservation of the efficiency of a well-regulated militia. In other words, you can't tell us, not only can you not tell us three days, 10 days, 20 days, you also can't tell us which guns. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. In the District of Columbia versus Heller, I mentioned some of this, but in 2008, the court ruled that the Second Amendment codified a pre-existing right. The Second Amendment codifies it. It acknowledges a pre-existing right. It doesn't give the right, it acknowledges the right. And it protects an individual right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia and to use that arm for traditionally lawful purposes. Members, it's getting loud. Um, could you please keep your conversations down? <clears throat> Representative Bottoms. And to use that arm for traditionally lawful purposes such as self-defense within the home, but also stated this right, this is so important because this goes directly against what we're doing here today. The, the court also stated that the right is, is not unlimited, it is a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, in a manner, whatsoever, for whatever purpose. In McDonald versus Chicago, the court ruled that the Second Amendment limits state and local governments to the same extent that it limits the, the federal government. Guys, that is right now. This is, this is a, literally right now we are speaking to this. The court ruled that the Second Amendment limits state and local governments to the same extent. So the, Col so the Colorado state government, us right here, right now, putting this um, unconstitutional bill forward, it says that we are limited to the same rules that limits the federal government, which is you cannot infringe upon the Second Amendment. And that's what we are doing. We are infringing. We've got to see this. We've got to push through this and realize that we cannot, we, we just can't make this rule. We can't make this law. This is not constitutional. I have a right, everybody in this room has a right to keep and bear arms and when I want to go and purchase that. And it is nobody's business in here when I want to go purchase that and should not be infringed upon so that I have to wait for that. That is specifically uh, a nobody's business mentality in the Constitution. That's the Bill of Rights. That's the Second Amendment there. <clears throat> Now, realizing that, um, realizing that this infringement, again, comes to, and I, and I would like to mention other infringements, but I, I, but I will stay to the bill, but there are a lot of infringements that we have tried and we are going to try, and this is, this is just one of them. This is just one of the many that's included in this. But there's not any wiggle room in the Second Amendment. It says, and shall not be infringed upon under any circumstance. There's no, there's no back door to that. There's no except in this case or in this case. It says no infringement. 
It should not be infringed upon. What circumstance? Any circumstance. It doesn't matter. This is just one of them. But it's not allowed to be infringed upon. So, I think for the moment, I would like to pass this off to one of my colleagues because I've been drinking a lot of water. <laughs> so, so I would ask you to vote. <laughs> I would ask you to vote no, double no, on this bill. Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, so spent a lot of time reading this bill just because I figure if I'm going to vote on something, I want to understand the components of what it is that I'm voting on. And so as I read this bill, a lot of things popped out to me. One of the first things that jumped out to me in this bill is page two, starting on line 13, where it talks about in 2021, Colorado had the highest number of homicides by discharge of a firearm since 2000. It says there were 274 homicides by firearm in Colorado in 2021, and the age group with the highest rate of firearm homicide victims was people ages 15 to 24 with 74 deaths. And the reason that stood out to me is because pretty much everywhere else in this bill and a lot of the arguments that I've heard surrounding this bill, this bill's talking about the prevention of self-harm, the prevention of suicide, the prevention of folks who feel like they've reached that point in their life where they need to take some sort of radical, irreversible step to end whatever situation they find themselves in. And that's an absolute tragedy that somebody would get to that point. But that's not what we're talking about in section C here on page two. We're talking about homicides. And of course, as a police officer, that jumps out to me because not only did I respond to my fair share of folks that were either contemplating or had completed suicide, I also responded to a lot of homicides and I responded to a lot of attempted homicides, and I responded to a lot of situations that had the potential to turn into a homicide. And so I asked myself, do the provisions of this bill address our homicide problem? Because that's what it's talking about in the legislative declaration. And so I did a little bit of research on this, trying to figure out what's driving these homicides, and does the provisions of this bill actually help out in trying to solve that issue. And so some of the research that I found indicated that in 2021, Denver had the highest number of homicides since 1993. And that's obviously a problem because we can't have this sort of violence plaguing our community. And it drove me back to the question of what causes this violence? What causes this crime? What causes the homicide that we've seen here on, uh, mentioned in page two of the legislative declaration? And so I thought back to a lot of the stories and a lot of the things and a lot of the events that I've seen during my career in law enforcement about what would drive somebody to commit these actions. And so without going down the whole rabbit hole of what causes crime, and how do we solve crime, I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of points. When we're talking about homicide, we're talking about an individual who has made up their mind for whatever reason, whether it was premeditated, whether it was in the heat of the moment, but they've made some level of conscious decision that they're gonna inflict harm, potentially up to and including death, on another human being. And then if we're going to end that, unfortunately, sometimes we need to make sure that we have the ability for the victim of that homicide to either defend themselves or be 
defended by somebody else. And that made me think of a book that I read, a uh, very, very influential book for me, actually, uh, by a gentleman named Gary Hagen. The name of the book is called The Locust Effect. And it stood out to me for a couple of reasons. See, Gary Hagen was a UN investigator for the Rwandan genocide. And he tells a story that relates directly back here to, to page two of this bill. He tells a story about the first time he ever came and had to investigate a massacre scene. And he talks about how the, the massacre occurred in a church and how they opened the doors of the church and in order to collect the data and the statistics that the UN needed to investigate these, these homicides, unfortunately they had to go in and do the very terrible work of actually counting bodies, assessing the, the nature of the injuries, how they were killed. And so as he talks about this, what he mentions is that in that particular moment of time, when you had folks in that church who were about to become victims of homicide, like it talks about here in page two of the bill, you have folks who are about to become the victims of homicide, you have perpetrators who are about to commit that homicide, he talks about the fact that what those folks, those victims in that particular moment of time needed was not clean water, was not a micro loan, was not some form of sustainable agriculture. They didn't need shelter. They didn't need clothing. They didn't need food. The only thing that they needed in that particular moment in time was something to stop the homicidal intent of the folks that were about to massacre them all. And that always resonated with me because I think that ties directly back to what we see here in paragraph C of this bill in the legislative declaration. When we're talking homicide, what is needed in that particular moment of time is not all of those other things we talked about. The only thing that we'll do, as he puts it, is a hand to restrain the machete, the machete being the tool that was used to, to massacre those folks in Rwanda. A hand to restrain the machete. That is what's needed in that particular moment in time to prevent those homicides, to prevent those terrible tragedies from occurring. And so I asked myself, based on that explanation by a UN uh, investigator, and based on some of my personal life experiences, is that what this bill does? Does this bill actually enable the victims of crime? Because again, we're talking crime here, homicide, that's a crime. It says so uh, right there on line 13, we're talking homicides. Does this bill provide the victims with the equivalent of that hand to restrain the advancing machete? And I thought, and I thought, and unfortunately, I can't find anywhere in this bill that actually empowers victims of homicides, as it mentions here, to protect themselves. I can't find anywhere where we're empowering or enabling the would-be victims to either themselves or by someone else to be empowered to restrain that homicidal intent by another person. And so that's my first concern with this bill, is it's important. I agree with the legislative declaration here. It's absolutely important that we reduce the number of homicides. But I don't think that the mechanism in this bill accomplishes that. And so as a legislative body that's supposed to act deliberatively, I, I just, I, I struggle with, are we actually accomplishing what we all agree needs to happen. We need to reduce the number of homicides, but are we accomplishing that? Are we actually putting into place the policies that are going to result in a positive change, an actual data-driven change that will bring this number, because this is a terrible number, that will bring this number of homicides down? And I can't find anywhere in this bill that I think it accomplishes that very worthy, very necessary goal. And so that's one of my first concerns with this bill. Uh, moving on here to, to paragraph D, page two still. 
It says, in 2020, Colorado had the sixth highest suicide rate, and then we amended that in the, the committee report to say seventh suicide rate. And in 2021, there were 740 suicides by firearm, firearms in Colorado, which is more than half of all suicides in the state. And I, again, I completely acknowledge this is a terrible statistic, and we have to do something to get this turned around. But again, going back to the actual policy proposed in this bill, I ask, does the policy in this bill actually accomplish that goal? And so again, I thought back to my, my law enforcement career, where unfortunately I did have to respond to, uh, you know, unfortunately countless suicides. Um, I'll, I'll never know the exact number, but some of the faces, some of the situations, some of the families, their stories will stay with me forever. Absolute tragic situations. We need to find a way to end those tragic situations. But as I thought back over in law enforcement, what we refer to as the, the Book of the Dead, those faces, those names, all of those folks that have unfortunately died that, uh, that law enforcement and first responders have had to respond to, as I thought back through my own personal Book of the Dead of the folks that were successful in taking their own lives, I tried to think how many of those had actually been accomplished with a firearm and how many of those occurred as a result of some other means or method. And pretty much every single situation or example in my personal anecdotal experience that stood out to me that I could remember didn't involve a firearm. They involved a wide variety of other tools, wide variety of other mechanisms. And so as I read paragraph D here, lines 17 through 19, I completely agree with the fact that we have a suicide problem on our hands. I've seen it. I've lived it. I've sat on the floor with the families trying to find the words to say, trying as, you know, the, the big strong cop who's not supposed to get too emotionally invested in any case, trying not to let the family see the fact that, you know what, I'm probably about to break down and start crying myself here. Because these are terrible, terrible situations. But as I read the policy in this bill, and I think back on my experience, and I think back on those different tragedies that I responded to, that I experienced, that will be with me for the rest of my life, the question that I ask myself is, if this policy in this bill had been in place at the time, would that suicide have been prevented? And unfortunately, I don't know that it would have. I don't know if those tragedies would have been prevented if this policy had been in place because of the wide variety of other tools, other means that folks used, unfortunately, to inflict that harm, sometimes up to and including fatal harm, on themselves. And so my concern is that in this bill, we're treating a symptom rather than the root cause. And if we're gonna fix this number, here on pages, uh, page two, lines 17 through 19, if we're gonna actually make a dent in this terrible, terrible statistic, we need to make sure that we're going beyond just the symptomatic display of this problem and we're drilling down and trying to actually identify the root cause of this problem. And I think the root causes of this problem are not gonna be something that's impacted and influenced to any significant degree by this bill. My concern, is that if this policy goes into effect, there's gonna be a lot of time, a lot of resources that go into implementing this. And those, that time and those resources, to me, is gonna be a, an opportunity cost. Because if you spend your time in one thing, well, you're not spending your time in another thing. If you're spending your resources in one area, well, you can't spend those resources in another area. And so, in order to bring down this statistic here, lines 17 through 19, 
Are we using our resources? Are we using our time in the most effective manner to solve this tragedy that actually is gripping our community and our state? Or are we just going to implement a policy that's going to make these self-destructive behaviors just um, shapeshift and morph and change and reappear somewhere else? Are we going to see perhaps a reduction in firearm-related suicides, but an increase in suicides by other means? Because you see, without going into a lot of the gory details, a lot of the folks that I re responded to that were successful in taking their own lives were unfortunately very committed to taking their life. And that very, was very obvious to anyone who responded to the scene just based on how the scene was, based on the nature and the position and the method by which somebody caused that harm to themselves. And somebody who is that committed to harming themselves, I don't think is going to be deterred by the policies laid forth in this bill. I don't think that the statistic here on page two is going to have a significant positive result as a, as a result of implementing these policies. And I'm concerned about the opportunity cost of the time and the resources that are going to be directed to the policies in this bill that are not going to be used in a more efficient and effective manner in actually getting down to the root cause and the root issue of why is it that we see this terrible, terrible number here on page two. And so that's a concern that I have, that we're not actually going to solve the problem here, that we're just going to redirect this. And rather than having a discussion about waiting periods on firearms, in a few years we may be having a discussion about waiting periods for different types of medications. We may have a discussion about waiting periods for rope, cordage, extension cords, doorknobs, shower heads, and the list of the tools and the situations in which I've seen people take their own life goes on and on and on. And so by focusing on the inanimate object, we're neglecting the person. By focusing on something other than the actual hurting human being, I'm concerned that we're not actually going to bring down this number here on page two. And that leads me to the next paragraph. Paragraph E, lines 20 through, 20, uh, 20 through 23, where it talks about nationwide from 2000 to 2018, rural suicide rates were higher than urban suicide rates and although suicide rates increased in both rural and urban areas during that period since 2007, rural rates have increased at a greater rate than urban areas. Now this is a statistic that I'm familiar with just growing up in rural Colorado and, and uh, living as close to rural Colorado as I can. My wife is uh, from the East Coast, so she didn't want to go live on 10,000 acres like I would have liked to do, but uh, we compromised, so I'm, I'm a little ways out of town. And so these are issues that I'm familiar with, that I grew up hearing about, knowing about, and watching them affect my communities, affect my friends, affect my neighbors. And applying that same analysis that we've talked about before, how do we actually reduce the problem that's laid out here on page two of the bill? starting on line 20. How do we care for our rural communities and ensure that our rural communities actually have access to the resources that they need in order to holistically solve the root problem rather than just addressing a symptom? So again, did a little bit of research just to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the picture that I had in my mind uh, wasn't just my own personal anecdotes, not supported by any uh, broader analysis. And I came across this article in the Fence Post, which is a uh, pretty popular rural media source. 
And the name of the article just says, Mental Health and Addiction Help, by ag and for ag during a wave of rural suicide. And this article's from 2021 in August, and it talks about a host of statistics that illustrate the effects of stress experienced by agricultural producers and rural residents. And it mentions a study by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention that says that farmers are among the most likely to die by suicide compared to other occupations. And that ties directly back to what we're seeing here on page two of the bill, where it talks about that rural suicide. And the study, you know, released in January 2020, prior to COVID, found that suicide rates had increased by 40% over the past 20 years. Now, again, this is specific to Colorado. The, the legislative declaration is talking national data, national statistics. The fence post is talking specific to Colorado, Colorado-specific data and information. And it says that the Colorado agricultural community was rocked by approximately half a dozen deaths by suicide in about as many weeks. And so a wide variety of folks came together to address this issue that's outlined here on page two. You've got Colorado Farm Bureau, Colorado Department of Ag, Colorado Cattlemen's uh, Ag Land and Trust, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, and a wide variety of other agricultural folks that partnered together to care for farmers and ranchers who have been most deeply impacted by the issues that unfortunately sometimes lead to the rural suicide rate that we see here on page two. And it talks about a wide variety of things, some of which are beyond the ability of this legislative body to control. But it talks about some things that are within the purview of this legislative body. Member of Farm Bureau uh, was talking about a program that was built based upon what farmers and ranchers said that they needed anonymous, free, accessible care without leaving the farmer ranch and staffed by professionals who understand agriculture. Now, I don't make my living from agriculture like some do. I've grown up around ag, I've been a ranch hand, I have cows of my own, but I don't make my living from agriculture. So, I can't speak with an incredibly deep amount of information to how do we bring down this rate here on page two, but I can make a corollary. I can make an analogy to something that I did in law enforcement. Because you see, as a military and veterans background, unfortunately, those professions also sometimes struggle with suicide. And so, when we're talking about rural suicide rates, when we're looking at this data here, nationally from 2000 to 2018, these suicide rates are increasing at a higher rate in rural areas than in urban areas. I think to myself, how can we address this problem here on page two, line 20 of the bill, in a way that these farmers and ranchers said they want? Somebody staffed by professionals who understand agriculture. And so very briefly in law enforcement, we had a program called peer support. Cops are the same way. They don't wanna to talk to somebody that doesn't understand law enforcement. Like our rural ag producers, they wanna to talk to somebody that understands their industry. And a lot of times they're gonna have that conversation better if they talk to somebody who's not necessarily a professional, but will, who will help them go seek that professional help. That's why we called it peer support. And that peer support program was very, very effective in having officers talk to other officers who kind of give them that push and guide them in that direction to seek that assistance from somebody who understands their industry. And I think that's very relevant to what we see here on page two and what we see here in the fence post when we talk about that rural suicide. That these farmers and ranchers want to have access to mental health care, to physical health care, to a wide range of care by professionals who understand their industry. And so I ask myself, does this bill do that? Or yet again, 
do we have a very well-meaning policy that doesn't unfortunately address the root cause of the terrible statistic here on page two, line 20. And what is the opportunity cost? As we spend these resources, as we spend the time discussing waiting periods for firearms, are we actually accomplishing something that will positively affect this number here on page two of the bill? And so I kept reading that Fence Post article to see, do we have any, any solutions here to this problem here on page two of the bill? And they talked a lot about a lot of things that I've, uh, I've kind of already glossed over. We need to have a way for neighbors to help neighbors. We need to have a way to have resources provided to these communities by folks who understand these communities. And so the article closes by saying, again, this is talking about suicide in rural agricultural communities. The message that I, so this is one of those, one of those stakeholders uh, that was quoted in the article, the message that I really want people to hear is that asking for help may be the most courageous thing that they do. And it might not just save their life, it might save a friend. And it won't happen overnight, but we have to start having that conversation because otherwise we might lose the people that we care about. And so for these rural communities, these small, tight-knit circles of folks that it talks about here on page two of the bill, lines 20 through 23, I ask myself, does this policy address the problem that's laid out? Or does it just cause the symptom to be treated, but then the symptom goes underground, changes, morphs, and then reemerges in a different shape? And then again, in two, three, four years, rather than being here, having a, a conversation about how can we actually solve the root problem that's driving these rural suicides? We're again just addressing yet another symptom of the issue. I think about a conversation that I had with a farmer in my district. This was actually just last week at an informal gathering of some friends in which he told me he can't sleep at night because of the stress that he's under. And a lot of the stress that he talked about, unfortunately, came from well-meaning policies. And I didn't have a good answer for him. Just said, I'll do my best to represent your concerns and let folks know that the things that are keeping you up at night as a rural, stressed out individual, the things that are keeping you up at night, I'll try to bring those to the attention of the legislative body that's making decisions for the state of Colorado. But I can't make any guarantees that we're actually going to be able to provide meaningful relief for the stressors that are keeping you awake at night. And in the conversation that we had about those stressors, unfortunately, none of it involved waiting periods for firearms. That was the furthest thing from his mind. He listed a whole variety of other things, increasing regulation, regulatory burden, difficulty finding workers, workforce issues, fuel prices, a lot of different issues. Those things are stressing him out. Those things are causing him to have a lot of mental health concerns. He can't sleep at night. And we know that those are the things that contribute to this, this figure that we see here on page two, lines 20 through 23. But I don't see anything in the bill that actually addresses that problem. And so that's another concern that I have. So moving on here, we'll get on to page three now. All right, so page three. Paragraph, where are we at here? A. So page three, paragraph A, that's going to be line seven. 
So we're out of the legislative declaration now. Now we're into the actual, um, uh, no, I apologize. We're not out of the legislative declaration yet. Uh, we're here, uh, parag uh, section two, paragraph A, line seven, where it says, delaying immediate access to firearms by establishing a waiting period for receipt of firearms can help prevent impulsive acts of firearm violence, including homicides and suicides. And so my question there is, again, does this work? Does this actually solve the problem that we're trying to solve? And so I thought about it. And what came to mind was that, as it says here in the bill, delaying immediate access to firearms by establishing a waiting period. Well, guess what? That only applies to the first firearm that somebody purchases. If somebody has already gone through whatever legal hoops are imposed to exercise their Second Amendment right, and I realize we've had a whole other discussion about what does shall not infringed mean, but let's say you live in a place like California that, in my humble opinion, does infringe on those rights a lot. You've gone through all those hoops. You're not a first-time firearm owner. You already have a firearm. Does page three, line seven of the bill here, actually do anything to keep you safe if you already legally own a firearm, if you already have legally exercised your constitutional right to own that firearm. Because in that case, we're not, this bill would not delay immediate access to the firearm in any way, shape, or form because that individual already owns a firearm. And that makes me very concerned. Because if the legislative declara declaration, the stated intent, as it says here, the, the line immediately preceding, the General Assembly declares that delaying immediate access to a firearm, if we're declaring that that's important, how far do we go down that road? How do we how, how, does the, how does the bill intend to delay immediate access to firearms for folks that already own a firearm? And I think that leads in a very, very concerning direction that runs completely contrary to the Second Amendment, to self-defense, to the right to protect yourself, to protect your loved ones. And so my concern with this particular paragraph is that when we're declaring that immediate access to firearms by establishing a waiting period for the receipt of firearms can help prevent impulsive acts of firearm violence, including homicides and suicides, this is only applying to first-time firearm buyers. Now, if you're going to buy a firearm, there's a whole lot of stuff that you have to go through first. First thing you got to do is you actually have to have them the money, the means to buy this firearm. And then you have to get yourself to wherever the place is that's going to sell the firearm because contrary to a, a lot of the internet myths out there, you can't order a gun on the internet. You have to get a firearm from a federal firearms dealer. You have to fill out a form 4473, which is the form required by the ATF to do a firearms transfer. You have to complete that firearms background check. So as it says here on line seven of the bill, delaying immediate access to firearms by establishing that waiting period, that only applies to that first time firearm buyer. And if somebody's buying a firearm for the first time, they have to go through all of those steps that I just outlined. And those steps have the background check, as it mentions here on line three of page three. You have to have a background check in order to purchase that firearm. You have to fill out on that 4473 a whole series of questions and attestations that state whether or not uh, you have a whole laundry list of risky behaviors in your past. You have to attest to these things on that 4473. And so when line nine here talks about preventing 
homicides and suicides, I, again, I go back to my concern that we discussed in that earlier, parag uh, that earlier paragraph of the legislative declaration, which says that homicide, that happens as a result of criminal intent. Now, most folks that have criminal intent aren't going to go through the process that I just outlined to purchase that firearm. They're not going to drive themselves down to their local, reputable, federally and state and locally licensed firearms store. They're not going to fill out that 4473. They're not going to pass that background check. And so I ask myself, is delaying immediate access to firearms actually going to prevent homicides? Because somebody that is going to comply with the provisions of this bill, the waiting period imposed by this bill, well, that's because they're doing this through a legally licensed, law-abiding firearm dealership. And if they're making this purchase through a legally licensed, law-abiding firearms dealership, that dealership is going to pick up on the fact via the background check, via that Form 4473, if there's a problem. And if there's a problem, guess what? That sale isn't going to be made under current law. And so, back here to the bill, page three, does delaying immediate access to firearms, which as we've established is only going to occur if somebody is purchasing this firearm from a legal firearms dealership, is that actually going to prevent homicide? And thinking through my law enforcement career, thinking through a lot of data and statistics, thinking through just the procedures outlined in the bill here, I can't help but think that yet again, the bill is not actually solving the problem that it purports to solve. That the homicides that are mentioned in this bill will not go down, and that once again the bill is giving an example of opportunity cost. Time and resources spent in one particular area can't be spent in another area. And that if we're serious about addressing the issues laid out here on page three, line nine, these homicides, we have to make sure that we're actually solving the root of the issue. We have to make sure that we're solving the root of the issue. <clears throat> and having spent 10 years dealing with folks that have either committed or attempted to commit homicide, I really struggle to see how a first-time firearm buyer, because again, this is all this is gonna affect. If you already own a firearm, all of the provisions of this bill are effectively meaningless because you already have that immediate access to firearm. This is only affecting a first-time firearm buyer. Does this bill actually prevent homicides from occurring by making a first-time firearm buyer wait for three days when we know that that firearm buyer, in order to be subject to the provisions of this bill, is going to have to go to a law-abiding dealership that already has a myriad of protections and background checks in place in order to ensure, as best as possible, that that firearm will not be used to commit a homicide. So that's another concern that I have with this bill. I also have a concern here, paragraph B of page three. So now we're on to line 10, where it says that the establishment of a waiting period is a matter of mixed state and local concern because the state has an interest in preventing suicides and homicides and local governments are equipped to determine the length of waiting periods best suited for their jurisdictions. And so I absolutely agree here with lines 11 and 12. The state absolutely has an interest in preventing suicides and homicides. That's what I did for 10 years. I did everything in my power as a sworn law enforcement officer to ensure that we did have safe communities in which homicides didn't occur 
And even though I didn't really know it was a part of the job when I signed up to do the job, I found out really quickly that, hey, guess what? Law enforcement also is the last safety net for making sure that we get at least some vestiges of mental health care into our community to do what it says here, uh, which is preventing suicides. I spent countless hours as a police officer talking to people in a wide variety of situations in which suicide was either maybe an idea or one particular case. <laughs> or in one particular case, I remember uh, the gentleman actually was sitting in his car waiting to unfortunately take his own life. And so over the course of the next two hours, we were able to talk to him, talk him down, find resources for this individual, and connect him to some supports to the point where I remember about six months later, he reached out to me and he said exactly what it says here in the bill, page three. The state, as a police officer, I'm an actor, I'm an agent of the state. The state has a vested interest in preventing suicides. And because of the two hours that I spent with this individual, talking with him, letting him know that he wasn't alone in the world, letting him know that there was a hope, letting him know that there were other people that cared deeply about him, connecting to those resources, stopping by his house uh, over the next days and weeks. I stopped by his house probably three or four times, and if he wasn't there, I'd leave him a card. I'd shoot him a text. As an actor of the state, as an official of the state, I did my absolute best to do what it says here on pages, or excuse me, lines 11 and 12, to prevent that suicide. But my question is this. Does this bill, does the policy in this bill actually provide the resources and the equipment and the training for the state to effectively prevent suicide? And again, as I read through this bill, I go back to that opportunity cost question. I see nothing in the bill that would enable or empower or equip actors of the state, like I was for over 10 years, to be able to provide that intervention, to be able to provide that meaningful human-to-human -human contact. The only thing that was keeping this individual from taking his own life was that he didn't want his wife to see it. A three-day waiting period wasn't going to stop that. The only thing that was gonna stop that was some form of human connection. And this individual was a firearms owner. He was actually a veteran. We'll get to veterans here in a little bit. This individual was a veteran. So, as we talked about earlier, the provisions here in line seven, delaying immediate access to firearms, that didn't apply to him. He already owned firearms. The only thing that kept that individual from taking his own life was providing him a human connection and connecting him to resources. And the policies in this bill, I don't see anywhere where they empower or provide or equip or resource actors of the state, officials of the state, to provide that life-saving service to their community in order to accomplish the mission of the legislative declaration here where it says that the state has an interest in preventing suicides. And another question I have here with this paragraph B is that it talks about the state but it also talks about... I'm sorry, Representative Evans. Um, members, it's, it's getting noisy in here. If we could tone it down, bring it down just a little bit. All right, Representative Evans, continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it talks about the state on line 11. And it also talks about local governments on line 12. And it says that local governments are equipped to determine the length of waiting periods best suited for their jurisdiction. And so my question to that, having worked for a local government, having worked in a local jurisdiction, having been the law enforcement liaison to the rest of the city, is how? How does the local government determine what is an appropriate waiting period for their jurisdiction? 
We heard a lot of dialogue earlier about how long does this waiting period have to be. The bill states three days. But that seems like a somewhat arbitrary number. Why three days? Where is the data to support three days? Why not seven days or 10 days or 30 days or a year? How does a local government make that determination? How does a local government ensure that that determination is of an appropriate length that respects the rights of a firearm owner to exercise their Second Amendment right to possess a firearm, to defend themselves, to defend their loved ones, to defend their home, to go hunting, to engage in recreational target shooting, to do as I did growing up, to participate in 4-H shooting sports? How does a local government determine what is the appropriate length of time for someone to wait before being able to possess a lawfully, legally owned firearm and able to engage in any of those activities that I just listed. Not only that, what happens to the businesses in that local government? Now you see, in the county where I live, we've got over 30 different municipalities. In the county where I worked as a police officer, there were over, I think there were 14 or 15 uh, different municipalities. And so if local governments are the ones, as it says here on line 12, if local governments are the ones who are determining the length of waiting periods best suited for their jurisdictions, what happens to the legal, lawful business owners, the legal, lawful, lawfully licensed firearms dealers in those communities when there is an arbitrary patchwork of waiting periods that is not consistent? If one jurisdiction goes with the three-day waiting period and the next jurisdiction over goes with a seven-day waiting period and the jurisdiction over from that goes with a 10-day waiting period in accordance with pair, uh, lines 12 and 13 here, what happens to the legal, lawful business owners who then find themselves subject to a very random and spotty set of waiting periods that can unduly impact their ability to actually conduct their business. Because you see, if I know that there's a city where the waiting period is only three days, I'm probably gonna go to that city to make my firearm purchase if my other options, if the other cities have a longer waiting period. And so by virtue of nothing other than their geographic location, I'm concerned that we have a situation in which, based on the provisions here in uh, lines 12 and 13, that legal lawful business owners are going to see their businesses negatively affected by a spotty patchwork of laws that favor legal lawful firearms owners in communities with a shorter waiting period than legal lawful firearms owners in communities with a longer waiting period. And so my question to that then is, how is that fair to a business owner? If, according to lines 12 and 13 here, if that local government is determining the length of waiting period best suited to their jurisdiction, how is the business supposed to legally and lawfully conduct their business without thinking in the back of their mind, wow, government's picking winners and losers. My business is doomed to failure, not because of my actual business practices, not because of anything that I did that did not comply with the law. My business is automatically on a lower footing merely because a local government determined that the geographic area in which my business is located should be subject to a longer waiting period. And so I'm concerned about how that impacts our business communities. I'm, I am concerned about how that impacts tax base. I'm concerned about all of the ways in which 
that can potentially negatively impact legal, lawful business owners in a local jurisdiction. Now, not only that, another concern that I have with lines 12 and 13 here is not only how does this impact business owners who are trying to untangle spotty laws, how does this impact citizens who legally want to purchase and carry or own a firearm? Now, I think you all know that I teach concealed carry firearms classes. I'm an NRA certified firearms instructor. I taught somewhere between two and 300 students last year, and that was after being a law enforcement firearms instructor uh, for several years. And so this question comes up a lot when I'm teaching my classes because we have a pretty robust curriculum that goes over not only uh, well-established law, but any sort of existing legislative changes that have occurred. And so one of the questions that my students often ask me is, if state preemption is not a thing anymore, state preemption referring to the state setting a standard, if state preemption is not a thing anymore, and if local jurisdictions are determining the length of waiting periods best suited for their jurisdictions, how is a citizen supposed to understand all of this complex web of different laws, different localities, where municipal boundaries are, what may actually have a municipal zip code but not actually be in that municipality, this is very confusing to somebody who wants to legally, lawfully, and responsibly exercise their Second Amendment right to own and, with the appropriate training and certification, carry a concealed firearm. But if we have that spotty patchwork of laws that it talks about here on lines 12 and 13, are we accidentally penalizing law-abiding citizens who are trying to comply with the law, who are doing their absolute best to continue to be a law-abiding citizen, but unfortunately are deterred from this because of the complexity of understanding different local ordinances that can change depending on what side of the street that one is standing on. And so, again, I have great concerns with this particular aspect of the bill. And so I keep reading on uh, along down into the bill. And I know you'll all be quite happy to know that I finally have gotten down to page four of the bill. Now you see, after getting through the legislative declaration, the bill goes on, it starts to amend Colorado Revised Statutes 1812-115, um, and it amends it by saying that there's a waiting period for firearm sales, there's a background check required, the penalties, the exceptions. It talks about it being unlawful for any person who sells a firearm to deliver the firearm to the purchaser until the later in time occurs three days after the licensed gun dealer has initiated a background check required pursuant to state or federal law, or the seller has obtained approval for the firearm transfer from the Bureau after it's completed any background check required by state or federal law. It talks about the penalties, um, that somebody who violates this commits a civil infraction and uh, upon conviction shall be punished by a fine of $500. And then it talks about a second or subsequent offense and then it gets down to the part of the bill that I want to talk about a little bit. It says this section does not apply to, so we're on page four, line six now. It does not apply to the sale of an antique firearm as defined in 18 United States Code section 921 uh, sub A sub 16 as amended. And so that piqued my curiosity a little bit because I wanted to know what is an antique firearm as defined in 18 United States Code 921 sub A sub 16? So I did a little bit of Googling, and I found, I know, Google's dangerous. 
And I found that particular section of the statute. And since it's referenced in the bill here, I want to make sure that we understand what that section of federal statute says. It says the term antique firearm means any firearm, including a firearm with a match lock, flint lock, percussion cap, or similar type of ignition system manufactured in or before 1898 or any replica of any firearm described in subparagraph A, so that's the paragraph I just read, if such replica is not designed or redesigned for using rim fire or conventional center fire fixed ammunition, or if it uses rim fire or conventional center fire fixed ammunition, which is no longer manufactured in the United States and which is not readily available in the ordinary channels of commercial trade, or any muzzle-loading rifle, muzzle-loading shotgun, or muzzle-loading pistol, which is designed to use black powder or black powder substitute, and which cannot use fixed ammunition. And so for purpose of this subparagraph, it says the term antique firearm shall not include any weapon which incorporates a firearm frame or receiver, any firearm which is converted into a muzzle-loading weapon, or any muzzle-loading weapon which can be readily converted to fire fixed ammunition by replacing the barrel, bolt, breech block, or any combination thereof. So there's an awful lot of stuff in there, and that's why I wanted to read it, because here in the bill, page four, line six and seven, when it says 18 USC section 921 sub A sub 16, that doesn't give me a whole lot of context about what we're talking about. And when I went and read the federal law that's cited in the bill here, which I just did to you all, it still left me up with a whole bunch of questions. And so I want to translate the federal legalese into what does that actually mean for somebody that's purchasing one of these? Because it says that, hey, this section does not apply to these antique firearms as designed in the code here. So I think it's important to note that these antique firearms mentioned here, lines six and seven, defined in federal law, are actually functioning devices that use black powder and percussion caps to actually launch a projectile downrange. It talks about 1898 in federal law, 1898 being the date, the cutoff date, something manufactured before 1898 is considered an antique firearm. Well, guess what? Firearms in 1897 were still dangerous. They were still deadly weapons. You can go watch any old Western. You can go watch any old cowboy movie. John Wayne's a particular favorite of mine. And when you go watch these movies, all of those firearms that are depicted in those movies fall under this definition here that we find on page four, lines six and seven of the bill, and the definition that's then referred to over in federal law. And so if the point of this bill is to mandate a waiting period by which somebody does not have access to something that has the potential ability to be a lethal or deadly weapon, it seems like this is a pretty big loophole here. Because those old pre-1898 antique firearms, to use the terms here used in the bill, those old firearms were the guns that won the West. They're very potent weapons in the hands of anybody that knows how to use one of these things. And so my concern is, once again, are we just treating a symptom and not the actual underlying issue? because this bill specifically exempts these antique firearms as defined in 18 U.S.C. 921 as amended. And so, if the goal is to keep a deadly weapon out of the hands of somebody, this section just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because those are weapons that were used for hundreds of years in order to defend themselves, defend others. 
So that's another concern that I have with this bill. Does it actually keep a deadly weapon out of the hands of folks? Or does it just redefine it and create more loopholes that once again are going to result in the problem changing, shape-shifting, and not actually being addressed? So moving on here from page four, lines six and seven, I promised you that uh, I would get back to the veteran issue. So line nine here, we find our veteran issue. It talks about in paragraph B of section two, the sale of a firearm by a person serving in the armed forces of the United States who will be deployed outside of the United States within the next 30 days to any immediate family member, which is limited to a spouse, parent, child, sibling, grandparent, grandchild, niece, nephew, first cousin, aunt, or uncle of the person. Now, I've talked a lot about being a law enforcement officer, but I've also spent some time in the military. I also deployed overseas in the military. And so when it talks about the sale of a firearm by a person serving in the armed forces of the United States, who will be deployed outside of the United States within the next 30 days, that raises a lot of red flags to me. Because you see, deployments are messy, complex, convoluted things. When I deployed, the first thing that happened was we were put on what were called state orders. We were on those state orders for about three Re days. Representative Evans, I, I'm not sure how this part relates, how, do, how your deployment relates to this current bill. So, uh, Madam Chair, I'm getting to the timeline here where it talks about the next 30 days, and I'm going to highlight how the pre-mobilization and the mobilization training that I went through in my deployment would actually penalize me uh, according to the 30-day timeline that is listed in the bill. So I think it's important to lay the context and the groundwork for how this 30-day timeline here would have discriminated against me in the deployment that I uh, performed. Understood. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I went through 30 days of pre-mobilization training under state orders. That pre-mobilization training occurred here because at the time I was a member of the Colorado Army National Guard stationed out at Buckley Air Force Base. After those 30 days of pre-mobilization training were complete at uh, what we called our home duty station, then we moved on to federal pre-mobilization orders. Those federal pre-mobilization orders were for a period of 60 days. And they directed me to go to Fort Hood, Texas. And so, Madam Chair, this is the part that I'm concerned about. Because you see, at the beginning of those federal pre-mobilization orders, at which time I was stationed in Fort Hood, Texas, I had not yet left the United States, as it says here in page four, line 10. I had not left the United States, but I had also been taken away from my home where my firearms live for a period of 60 days. And so if this bill restricts my ability to sell that firearm, if I'm gonna be deployed outside of the United States within the next 30 days, I would not have been able, under the provisions of this bill, to lawfully sell that firearm to one of my family members because I only have a 30-day window, according to this bill, before I leave the United States in which to sell that firearm. But my federal pre-mobilization orders that directed me to Fort Hood, Texas, meant that I was removed from even having access to my firearms, which live in their gun safe, I was removed from having access to those firearms 60 days before I deployed. And so if I needed to dispose of one of those firearms to sell it to one of the folks listed here on page uh, four, lines 12 through 14, I would not have been able to do that under the terms of this bill because this bill only gives me 30 days before I leave the country in which I can sell that firearm. When I deployed, I was two states away from my home 
but still inside the United States for 60 days before I left the country. And so I would have had no lawful recourse under this bill to actually sell or ensure that my firearm was lawfully transferred to any of the folks listed here on lines 12 through 14 if this bill was in effect. And that brings me to another concern about veterans, since we're talking about veterans here, folks serving in the armed forces of the United States. We talk about what happens when somebody is deploying in service of their country within the next 30 days. What about when those veterans return? I think we've all heard the statistic, somewhere around 22 veterans a day, unfortunately, take their own lives. And so, my question is if this bill is about preventing suicide, why does it not address anything to do with returning veterans? That's a very, a very sensitive time, that reintegration period when a veteran is returning home. And so, as I've mentioned before, my concern is that a symptom is being addressed, but not the actual root of the problem. And any time that that problem touches veterans, as my good colleague from Weld County said, all issues are veterans' issues. And so my concern is that we have a veterans' issue here that once again is not being adequately addressed, and part of the reason is the opportunity cost. The time and resources spent in one area can't be spent in another area. So I think I've outlined my concerns there with uh, lines 9 through 14. And I'd like to mention another issue, another concern that I have here with, with page 4, just in general. Because you see, page 4 line five, it talks about the exemptions in this bill. It says this section does not apply to the sale of an antique firearm, so that's one exemption. We talked about that. It talks about the sale of a firearm by a person serving in the armed forces who will be deployed outside the United States within the next 30 days. We talked about that, how this, uh, this would have impacted my ability to sell a firearm, given that I was away from my home for 60 days before I left the United States. And then we have a third exemption here, um, paragraph C, where it talks about a firearm transfer for which a background check is not required pursuant to the law. So there we have three different exceptions. And so my concern is that in the states that do have waiting periods, Pretty much all of those states have more exceptions than what's written here in Colorado. I think back to the state of the state address in which the governor said that we're Colorado, not California. California has more exemptions in their waiting law than Colorado would under this bill here. And I find that to be concerning, that this bill has less exemptions than the California law when we're supposed to be Colorado, not California. So I've talked for quite a bit. Don't worry. I got a lot more to talk about as this night goes on. But uh, I'll start to get toward the end of my, my comments here, wrapping some things up. So one thing that I wanted to address before I hand this, <laughs> before I hand this off to some of my colleagues. One of the speakers before me mentioned that law enforcement are second responders. And so I just wanted to touch on that very briefly because as this bill talks about, you know, in the, the waiting period, we'll get to these amendments a, a little bit later on, but there's a lot of situations in which someone might need a firearm to defend themselves or loved ones inside this three-day window or whatever the window is that's determined by a local government. 
And so there's a saying that we often had in law enforcement that said, and I can say this because I'm a cop, when seconds count, law enforcement is only minutes away. And so I think it's important to say that because when seconds count, minutes are really long. But a three-day waiting period is a lot longer than that. And so to tie this all back to how I initiated this conversation, we're talking about a three-day waiting period. Gary Hagen, that UN uh, inspector for the Rwandan genocide, talked about how when homicide, this bill talks a lot about homicide, when homicide is occurring, the only thing that is needed in that particular moment in time is a hand to restrain the machete. And so if, when seconds count, law enforcement is only minutes away, a policy that requires a minimum of a three-day waiting period, to me, is very dangerous to the vulnerable victims in our community, those folks who, as we read at the beginning of the bill, are at risk of homicide, or who have, unfortunately, been the victims of all of the terrible homicide statistics that the bill discussed in the legislative declaration. And so that's the thought I'd like to leave you with. Does this bill protect those victims? Does this bill actually reduce the terrible statistics contained in the legislative declaration? Or is it an example of opportunity cost, of spending time and resources on a symptom that does not actually solve the issue at hand. Thanks. Representative Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is pretty tight serving with you. <clears throat> pretty tight serving with you. Members, you know, I've, I'm called to come up here because we've been hearing a lot today from uh, those who are opposed to this bill that this bill would put women of color who experience domestic violence in danger. As a woman of color who has experienced domestic violence, I fully support this bill. We know that in the rare cases in which survivors, <clears throat> when survivors do use firearms to protect themselves, they are often charged with a violent crime themselves. For example, a study in the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services found that 93% of women who had been convicted of killing an intimate partner had previously experienced abuse at the hands of that partner. One notable case is that of Marissa Alexander. Florida has a stand your ground law, which allows individuals to use deadly force if they are in danger. Alexander fired a warning shot when threatened by her abusive then husband. And she was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Waiting periods are essential to saving lives, both an individual's self as well as a potential future victim. Waiting periods are common sense. Waiting periods are not a violation of the Constitution. There's nothing in waiting periods that says that one cannot bear arms. Let's be clear. There is nothing in waiting periods that says that one cannot bear arms. Therefore, it is fully constitutional within laws written. What is important for us to know tonight as we are engaging in this debate around waiting periods and how waiting periods can save lives, can help avert victims in the future, is that it allows for cooling down times. It allows for individuals who are angry and run out of the house and want to buy a gun to go home and kill their, their spouse or their intimate partner, it forces them to take time. That is why this bill is so important for our communities, for ourselves, for families, Waiting periods are essential in ensuring that when somebody is feeling that need 
to do something because they are sad, because of their trauma, because of what they're experiencing, it helps them to take time to get the services and care and support before they take an action that cannot be reversed. We can no longer use an argument that not having waiting periods is safer because that is blatantly false and it is important that within this chamber we only bring truths and facts when we are debating policy. I am not going to continue speaking up here right now because I don't have a need to belabor points that we know are true. I am just going to reiterate one more time that waiting periods, in fact, save lives, and I fully support this bill. Thank you. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a lot to say. <laughs> According to the CDC, 500,000 to 3 million people use self-defense to save their lives. So I don't know where this statistical evidence is coming from, but I beg to differ. Rep Immobile, I do care about your son as a person. As a woman who buried her only daughter, I wouldn't wish that pain on my worst enemy. So please understand that my caucus does care about the mental illness and, and people that struggle with it. So. Um, as a scientist and a healthcare worker, I think we as legislators have to demand that we bring empirical and statistical evidence, not research that sides with our feelings. We have to do better, and we have to demand that our colleagues do better. When listening to expert testimony on this bill, one study was quoted over and over that a waiting period decreases homicides and suicides. This article has many flaws and a, an outlier as an injustice to the community. Scientific progress in understanding how to address this problem has been limited in part because of limited research funding, which itself is largely due to the politics around guns in America. You don't say. The bill sponsors and the witnesses who testified in favor of this bill continuously quoted the Luca et al. article. In their article, Luca et al. argued that the adoption of mandatory waiting periods for handgun purchases reduces gun homicides by about 17%. In the same journal, an article was written by another author that said, these estimated effects are enormous. Most remarkable of all is that the policy intervention that leads to these reductions in gun violence would seem to impose so few costs on society. In what follows, the author tries to put the magnitude of Luca et al's estimates into context to help readers appreciate how large and overstated they are. Moreover, if the results are correct, they would imply that almost all gun violence in America is committed by people with only transitory motivation. However, it's also possible that their estimates overstate somewhat the effects of waiting periods on gun violence. This is not an intended criticism, the author states. The question they address is intrinsically difficult. Refining our understanding of this question is likely to require better data systems in the future. Their analysis also raises a natural follow-up question. If these laws are so helpful, why do only 16 states out of 50 have such policies currently in place? The answer seems due in part to what have been called the collective action problem that leads a small but highly motivated minority of the population to dominate the legislative process. The Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act, implemented in February 1994, provides an unusual opportunity to conduct a systematic review and evaluation, not just an article, of a national system of background checks and waiting periods for the purchase of handguns from federally licensed firearms dealers. A total of 18 states and the District of Columbia already met those requirements. But dealers and law enforcement officials in the other states had to institute more stringent procedures. The result is sort of a national experiment. 
with states in this change or treatment group, and then another group, the no change states serving as controls, thus creating a way to determine if implementing a waiting period for gun purchase led to reductions in homicide and suicides rates like the Luca et al. article described. They said a 17% change. The main outcome measures of their systematic re review were homicide, firearm homicide, suicide, and firearm suicide rates per 100,000 population, as well as the percentage of homicides and suicides committed with a gun. These outcome measures were calculated from the vital statistics census of deaths of U.S. residents from the National Center for Health Statistics. When the Brady Act went into effect in February of 1994, a total of 32 states were required to implement the background check and a five-day waiting period. The remaining states were exempted because they already required a background check of those buying handguns. For the analysis, the 32 states were classified as treatment states, and the remaining states were classified as the control states. Using statistical analysis and equations to determine outcomes and using controls to account for variability. For victims aged 21 years or older, there were no differences between the treat and control states and any of the homicide or suicide measures, and they use statistical significance at the traditional 95% level. Their analysis provided no evidence that implementation of the Brady Act, a five-day waiting period, was associated with a reduction in homicide rates. In particular, they found no differences in homicide or firearm, hom firearm homicide rates to adult victims in the 32 treatment states directly subject to the Brady Act provisions compared with the remaining control states. This study was the biggest compilation of statistical data. Going back to the article used in proponent of this bill, handgun waiting periods reduce gun deaths. There is significant flaws in their research. Their claim that waiting periods imply a 17% reduction in gun homicides, but it does not make it apparent whether the hom homicides relate to criminal activity, suicide, or justifiable self-defense. A valid study would provide more information if the bill sponsors weren't just focused on suicide. The study also did not cite a specific three-day waiting period, and this bill assumes that a significant number of people take their own life or someone else's life within three days of purchasing a gun. But there's no evidence for that. There's no, there's no statistical evidence that says after three days they don't. To the contrary, nationwide, and this is important, the average time between acquiring a gun lawfully and using it in any crime is six years. In Colorado, the average time is 6.59 years. So in other words, Colorado's firearm time to crime average is already better than the nation as a whole. Is there any data to show that 17% of Colorado suicides happen within three days of purchasing a firearm? If not, we sh shouldn't we wait for the Colorado Bureau of Investigation to compile this data? So why are we depriving someone who's already passed a background check, and in fact per perhaps several background checks, of the right to use what they legally own? Would this really be a deterrent for someone that already owns firearms? How does that make any sense? If they are, are we talking that we need to strip all the universal background checks that have gone into play? Are, are those not competent enough? Because that's what this is saying. According to the Fifth Amendment, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. In the United States, we've seen the plague of online bullies. In many instances, these online bullies have driven classmates to suicide. As a mom of four children, one in uh, middle school, one in high school, we've seen what cyberbullying is doing to our teenagers in this country, especially in my neck of the woods in Douglas County. The National Institute of Health Researchers, led by a, a doctor from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, used data from more than 10,000 young adults with an average age of 12. As part of the survey of the study, adolescents reported if they experienced cyberbullying. Their results were published in JAMA in June of 2022. 9% reported being a target of cyberbullying, with females and black participants more likely to be bullied online. The participants who experienced cyberbullying were four times more likely to report thoughts of suicide attempts. So
So should we then impose a three-day cooling period between the time we download an app for Facebook or TikTok or Instagram? And then do we have a cooling off period before they can get back on? Are we, are we suspending kids from being online using social media because that can lead to suicide attempts? I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what, what, what we do and what we don't do. Of course not because that would violate our right to free speech. So how can sponsors legitimately violate our right to use property that legally belongs to us? A new study of intentional drug overdose deaths or suicides by an overdose of a medication or drug found an increase in young people aged 15 to 24, older people aged 75 to 84, and non-Hispanic black women. This study also found that women were consistently more likely than men to die from intentional drug overdoses. Nearly 92,000 people died from drug overdoses overall in the U.S. in 2020. So now, let me get this. Do we have a waiting period for anti-anxiety meds or depression meds? Or do we have a three-day waiting period for prescription drugs? Because on Lexapro, I can fatally overdose. So now, every month, instead of getting my prescription, do I have to have a three-day waiting period before I can fill my prescription? Because that can kill me as well? I don't think so. The data in this study used to construct this bill contradicts other state law. So are we now going to abandon universal background checks simply because this flawed study says so? I just was at dinner with a friend last night that works at Sky Ridge Medical Center. An ex-wife came in because her husband tried to run her over with a car. So now do we turn off cars like breathalyzers and we don't let people drive their cars if they become violent towards their spouses? I mean, this is what it's saying. Guns aren't the only things that are killing people. We should ban cars and kitchen knives and prescription drugs and everything that has the possibility of taking someone's life. We need to combat suicide with more mental health facilities and programs derived at prevention. How sad that we're in this country, we are last in this country in the state of Colorado at treating mental illness. This bill is not effective in preventing more suicides and I ask for a no vote. Thank you. Thank you. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Chair. People keep messing with this podium. I, I don't get it. As to the, uh, as to the statistics, reminds me of uh, teaching, uh, teaching calculus. I think it was something like 97.25% of all statistics are made up on the spot, usually with a ridiculous degree of confidence to uh, convey authority. The study here is greatly flawed. It is incredibly flawed. The study is the basis for this bill. Having a, having a law based on a completely, nearly completely discredited study does not make for a good law. Going back if we're talking about suicide rates, suicide rates skyrocketed during the pandemic for a completely ineffectual and counterproductive lockdown, masking, etc. That caused massive amounts of suicide with teens. We consider that, that's largely, or often considered, just collateral damage. How many people's lives did that destroy? That wasn't an issue. This becomes an issue. Suicide rates. As for the law, in a significant victory for the Second Amendment, civil rights, since it was just declared that waiting periods are not an infraction of the Declaration of the uh, Constitution, a federal judge ruled this, week's, this week that the state's 10-day waiting period for firearm purchases is unconstitutional. The laws were challenged by California gun owners, as well as Cal Gun Foundations and the Second Amendment Foundation. In the decision issued August 25, the Federal Eastern District of California's senior judge appointed to the bench by President Bill Clinton, no less, found that the 10-day waiting periods of penal code sections whatever violate the Second Amendment. So let's see, they violate the 10-day waiting periods, violate the Second Amendment. Let's see if he goes on to say that, but if it was three, it would be okay. 
as applied to members of certain classifications like Sylvester and Combs and burdens the Second, oh, second Amendment rights of nothing, nothing on three day, no qualification for three day. The 10 day waiting period violates the Second Amendment and burdens the Second Amendment rights of the plaintiffs. Combs, who serves as executive director of Cal Guns Foundation, said the decision proves that California gun owners are not second-class citizens and the Second Amendment isn't a second-class right. He said the decision lays a strong foundation for other irrational and unconstitutional gun laws, which will be challenged, and we look forward to doing just that. The unfortunate part of the challenging and reinforcing the gun rights is a tremendous amount of time and money lost. There is no doubt that this law, this proposed legislation, is unconstitutional. The Fifth and the Fourteenth, the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, they both declare, it was important enough to repeat, that no person may be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. It doesn't say by who. So the Fourteenth Amendment applies to you being deprived of life, liberty, of, or property by either a crook or by the government. But I repeat myself. The Second Amendment is important because it emphasizes the sovereignty of the individual over government. We, we are trotting on something that was meant to never be dabbled with, shall not be infringed. I talk about that at the very outside, outset. Shall not be infringed. That is the plain language of, of our Constitution. Shall not be infringed. It doesn't say shall not be infringed unless it's a really good idea. Unless you really have good intentions, then you can infringe. There's no clause. There's no good intention clause. The only where good intentions are is when Karl Marx says the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Representative DeGraff. Yes, ma'am. Please, let's That not just seemed him. like a relevant quote. It, it, oh, I, I'm sorry. I consider it a little irrelevant. Let's get back to the bell, please. H-E double hockey sticks. Okay. This is important. It, it, the, the Second Amendment is important because it emphasizes the sovereignty of the individual over government. While the average constitution is less than 15 years, our stability is key to our prosperity and our stability is hinged on our individual sovereignty and our sovereignty is highlighted by our ability, the right to keep and bear arms in defiance, if necessary, of the government. So it is absolutely ridiculous to consider that it would be appropriate for the government for whom, from whom, the Second Amendment is intended to protect you, to put a restriction on so you can beg, so you can beg to protect yourself from the government. This bill is a foot in the door, whether it's intended to be or not. I'm okay with considering the bill all to be good intentions, but it is a foot in the door. A foot in the door is a technique a compliance tactic that aims at getting a person to agree to a large request by having them first agree to a moderate, a modest request. So that's what this is. This is a foot in the door. You just say, it's wafer thin. It's only a three-day waiting period. It's only a 10-day waiting period. It's only a 60-day waiting period. It's only a 90-day waiting period. It's only 120, oh, you can't, have, you can't have it at all. It's a foot in the door. It's, it's the camel's nose under the tent. The 10 day waiting period, so to expand on that, the waiting period law prohibits every person who purchased a firearm from taking possession of the law for a minimum of 10 days. So this goes to the California. So we could just say three days, that is, 
there is a period of at least 10 days in which California prohibits every person from exercising the right to keep and bear arms. There can be no question that the actual possession of a firearm is a necessary prerequisite to exercising the right to keep and bear arms. Further, there has been no showing that the Second Amendment, as historically understood, did not apply for a period of time between the purchase attempted, the, the purchase slash attempted purchase of a firearm and possession of the firearm. Although Attorney General Harris argues that waiting period laws is a minor burden, again, wafer thin, on the Second Amendment. So he, he didn't say it was no burden. He just, as our colleague just said moment, moments ago, he didn't say it was a minor burden. He didn't say it was an inconsequential burden or no burden, he said it was a minor burden. So it was a burden, it was an infringement. It's a minor infringement. But what does our Constitution says? say? Shall not be infringed. It's not shall not be, minor infringements are okay. Shall not be infringed. Therefore, the court concludes that the waiting period law burdens the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. The next step is to analyze the waiting period laws under either strict or intermediate scrutiny. As indicated above, Harris indicate, advances two rationales in defense of the waiting period laws. It provides a cooling off period. It's funny how this 10-day this waiting period with the same rhetoric used is now being brought to Colorado. When the governor made a specific note that we are not California. I think he just forgot to add yet. For those who may have an impulse to commit violence, so it provides a cooling off period for those who may have an impulse to commit violence, and it provides time for California to conduct a background check. It is unnecessary for the court to determine at this time which scrutiny to apply because even under the lesser immediate, intermediate scrutiny, summary judgment is not appropriate. With respect to the rationale of providing time to, to perform a background check, Heller indicated that some laws or regulations presumptively do not offend the Second Amendment, including laws that prevent felons and mentally ill persons from possessing firearms. It presumptively can constitutionally pro prohibit certain categories of possess from possessing firearms, then it would seem to follow that a state can also perform some type of background check in order to ensure that disqualified person is not attempting to obtain a firearm. Indeed, the plaintiffs do not argue that the background checks are constitutionally improper. They are constitutionally improper, nor do they argue that California should not perform background checks. What plaintiffs essentially argue is that the 10-day period is arbitrary and is substantially overbroad. There is no evidence regarding the nature of of the background checks performed, how much time is necessary to perform a background check, why 10 days are necessary, in this case, why three days are necessary in order to perform a background check. As for the curling down rationale, Harris has not presented sufficient evidence that the, ten, the cooling period is a reasonable fit. For example, there is no evidence concerning how a 10-day period was determined for a cooling off. As evidence, concerning cooling and gun violence in general for those waiting to purchase a firearm or that 10 days is not substantially broader than necessary. So 10 days was struck down in California, so we're trying, we're trying three days in Colorado. 10 days was considered too big a foot in the door, so we're gonna try a little bit smaller shoe size in the door just to keep it propped open so then we can ask for something more. Because three days, we already know, was not the intent. 10 days, 60 days, 120 days were already thrown out as possibilities. It's hard to see how handgun cooling off periods will materially reduce danger of impulsive or crime or injury. It's, an e it's easy to commit, trying to get the language right, to achieve suicide with a shotgun as with a handgun and for a crime of passion with a shotgun or knife. We already talked, uh, Representative Bottoms talked through some very heinous crimes that were done on the spur of the moment with very brutal, it should be quite, thanks brother. All gun waiting periods might be principle, in principle be effective if the buyer is an otherwise law-abiding citizen, who wouldn't just turn to the black market instead? 
That's a common refrain. If we, if we criminalize these, if we criminalize the Second Amendment, then only criminals are going to have criminalized guns and only criminals will have guns. But even that is not proven. As with so many reducing danger arguments, the social science evidence on the effect of cooling off periods is inconclusive. So the, we don't even have anecdotal evidence, really, that cooling off periods are effective. We have a feeling that cooling off periods are ineffective. Not data, just a feeling. At least one state, Maryland, Maryland, requires an extra background check before a gun can be picked up and imposes a seven-day waiting period for that reason. Seven day, 30 day, 60 day. The federal background check is generally instant, but it can take several days to complete if someone with the same name as the applicant is on a prohibited list. Finally, Illinois, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina apparently require up to a month, or in New, York case, New York's case, six months for a handgun purchase for permit. Other states require from two to 15. We've already talked about how an emergency concealed carry permit to protect yourself from a stalker, from, from anybody, could be well too late inside of that three days, certainly inside of six months. Reminds me of free fall training where if you had an emergency, you had the rest of your life to figure it out. Other states require from two to 15 days. Are these waiting periods substantial burdens on self-defense and therefore on the framework? And going back to the fifth and 14th amendment, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. The constitution is a, is a playing field leveler. And what this body is looking to do is make it easier for somebody to deprive you of life, liberty, of, or life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. We can't, dis we can't just discuss intent because that's the reality. You can't, you can't negate the fact that people will die because of this bill. It's statistics. It already happens. Those are, that's data that we have. The data we don't have is the data that is supposedly in support of this bill. In one way, are they? A person covered by the waiting period is entirely unable to descend himself or herself for days, weeks, and month, or months in New York. An attack that requires self-defense can happen during the waiting period just as easy as it can happen at any other time. Moreover, in some situations, the attack may be especially likely to occur during the, the waiting period. A person's attempt to buy a gun may be prompted by a specific threat, a threat which could turn into an actual attack in a matter of days or hours. If a woman leaves an abusive husband or a boyfriend who threatens to kill her for leaving, she may need a gun right away. Not 10 days, not 30 days, not 60 days, not 90 days, not 120 days, not six months later, but immediately. Now, We've talked about the right to bear arms. It is for self-defense. It is to preclude you from being deprived of your life, liberty, or property without due process of the law by either the government or other forms of criminal behavior. But what about the anti-tyranny case? That's what it's really there for. Well, it's, I mean, it's there for all the reasons. We have the, and, and we like, and during the testimony, it was, it was told to us that one of the testimonies is that, well, that's unlikely to happen. Well, that's, that's been the case in every other country. So the question, and if you look at the Declaration of Independence, you'd have to say yes, because it's the fifth that in the, in the, uh, the values. Do the people have a right to defend themselves against a tyrannical government, and does the Second Amendment reinforce that right? And if it does reinforce that right, if the people do have a right to defend themselves against a tyrannical government, does, a, does the government have the right to deprive them? What would a tyrannical government do with the right to bear arms? What would a tyrannical government do about somebody, about 
people who wanted to protect themselves from tyrannical governments. Criminals, tyrants, generally prefer their subjects. They prefer their victims unarmed. The Second Amendment people, but trying to discern the thinking is thoughtless and pointless. Instead, it is better to consider the guidance of the Constitution. According to the Declaration of Independence, just laws come from the consent of the governed. Prudence dictates against changing long-established governments. So this goes to the Declaration of Independence. Prudence dictates changing long against changing long established governments or withdrawing consent for light and transient causes, said the Declaration. But in, by 1776, the long train of usurpations and abuses by King George's government had demonstrated a design to reduce the colonists under absolute despotism. Despotism and tyranny aren't instantaneous, they grow. The Declaration pointed out that the Americans had repeatedly asked their British brethren to redress the problems, but the British have been deaf to the voice of justice and therefore necessity required by the Americans to separate from Great Britain as a last resort. Jefferson later exclaimed, explained that among the sources of the Declaration were the elementary books of public right, such as the work of Cicero, Locke, and Sidney. C.K. Chesterton, to paraphrase, said if you find a fence in the road and you want to remove it, first go figure out why that fence is there. Then come back and maybe it can be removed. We've spent a lot of time, we've spent a little bit of time with this bill, a brief amount of time. Have we studied the, have we studied the works of Cicero, Locke, and Sidney? in determining, that were used in determining the, the necessity Re for things Representative, like, you've, you've lost me. I'm, I'm not sure where you're going. Please well, Ma'am, I'm, ma I'm going to the fact that our founders have spent a considerable amount of time and effort researching and studying the civilizations, the Mediterranean, the Middle East particularly. But we're talking about waiting periods. Well, we're talking about waiting periods, but we're also talking about the, the ability of the government, in this case, which is imposing waiting periods. So we're talking about the ability of the government to impose waiting periods, and that speaks directly to the, the purpose of the Fifth Amendment, which was to protect from government. So the reason that we would want to discuss why we would have a protection from uh, the government imposition in this case or the, or the moral authority for the government to re reduce or to infringe on a, uh, what they consider, what they recognized as a creator endowed right is, is significant. The, the founders went through gr to, to great lengths. They didn't just say, hey, we think you ought to have guns because you might want to go hunting. They didn't just say, we think you ought to have guns because down the road you might have a government. They looked at history. And so I'm saying before we reduce, before we remove the barriers, before we look at removing the barriers to government intervention in a creator endowed right, as recognized by the Declaration of Independence, we should probably have a good idea of why the founders made such an emphasis to put in the Declaration of Independence shall not be infringed and specifically left out unless good intentions. There is no such clause. I'm just citing the, the works that they studied and asking if we've studied these, we've, if we've studied these same works before we, make a, before we make a law that undoes 250 years of history. We have this history of the United States. We have a sta stable constitution because the people are sovereign over the government. The people are sovereign over the government, and the Declaration of Independence recognizes that sovereignty, and part of that sovereignty is the ability to, to bear arms and for the government to not restrict that. Those theorists agreed that the government without consent is the same as robbery. That's why I said I repeat myself. In both cases, forcible defense was legitimate. But once Americans had won their independence, how could the Declaration's legal principles be applied if an American government became abusive? 
When the proposed Constitution was before the, was before the people for ratification, many anti-federalists worried that the new government would be too powerful. So we're talking about the, the, the government that right now, that's us, would like to restrict the rights of the people for even three days, or 60, or 90, or 120, or a year, and that could become tyrannical. In the Federalist number 46, James Madison reassured the public that many checks and balances in the Constitution, the separation of powers between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, for example, made it very unlikely that a tyrant could seize power. If a tyrant did, he would speedily be deposed by the state governments who would lead the armed people in the militias. Besides the advantage of being armed, this is a direct quote, besides the advantage of being armed, which the Americans possess over, other, over the people of almost every other nation, Madison wrote, the existence of subordinate governments to which the people are attached and by which the militia officers are appointed forms a barrier against the enterprises of ambition more insurmountable than any which, place that sim which a simple government or any form can admit of. By simple, Madison meant a unitary government such as France, as opposed to the United States Constitution of dividing sovereignty between the people and the government. Madison, the founders rejected the notion that individuals or some group could use armed force just because they did not like a particular law. In fact, they believed quite the opposite. The Constitution specifically empowers Congress to provide for the calling of the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. The power was first executed, exercised during the president, presidencies of George Washington and John Adams. When the federal government called for state militias to suppress insurrections down to the Whiskey Rebellion and Fry's Rebellion, both insurrections had grown out of anti-tax pro protests in which mobs crossed the line using force. In contrast, the American Revolution perfectly fit with the principle of intermediate magistrates. Independence was declared by delegates representing the state governments. So again, we're speaking directly to the, the, the formation of our Declaration of Independence, why we have the formation of independence, why we have, why we have a Second Amendment, and why it is so important to not infringe on the Second Amendment, because any infringement on the Second, in the Second Amendment invites the next infringement on the Second Amendment. In contrast, the American Revolution, Revolution perfectly fit with the principle of intermediate magistrates. Independence was de declared by de delegates representing the state governments. The Second Amendment does not create the right of revolution against a tyranny. That's important, just like the, the Second Amendment does not grant you the right to keep and bear arms. The Second Amendment recognizes your right to keep and bear arms as creator endowed, as, a, as created in the image of God. That inherent right is universal. As stated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the United Nations in 1948, it is essential if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and, against tyranny and oppression, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. The Universal Declaration was influenced by the Declaration of Independence, thanks in part to the United States delegation led by Ambassador Eleanor Roosevelt, who carried her own handgun for protection. So for the UN, it is essential that if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. But our Declaration of Independence looked at it and said, okay, well, if that rule of law breaks down, it is important for the people to be armed. And the best defense is a, the best offense is a good defense. And so the best way to prevent that from happening is the armed citizens. Just like we're trying, we're just like we're sending the billions of dollars worth of aid to Ukraine to defend themselves. The Second Amendment, however, do, does, however, reinforce the rule of law and anti-tyranny structure of the United States Constitution by ensuring the government cannot disarm the people, cannot disarm the people, cannot disarm the people for one day, cannot dif disarm the people for two days, cannot disarm the people for ten days. 
oh, can't, oh, I skipped three. Can't, can't disarm the people for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, however many years you want. In the 2008 District of Columbia versus Heller, all nine justices agreed that the amendment protects an individual's right to keep and bear arms for service in the militia. There's the regulated and unregulated militia, unregulated militia being able-bodied men between 18 and I think 45. The justices agreed about whether the right includes other purposes such as personal self-defense or hunting. Why did the founding generation believe that a well-regulated militia was necessary? One reason, observed Justice Anton Antonian Scalia, when the able-bodied men of a nation are trained in arms and organized, they are better able to resist tyranny. So if anything, if we wanted to keep in with the nature of our Constitution Declaration of Independence, we would be insisting on proper training of our youth in how to respectfully and responsibly handle handguns or any gun, the tools of the Second Amendment. Explaining the purpose, proposed Second Amendment, Madison's ally, Tench Cox, a delegate to the Continental Congress for Pennsylvania wrote, as civil rulers not having the duty to the people duly before them may attempt to tyrannize and as the military forces, which must be occasionally raised to defend our country, might pervert their power to the injury of their fellow citizens. The people are confirmed by the next article in their right to keep and bear their private arms. To keep and bear their right to private arms. So the people are confirmed by the next article in their right to keep and bear arms. Madison thanked Cox for the newspaper essay. Madison was kind of around at the Declaration, so he probably knows a little bit about the founding of our Constitution, our founding of our founding of our country, and the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> this is good stuff. I hadn't had a chance to read it, so this is good. Use that definitely safety safety rules of precaution should not be taught and enforced, but the right of citizens to bear arms is just one more guarantee against arbitrary government against arbitrary government. That would be government that like spends and taxes and spends and taxes. One more safeguard against tyranny, which now appears remote in America, but which historically has proved to always be possible. As Humphrey recognized, there was local tyranny in the Jim Crow system of the South. In the mid-1960s, the Ku Klux Klan was so powerful. Thank you, sir. was so powerful in the southwestern Mississippi and southeastern Louisiana that they called the region Klan Nation. That's not awesome. The Klan's organized terrorism had the tacit acquiescence of local law enforcement. So Klan Nation, the Ku Klux Klan, was effectively acting as a branch of the government. That happens in Venezuela. In the, in the summer of 1965, about 20, 20 black army veterans in Jonesboro, Louisiana, founded an armed community defense patrol, deacons for the defense and justice. Inspired by visible... I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't see how this has to do with waiting periods. This has to do with waiting periods. This has to do with the, this has to do with the historicity of... Excuse me, Madam Historicity? Chair. Historicity? You made this, up a new word again? I, well, I might, but yeah. I'm pretty sure that's a legitimate word. But we're dealing with the history or the historicity of, the, uh, of why the Second Amendment was protected, was created, and defended. So the Second Amendment speaks directly, it speaks to any infringement, and any, of course, would be a subset of three. In the, sub, in the summer of 1960, uh, going back to the Deacons for Defense, inspired by public visible presence of boldly armed men, black attitudes in jo Jonesboro began to change. Black housekeepers stopped accepting racial taunts and quit if the taunts continued. I think that's fantastic. 
black housekeepers stopped accepting racial taunts and quit if the taunts continued. Armed Negroes made Jones Bureau un an unusual town was the headline of New York Time in article in 1965. The Deacon's model spread to other Klan heartlands and was able to overturn Klan power. So again, the purpose of disarming has been subjugation. This foot in the door is just a foot in the door towards bigger subjugation. In June 19, whether it's intended or not, and I'm going to assume that it's not attended. In June 1966, after the attempted murder of civil rights leader James Meredith, major civil rights organizations banded together to continue the Meredith's march against fear. From Memphis, Tennessee, armed security was provided. Hotheads who try to make political statements by armed displays often do not help their cause. Such was the case of the American Indian movements over Wounded Knee, South Dakota Reservation, the 2016 arms should be a last resort, not a public, not a publicity tactic. So I agree with that. Today's world is different from 1791. The genocides of the last century show that a criminal government is even more dangerous than the founders thought. And if you look at the results of the totalitarian governments, and the totalitarian governments would certainly want to have the, the, any restriction, and any restriction draw, grows from a small restriction on firearms, on the ability to defend yourself, on the ability to defend your life, liberty, and property from criminals or government and or. Over 100 million people have been killed in, this, in, in, the, in the world by totalitarian regimes. That is why the Second Amendment is so important. That is why any infringements on the Second Amendment are going to be resisted. Because what this will do, this law, we pass, say we pass it because of good intentions. It's not going to work. So what's going to be necessary after that? Well, you're going to have to have a little bigger infringement, but because you've already accepted the one, now you're going to have to accept the other. And then you just go to the law, and then you amend it, and you change it from 3 to 10, from 10 to 30. That's how this works. That's how appeasement works. That's how appeasement works every time it's tried. Today, people worried about tyrannical governments. Other people, such as National Review, in his book of liberal fascism, sorry, I'm quoting, described the similarity of Woodrow Wilson's national and quasi-socialist programs to those of Mussolini. Goldberg argued I'll skip that part. Perhaps as Madison predicted, all the other checks and balances will always prevent tyranny. But should tyranny ever triumph, the United States Constitution provides a mechanism to restore constitutional order. In the vision of Madison, it would be states leading militias, the militias consisting of the able-bodied male population. In the modern sense, the organized portion of the state militia is the state national guard, an unorganized portion is the able-bodied males. And we do have that in Colorado in the unorganized militia. So we might think today's mechanism as governors, hopefully with a legislative backing. Like one, like one in the Federalist 46, this is an extremist and largely theoretical argument. The system has thus far, far proved strong enough to check to check the worst characters, Such, and it gives examples. The threat of impeachment and not revolution suffice to end this assault on the rule of law. That threat, with other checks and balances, has always sought, but so far managed to prevent tyranny. So there's a lot of precedent. There's a lot of historical reasons that we have the Second Amendment. I want to break in and tell you that historicity is indeed a word. You did not make it up, and I just wanted to say that on the mic. Go on. And I would just like to say on the mic that I greatly appreciate Absolutely. the lack of confidence in that was a real <laughs> word. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> oh. to the bill with recognition for the chair's rapier wit. <laughs> All right. 
I, I, for if you're ready have, to take a take a few minute break, I'm going to call Representative Brown if that's all right. Uh, is that okay? I am ready to take a few minute break. Okay, Thank you, Madam. Representative Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. And it's an honor to serve with you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak a few moments about this bill. You know, to me, this bill is about suicide prevention. And Colorado has a serious problem. You know, according to the American Association of Suicidology, Colorado's suicide rate was the fifth highest in the country in 2019. And nationally, the majority of gun deaths are from suicide. 24,292 people died by suicide from a gun in 2020. Individuals who died by suicide by this one method was more than half the total number of individuals who died in traffic accidents. In Colorado, we lost 1,370 people to suicide in 2021. 54% of all suicides are from guns. And in Boulder County, where I represent, in 2021, we lost 33 people to suicide by gun. The number of gun suicides has also risen in recent years, climbing 10% over five years and 25% over 10 years, and it is near the highest point on record. The 24,000 gun suicides that I mentioned earlier that took place in 2020 were the most in any year except 2018 when there were 24,432. You know, we've heard a lot about the deliberation that a person goes through when they're considering suicide. And it's not very long. 24% of people consider suicide for less than five minutes, and 71% of people consider suicide for less than an hour. And because suicide deliberation is often so short, the immediate access to guns is a significant risk factor in death by suicide. States that have higher gun ownership rates have higher suicide rates, and rates nearly twice that of states with lower gun ownership rates. Adolescents that die by suicide are twice as likely to have had a gun in their home and you put this together with 85% of suicide attempts using guns being successful, and we have a serious problem. A cooling off period as proposed by this bill just makes sense. It puts distance between the most lethal means and a person in a mental health crisis. And it gives folks time to reconsider and to seek help. Because when people have access to one of the most lethal means, there is just no turning back. This bill unequivocally will save lives. It's the right approach for Colorado, and I urge you to vote yes. Representative Winter. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Just had to recover myself there. 2019, fifth highest. How many of those were in the three days? That's an important question. It's not just about the suicide prevention. This is about three days. So how many of those suicides were prevented? We talked about the, far the framers, the founders, the, the framers of the Constitution. They gave us very specific bounds to solve the problems. Shall not be infringed is not inside those bounds. It is very specifically infringing on the Second Amendment is very specifically outside those bounds. So apparently we need to go to more history. So what could this body do? 
What could this legislative body do? Well, it can, it can solve the problems. It can address the problems inside of the bounds that are allowed to it. What are the allowed? Let's see. How many of those suicides were by overdose? How many of those suicides were by accidental overdose of fentanyl? Are we, are we looking to impose a three-day waiting period on all street drugs like fentanyl and say, because we could, we could say that, fent uh, that, drugs, that illegal drugs use is not covered by the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. So we can certainly, this body can certainly <laughs> exert its authority to impose a three-day waiting period on drugs, on drug use, illegal drug use. You buy illegal drugs, you have, or you could just make illegal drugs, I don't know, illegal. What is this body doing to help prevent that overdose rate? In 2019, four grams. In 2020, it's still one gram. That is still a mass casualty event. One gram of fentanyl. 500 people can be killed. Okay, we're not talking about fentanyl. Well, that I know about, for sure. We're talking about, how about historicity? <laughs> so get back to the historicity. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. The historicity of the Second Amendment, since we seem to be unclear on what, what did it mean, the right to bear arms? In 1775, General Gage ordered that all private arms in Boston be deposited with magistrates, supposedly to be stored temporarily and eventually returned to the owners. Those citizens, naive enough to comply with the General's edict, turned in 1,778 muskets. So in 1775, 1,778 muskets, 634 pistols, 973 bayonets, 38 blunderbusses, as the Declaration of Causes of Taking Up Arms passed by the Continental Congress stated, they accordingly delivered up their arms, but in open violation of honor. The governor ordered the arms deposited, as aforesaid, to be seized by a body of soldiers. One newspaper published a poem entitled Gage's, Tom Gage's Proclamation. Now this goes back to a, just a general rule of mine that the only reason to not trust government is history. So General Tom Gage's proclamation that whoever, whosoever keeps his gun or pistol, I'll spoil the motion of his sistel, but everyone that will lay down his hanger bright and musket brown shall not be beat nor bruised nor banged, much less for past offenses hanged, but on surrender of, upon, upon surrendering his Toledo, go to fro and unhurt as we do, Meanwhile, let all and every one who loves his life forsake his gun. Meanwhile, let all and every one who loves his life forsake his gun. So the people voluntarily turned in 1,778 muskets, 634 pistols, 978 bayonets, and 38 blunderbusses. I don't know what a blunderbuss is. In a recent article, Professor Don Cates acknowledged that the Second Amendment, right of the people to keep and bear arms, protects an individual right to keep arms in the home for self-defense. And outside the home, only for use in militia service. In that article and in this dialogue, Professor Cates argues that the following arms may be completely banned for private owners, Saturday night special, gangsters, and that was overturned. People have a right to, that to bear arms means simply to carry them was a clear, clear in a game drafted by Thomas Jefferson and proposed by James Madison, draftsman of the Second Amendment in the Virginia legislature. The bill would have fined those who hunted deer out of season, and if within a year the hunter shall bear a gun of his enclosed ground, unless while performing military duty, he shall be in violation of this recognizance. The, the game violator would go back to court for every such bearing of a gun and be bound by his good behavior. Thus, in the minds of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, to bear a gun meant to carry it, to bear a gun meant to carry it about in one's hands or on one's person. As, for instance, a deer hunter would do. Bearing arms is not associated with military duty only, for the language above addresses the bearing of a gun. 
by any person when not performing military duty. Further, while the bill would have restricted the carrying of scatter guns and other long guns for hunting, it would not have prohibited carrying pistols for self-defense. At that time, one species of firearms, the pis pistol, was never, called, was never called a gun. Previous game legislation had been imposed and a possible maximum penalty of 20 lashes on the violator's back, but bearing arms was considered carrying it around. Just months before, declare, before writing the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson kept a commonplace book where he copied his favorite passages from legal writers. This book may well be considered the source book and re re reparatory, I did not make up that word, I'm just reading it, of Jefferson's ideas on government. Among the passages which may be translated as to bear, carry, or wear arms, that portion of Becerra, which Jefferson copied in Italian, writing false ideas of utility in the margin, was worded in standard English and translation at the time as follows. A principal source of errors and injustice are false ideas of utility. For example, the legislator has a false ideas of utility who considers particular more than general convenience who had rather command the sentiments of mankind than excite them, and dares to say to reason, be thou slave. Who would sacrifice a thousand real advantages to the fear and imaginary trifling inconvenience who would deprive men of use of fire for fear of being burnt? They would deprive men of the use of fire for the fear of being burnt, and water for the fear of being drowned. And who knows of no means of preventing evil but by destroying it? The laws of this nature are those which forbid to wear arms, disarming only those who would not be disposed to commit a crime, which the law means to prevent. Can it be supposed that those who would have the courage to violate the most sacred laws of humanity and the most important of the code will respect less considerable and arbitrary injunctions? So can it be supposed that those who have the courage to violate the most sacred laws of humanity and the most important of the code will respect considerable and arbitrary injunctions? I think that's easier said by just saying that the people inclined to follow gun laws are the people who are inclined to follow laws, and those are not criminals. Does not the execution of this law deprive the subject of that personal liberty so dear to mankind that the and to the wise legislator, and, it does, and does it not subject the innocent to all the disagreeable circumstances that should only fall on the guilty? It certainly makes the situations of the assaulted worse and of the assailants better. It makes the, it makes the situation of the assaulted worse and of the assailants better. Thomas Jefferson told us the outcome of, that, of this law hundreds of years ago. This law will make the situation of the assaulted worse and of the assailants better, and rather encourages, rather encourages than prevents murder, and it requires less courage to an attack an, unar an armed, it requires less courage to attack armed than unarmed persons. So our founders, having studied many civilizations past, came to the conclusion that this was a right that was to not be infringed, to protect from both the government and from other wrongdoers. The wisdom of Beccaria was sourced of Thomas Jefferson's proposed Virginia Constitution of 1776, which provided no free man I'm, I'm shall ever be debarred. Interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. Members, it's getting loud in here. The volume just like totally jumped. So if we can just bring it back down, that would be great. Representative DeGraff. No free man shall ever be debarred of the use of arms. So this is a recurring theme. No free man shall ever be debarred of the use of arms. And I'm still a fan of Huey Newton and his quote, that an unarmed man is a slave. I was told I have four minutes left. <laughs> I will yield the dais because it has been so politely requested. Thank you. Representative Prenti. Oh, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Just an announcement that dinner is here. 
And if we could have members get their dinner first, and if you could enter through that, this door here, way in the back, and then you'll come out the middle door. So members first, staff, and then aides. That would be great. Thank you. Representative DeGraff. Representative DeGraff, do you want to continue? I, yes, ma'am, I sure do. The wisdom of Beccaria was, sourced, was the source of Jefferson's proposed Virginia Constitution of 1776, which provided, no free man shall ever be debarred of the use of arms, which of course goes back to the, an unarmed man is a slave or subject to slavery at any given time. An avid hunter and gun collector, Jefferson carried picket po pocket pistols which may be today seen at Monticello. John Adams began his opening statement in the Boston Massacre trial in 1770 with a quote from Beccaria. And in, and in the course of his speech, he added that the inhabitants had a right to wear, had a right to arm themselves at that time for their defense. Adams' own views against disarming the people were certainly consistent with the following favorite passage from Beccaria, which he copied in his diary. Every act of authority of one man or another for which there is not an absolute necessity is tyrannical. That's an interesting one. Every act of authority of one man over another for which there is not an absolute necessity is tyrannical. This goes back to the Declaration of Independence where the just powers are derived from the consent of the governed that to secure these rights Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And anything over which there is not an absolute necessity is tyrannical. Adams upheld the right of arms, arms in the hands of citizens to be used at, individual, at individual's discretion in private self-defense. So let's see, that's, that's John Adams. He knows something about the Constitution, pretty sure. Bearing arms for personal protection was an unquestioned right in the minds of the founding fathers. Before the revolution, James Iredell, who would be, promote, would be prominent in the struggle to ratify the Constitution and later a justice of the United States Supreme Court, hmm, early Supreme Court, wrote his mother, be not afraid of the pistols you have sent me. They may be necessary implements of self-defense, though I dare say I shall never have occasion to use them. It is, it is a satisfaction to have the means of security at hand, if we are in no danger, as I never expect to be. Confide in my prudence and safe regard and self-regard for the proper use of them, and you need to have no apprehension. So that goes to, if we want to do anything inside the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments, and the Second Amendment, then we would probably look at uh, having a safe regard for the proper use of them. In 1775, North Carolina's delegation to the Continental Congress, all of whom became prominent state and federal leaders, resolved, it is the right of every English, sub English subject to be prepared with weapons for his defense. As William Henry Drayton, a prominent revolutionary leader and Chief Justice of the South Carolina Supreme Court, always had about his person a dirk and a pair of pit pocket pistols for the defense of his life. Up in Vermont, Ethan Allen, not sh so, something with furniture, and his friends never walked out, uh, never walked out without at least a case of pistols. Case. Lodging with a Quaker on one occasion, Ethan's, Ethan's brother, Ira, recalled, we took our pistols out of our holsters and carried them in with us. He looked at the pistol saying, what doth thee do with these things? He was answered, nothing amongst our friends, but we were Green Mountain boys and meant to protect our persons and property because no man shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. Just 10 days after Madison proposed the Bill of Rights to Congress in 1789, Tench Cox, a prominent Federalist and a lifelong correspondent of Jefferson and Madison, wrote what became the Second Amendment would confirm the people, would confirm the people in their right to keep and bear their private arms. So in their private correspondence, not just the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, James Madison endorsed the widely published article in which these words would appear. 
Cox's writing provided unmistakable evidence that 18th century Americans defined muskets, rifles, and pistols as arms. And they endorsed an individual right to own and keep and use arms as consequently of self-defense and of the public militia power. His own firearms are the second and better right, uh, better right hand of every free man because an unarmed people is a slave. In 1830s, Madison wrote, a government resting on a minority is an aristocracy, not a republic, and could not be safe with a numerical and physical force against it without a standing army, an enslaved press and a disarmed populace. An enslaved press and a disarmed populace. A disarmed populace. Disarmed for one day, two days, three days, 60 days. The founding fathers in general strongly endorsed the right to bear arms for self-defense. They gave written expression to their views through the Second Amendment and personally exercised the right by owning and possessing arms. The same linguistic usage of the term bear and arms prevailed during the period of adoption of the 14th Amendment, which was intended to incorporate the Second Amendment. For instance, in 1865, Florida made it unlawful for any Negro, mulatto, or any person of color to use or keep in his possession or under his control any bowie knife, dirk, sword, firearms, or ammunition of any kind unless he first obtained a license from the judge of probate. Violation, violators faced a possible penny, penalty of 39 stripes with a whip. The commission that drafted this legislation opined that the privilege of bearing arms should be accorded only to such colored population as can be recommended for their orderly and peaceable character. Members of the Reconstruction Congress, state constitution conventions at the time, and mainstream white and even black newspapers cited protection of the right of free men to bear arms and protect themselves and their families from infringement by sheriffs. Infringement militias and the Ku Klux Klan as a major object of the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act, including what is now the 42 USC. While the Reconstruction Congress interpreted the Second Amendment buttressed by the 14th as protecting the rights of freedmen and even former Confederates to keep and bear private arms, it abolished the Southern state militia organizations denying, denying a Second Amendment protection to, of states to organize militias. Although the real issue in the Morton Grove, Illinois handgun ban involved the right to keep rather than bear arms, the chief handgun control claimed the language of the Second Amendment suggests that its purpose is limited to protecting organized and effective state militias. The terms arm and arms and bear arms have and always have been associated with organized mili military activity. The chief authority cited by HCI for this proposition is Noah Webster's famous 19, 1828 dictionary. Anyone who looks up Webster's definition of bear will be startled to find the very opposite of which HCI claimed. So turns out that the handgun control, the government agency set up to control handguns, had lied about what was in it. I'm not impugning anybody here. I'm just saying what, what the HCI claimed was not true. To wear, to wear, to bear a mark or of authority or of distinction as to bear a sword, a badge, a name, to bear arms in a coat. Although HCI referred to Webster's definition of arms, this, began, this again fails to imply an exclusively, exclusively military usage. Weapons of offense or armor for defense and protection of the body consistent with the meaning of bare arms as carrying or wearing weapons on the person or inside one's clothing. Webster defines a pistol as a small firearm or of the smallest firearm used. Small pistols are to be carried in the pocket. As to who has the right to bear arms, Webster defined the people as the commonality as distinct from men of rank. Webster was certain in position to know what the Second Amendment phrase, bear arms, meant. A prominent Federalist, he wrote in the first major pamphlet in support of the Constitution when it was proposed in 1787, in which he stated, before a standing army can rule, the people must be disarmed. The people must be disarmed before a standing army can rule. As they are in almost every kingdom in Europe, 
The supreme power in America cannot enforce unjust laws by the sword. Why? Because the whole body of the people are armed. Before a standing army can rule, the people must be disarmed, as they are in almost every kingdom in Europe. The supreme power in America cannot enforce laws by the sword because the whole body of the people are armed. When the Morton case was still before the United States, the state's court of appeals for the Seventh Circuit, unassailable evidence was presented that the respective framers of the Second and Fourteenth Amendments intended the individual right to keep and bear arms, including pistols, to be protected. Thanks, sir. The intent of the farmers was so overwhelmingly contrary to the court's opinion upholding the gun ban that the court felt intent felt held that intent to be re- irrelevant. The intent of the framers was so overwhelmingly contrary to the court's opinion upholding the gun ban that the court held that the intent to be relevant, irrelevant. In contrast, the Supreme Court has stated repeatedly that the Constitution's provisions must be interpreted according to the intent of the framers. So the Supreme Court, so a little while ago we were told that there was nothing unconstitutional about a delay, there was nothing unconstitutional about this bill, but here we have that the Supreme Court has repeatedly that the Constitution's provisions must be interpreted according to the intent of the framers. And I think we have the intent of the framers that before a standing army can be rule, the people must be disarmed. The supreme power in America is not to enforce unjust laws by the sword because the whole body of the people are armed. So if you want a constitutional look at how, then everybody should be armed. We don't mandate that. As the Oregon Supreme Court recently opined in the state constitutions adopted between 1776 and 1802, the term arms as used by the drafters of the Constitution, probably was intended to include those weapons used by settlers for both personal and military defense. The term arms was not limited to firearms, but included several hand-carried weapons commonly used for defense. Under the Second Amendment, all commonly possessed arms, which an individual could keep and bear, would be constitutionally protected. Both then and now, these arms, arms include firearms, edged weapons, and blunt instruments. The most, imp- the most clearly protected firearm is the rifle, the use of which for self-defense, even in urban areas, is protected by the Second Amendment. Guarantee of the right of an individual to bear arms, the, moder- the modern descendant of the musket. The rifle is a classic militia firearm. The shotgun is also protected by the Second Amendment. The short-barreled shotgun is a descendant of the blunderbuss, a classic home defense arm. In contrast with long-barreled hunting, well, it might not be within the judicial notice of the short-barreled shotgun as a military arm protected by the Second Amendment. Such an arm has been factually determined to fall within a state constitution protecting the right of citizens to keep and bear arms for their common defense. The arm most commonly possessed for self-defense is a pistol due to the ease of storage, carriage, and accessibility. Pistol, X, whatever, is properly included within the word arms, and the right to bear such arms cannot be infringed. Its short barrel makes it difficult for an assailant to grab, and its size, weight, and simple mechanism make it viable for women, the elderly, the handicapped. Smaller pistols have particular useful utility for smaller people. The smallest handgun designed by Smith & Wesson was such a small revolver that it was nicknamed the Ladysmith, since it seemed to be more suitable for a woman's small hand. The relatively high cost of rifles compared to pistols suggests that a ban of ownership or possession of low low caliber handguns would effectively negate any right of the poor to bear firearms for their self-defense. There has been little scholarship concerning whether certain edged weapons and blunt instruments are arms in a constitutional sense. The knife is one of man's oldest tools and weapons. Pocket knives were often used the Second Amendment was adopted, it is questionable as to whether switchblade knives are modern convenience. Since arms under the Second Amendment are those which an individual is capable of bearing, artillery pieces, tanks, nuclear devices, and other heavy ordinances are not constitutionally protected, nor are other dangerous, unusual weapons such as grenades, bombs, bazookas, or other such devices while being capable of carried by the hand, have never been commonly possessed for self-defense. Blunt edged instruments and firearms are capable of being used, 
against a violent assailant in such a manner as to not endanger the innocent. In contrast, explosive devices may be incapable of pinpointing an aggressor. Are registering and licensing an infringement? No one would seriously argue that citizens must register with the police to obtain a license in order to freely, or would seriously argue that citizens must register with the police to obtain a license in order to f exercise freely their political or religious beliefs. Requiring citizens to, to obtain a permit if they object to unreasonable searches and seizures is their, of their persons and homes would clearly infringe on their rights. So requesting of the government to not have your home illegally searched and seized, uh, see, search and seizure of your home, except where there is limited space in public forums which requires fair allocation. Authorities cannot require persons giving speeches and assembling to obtain permission to do so, nor may an, an anonymous keeping and bearing of arms by law-abiding citizens without more constitutionality be the subject of registration and licensing. To be sure, our marches in the city, like other assemblies in the public places, may be the subject of a license requirement. When the possibility of tyranny exists, however, the people cannot be denied their rights of associating, arming, and fighting in their defense of their liberties. In a true republic, the people may arm and associate without anybody, anyone's permission, although violent criminals, children, and those of unsigned mind may be deprived of the firearms. Enforcement of such a prohibition would be materially aided by requiring ordinary citizens to obtain licenses for their firearms. So again, this, is, this, is, this bill purports to be about suicide, but it does, it is being broadly applied and as a broad infringement. Throughout history, firearms registration classically has been required as a prelude to confiscation. So that's where we get with the tyranny. That throughout history, firearms registration classically has been, require, has been required as a prelude to confiscation. So history is written by the victors, remembered by the vanquished, and erased by those looking to repeat it. The English, the English Bill of Rights provision that subjects may have arms for their defense was passed in a direct response to a registration confiscation scheme. So to a registration slash confiscation scheme. The anonymous keeping of firearms, act, firearms acts as a deterrent to governmental oppression, whether by, racial, by a racist sheriff or a coup-minded military junta. Creation of yet another victimless crime, that of exercising a constitutional right without first registering with the government, can only promote a burgeoning police state to enforce it while convicting the innocent. A requirement that one may not exercise the right to bear arms or carry arms, either openly or concealed, without a license, is constitutionally defective. Until the 14th Amendment was adopted, licenses to carry arms were required only for slaves and blacks, while free men could carry arms openly but not concealed. Today, some states require a permit only for carrying concealed weapons, where others require a permit for bearing openly. The arbitrary denial of license and permits in many states and localities would be alleviated to some extent by granting of the aggrieved party automatic review. The framers of the Second and Fourteenth Amendments intended to guarantee an individual right to carry firearms and other common hand carried handguns arms. It is inconceivable that they would have tolerated that suggestion that a free person has no right to bear arms without permission of the state. So this three day this three day issue is at the permission of the state. And that might come at three days, sixty days, 90 days, never. It's at the discretion of the state. Much less the federal government or that person could be in prison for doing so. As the founding father realized, every right has costs, but alternatives are often more costly. I definitely, I do not, I do not doubt the sincerity of the sponsors of this bill in their intent. I question the statistics, I question the study, I question the results, and I, and I definitely refute the idea that this is constitutional and that, that this infringement is minor, because if minor infringement is just the start to more serious infringements, I definitely urge a no vote on this bill. Representative Winters. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, I'm also up here to urge a no vote, and I, I have some information I'd like to read. Um, it was a paper that Justice Thomas had wrote about the 10-day waiting period in California. The Second Amendment protects the right of the people to keep and bear arms, and the 14th Amendment requires the state to respect that right, McDonald versus Chicago. I'm going to say that again. The 14th Amendment requires the state to respect that right. Because the right to keep and bear arms is enumerated in the Constitution, courts cannot subject laws that burden it to mere rational basis. Review, and that was District of Columbia versus Haller. But the decision below just did that, perpetrating to apply intermediate scrutiny to the Court of Appeals upheld California's 10-day waiting period for firearms based solely on its own common sense, Sylvester versus Harris. It did so without requiring California to submit relevant evidence, without addressing petitioners, arguments to the contrary, and without acknowledging the district court's factual findings. This deferential analysis was indistinguishable from rational basis review, and it is a symptomatic of the lower court's general failure to afford the Second Amendment the respect due as an enumerated constitutional right. So in here, he's recognizing that the lower courts are basically disregarding the Constitution. If a lower court treated another right so cavalierly, I have little doubt that the court would intervene. But as evidenced by our continued inaction in this area, the Second Amendment is disfavored right in this court. Because I do not believe we should be in the business of choosing which constitutional rights are really worth insisting upon. That was said in Haller. And I often see that in this chamber. The Constitution cited many times except for when it comes to protecting the Second Amendment. When the average person wants to buy a firearm in California, he must wait 10 days before the seller can give it to him. This 10-day waiting period applies to all types of firearms, but it has exceptions for certain purchases, including peace officers and special permit holders. California's waiting period is the second longest in the country. Beside California, only eight other states in the District of Columbia have any kind of waiting period. Four of those jurisdictions have waiting periods for all firearms. The other five have waiting periods for only certain types of firearms. Previous versions of California's waiting period likewise were limited to handguns. California enacted its current waiting period for two reasons. First was the waiting period giving, gives state authorities time to run a background check, in addition to the background check required by federal law. I'll say that again, there's already a background check required by federal law. California requires its own background check, searching at least six databases to confirm a purchaser's identity, gun ownership, legal history, and mental health. One of the databases that Automated Firearm System collects reports to help determine who possesses a given gun at a given time. Second, California's waiting period creates a given time. <clears throat> A period creates a cooling off period. The 10 day window gives individuals who might use a firearm to harm themselves or others an opportunity to calm down. Petitioners Jeff Sylvester and Brandon Combs are lawful gun owners who live in California. They, along with two nonprofits, filed a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of California's waiting period under the Second Amendment. Specifically, petitioners allege that the waiting period is unconstitutional as applied to subsequent purchases. Individuals who already own a firearm, according to the California's database, and individuals who have a valid concealed carry license. After a three-day bench trial, the district court entered judgment for petitioners Sylvester and Harris. Applying an intermediate scrutiny, the district court concluded that California's waiting period was not reasonably ta tailored to promote an important governmental interest. Once again, I will say California's waiting period was not reasonably tailored to promote an important governmental interest. Regarding background checks, the district court found that 20% of background checks are auto-approved and take less than two hours to complete. The other 80% take longer, but petitioners did not challenge the background checks or the time it takes to complete them. That left the cooling off period after reviewing California studies on the relationship between waiting periods and gun casualties. The district for court found them inconclusive. The district court also noted that the studies seemed to assume that the individuals did not already possess a firearm. California submitted no evidence about subsequent purchases, which was significant because a waiting period will not deter an individual from committing impulsive acts of violence with a separate firearm that is already in his or her possession. Even if some cooling off period is necessary, California 
made no attempt to defend a 10-day waiting period, and the background check process will naturally create a waiting period of at least one day for 80% of purchases. The district court also found that individuals who meet California's requirements for a concealed carry license are uniquely and unlikely to engage in impulse acts of violence. California argued that the waiting period should still work for subsequent purchases in some circumstances, but the district court rejected this argument as overly speculative. While a subsequent purchase's firearm could be lost, stolen, or broken, California submitted no evidence to quantify how often this occurs, and state authorities could always check the AFS database to determine whether a subsequent purchaser still had a firearm or reliable method that law enforcement officers use in the field. Further, California did not prove that the waiting periods deter subsequent purchases who want to buy a larger capacity gun. California's expert identified only one anecdotal example of subsequent purchaser who committed an act of violence, and the expert conceded that the waiting period would not have deterred the individual. The Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit reversed the Ninth Circuit, spent most of its opinion summarizing the background of the litigation, circuit precedent on the Second Amendment, and this court's decision in Howler. The Ninth Circuit then concluded that the test for intermediate scrutiny from First Amendment cases applies to California's waiting period. Stressing that this test is not a strict one, the Ninth Circuit held that California's law prevents gun violence by creating a cooling off period. Although California's studies did not isolate the effect of waiting periods or subsequent purchases, those studies confirm the common sense understanding that cooling off periods deter violence and self-harm, and understand that it is not less true for subsequent purchases. The assumption that subsequent purchases would just use the gun they already own was not warranted, the Ninth Circuit concluded, would assume that the ACF AFS database was accurate report whether a subsequent purchase still owns a gun. The Ninth Circuit noted that the purchaser may want to purchase a larger capacity weapon. That possibility was enough for the Ninth Circuit to uphold California's waiting period. But the Second Amendment guarantees a personal right to keep and bear arms for lawful purposes. This court has not definitively resolved the standard for evaluating Second Amendment claims. Haller did not need to resolve it because the laws there failed, and any other standards of scrutiny that, were, that have applied to enumerated constitutional rights. After Haller, the courts of appeals generally evaluate Second Amendment claims under intermediate scrutiny. Several jurists disagree with this approach, suggesting that courts should instead ask whether the challenge law complies with the text, history, and tradition of the Second Amendment. Although Haller did not definitely resolve the standard for evaluating Second Amendment claims, it rejected two proposed standards. The court first rejected a freestanding, interest-balancing approach which would have weighed a law's burden on Second Amendment rights against the governmental interest it promotes. The very enumeration of the Second Amendment, Haller explained, eliminates court's power to decide on a case-by-case -case value whether the right is really worth insisting upon. The court also rejected rational basis scrutiny. Haller found it obvious that rational basis review could not be used to evaluate the extent to which the legislature may regulate a specific enumerated right. Otherwise, the Second Amendment would be redundant with the separate constitutional pro prohibitions on irrational laws and would have no effect. Rational basis review is meaningfully different from other standards for evaluating constitutional rights, including the intermediate scrutiny standard that the Ninth Circuit invoked here. While rational basis review allows the government to justify a law with rational speculation unsupported by evidence or empirical data, intermediate scrutiny requires the government to demonstrate that the harms it recites are real beyond mere speculation or conjecture, and that was in Edenfield v. Fain. And while rational basis review requires only that a law be rational at a class-based level, <clears throat> intermediate scrutiny requires a reasonable fit between the law's ends and means. The Ninth Circuit claimed to be applying intermediate scrutiny, but its analysis did not resemble anything approaching that standard. It allowed California to prove a governmental interest with speculation instead of evidence. It did not meaningfully assess whether a 10-day waiting period is reasonably tailored to California's purported interest, and it did not defer the factual findings that the district court made after trial. The Ninth Circuit would not have done this for any other constitutional right, and it could have not done this unless it was applying rational basis review. The Ninth Circuit allowed California to justify its waiting period with mere rational speculation, unsupported by evidence or empirical data. The court rejected petitioners as applied challenge based solely on its common sense understanding that the studies about cooling off periods apply to subsequent purchases. To be sure, a law can satisf satisfy heightened scrutiny based on a long history, a substantial consensus, and a simple common sense. 
but not one of those bases was present here. And I think that we see that in some of this talks here. I mean, we need definite data. And to just pull data that fights for the side of the argument, I don't think that's fair. And I think that falls under the same category. The district court found the waiting periods do not have a long historical pedigree. It found no consensus among states that waiting periods are needed and no consensus among experts that they deter gun violence. And even assuming the effectiveness of cooling off periods is a question of common sense instead of statistics, the Ninth Circuit's reasoning was the opposite of common sense. Common sense suggests that the subsequent purchases contemplating violence or self-harm would use the gun they already own. Common sense suggests that subsequent purchases contemplating violence or self-harm would use the gun they already own instead of taking all the steps to legally buy a new one in California. One of our other colleagues said that when somebody intends to do harm to themselves, they usually make the decision within five minutes. I want to say that again. They make the decision within five minutes. To get to a gun store, buy it, purchase a gun, and wait for the background check, I would, I, I've purchased many firearms. It takes a little bit longer than five minutes to get that done. The Ninth Circuit's only response to this point was that a subsequent purchaser might want a larger capacity weapon that will do more damage when fired but California presented no evidence to substantiate the concern. According to the district court, California's expert identified one anecdotal example of a subsequent purchaser who committed an act of gun violence, but then conceded that a waiting period would have done nothing to deter the individual. And the Ninth Circuit didn't even address the district court's finding that individuals who satisfy the requirements for a concealed carry license are uniquely unlikely to engage in such behavior which once again, when you write a bill or you try to pass a piece of legislation that affects a small group, that carries over into other people. And what they're saying here is, is that good, honest gun owners, most people are not gonna purchase guns to do harm against themselves or anyone else. Needless to say, a state that offers no evidence or anecdotes in support of a restriction should not prevail under an intermediate scrutiny. And I think that that falls under what we're talking about right here. I think a number of colleagues of mine that have spoke before have basically proved that there's no evidence or antidotes in support of a restriction. Even if California had presented more than speculation or conjecture, which I think that we've heard some today, to substantiate its concern about high capacity weapons, Ed and Field Supra, um, Circuit did not explain why the 10 day waiting period is su sufficiently tailored to this goal. And there are many reasons to doubt that it is. California's waiting period is not limited to high-capacity weapons, and courts should evaluate less burdensome alternatives. <clears throat> and its waiting period already has exceptions for peace officers and special permit holders. Individuals who, like subsequent purchases, have a demonstrated history of responsible firearm ownership. The district court also found that California presented no evidence supporting a 10-day waiting period. For much of its history, California's waiting period was shorter and applied only to hand goods, and the district court found that a one-day waiting period is inevitable for most purchasers because their background checks are not auto-approved. The Ninth Circuit did not address these obvious mismatches between the ends and means of California's waiting period. It instead dismissed any tailoring concerns Observing that intermediate scrutiny requires only that the regulation promote a substantial government interest that would be achieved less effectively absent the late regulation. But the observation was incomplete. Intermediate scrutiny also requires that a law not burden substantially more a protected activity than is necessary to further the government's interest. The Ninth Circuit did not ask the second question, a question that is, of course, irrelevant to a court applying rational basis review. And I think that what we're talking about today, when this law gets challenged in court, these are going to be some of the hurdles that it faces. Lastly, the Ninth Circuit ignored several ordinary principles of appellate review. While rational basis review is not subject to courtroom fact-finding, beach communications, intermediate scrutiny is. And here, the district court presided over a three-day trial and made several findings of fact. The Ninth Circuit was supposed to review those findings for clear error. Yet the Ninth Circuit barely mentioned them, and it never explained why it had the definite and firm conviction that they were wrong. 
California contends that the district court did not make the kind of historical or deductive findings that warrant deference, but the federal rules do not exclude certain categories of factual findings from the obligation of court appeals to access a district court findings unless clearly erroneous. A court of appeals must defer to a district court's factual findings, even when the findings do not rest on credibility, determinations but are based instead on physical or documentary evidence. In fact, deference is particularly appropriate when the issues require a familiarity with principles not usually contained in the general storehouse of knowledge and experience. And no broader review is authorized here simply because this is a constitutional case or because the factual findings at issue may determine the outcome of the case. The Ninth Circuit's deviation from ordinary principles of laws is unfortunate, though not surprising. Its dismissive treatment of petitioners challenge is emblematic of a larger trend. The lower courts are resisting the court's decisions in Haller and McDonald and are failing to protect the Second Amendment to the same extent that they protect other constitutional rights. This double standard, which I see in this chamber, this double standard is apparent for other cases where the Ninth Circuit applies heightened scrutiny the Ninth Circuit invalidated an Arizona law, for example, partly because it delayed women seeking an abortion, Planned Parenthood, Arizona. The court found it important there, but Representative not Representative Winter, could you please keep it to uh, the topic? We're talking about a three-day waiting period for guns. Okay. I'm actually reading a justice's rebuttal of a 10-day waiting period in California. Does that not qualify? I, I heard something about an abortion law, which is not what we're talking about. But generally, yes. Generally, generally what you're talking about, yes. Okay, they were talking about the double standard, how courts won't uphold Second Amendment arguments, but they'll hold up other arguments, Mr. Chair. I, I understand. Please proceed. Okay. The court found it important there, but not here, that the state presented no evidence whatsoever that the law furthers interest and no evidence that exist or ever have occurred. Similarly, the Ninth Circuit struck down a country's five-day waiting period for a new dancing license because it unreasonably prevent a dancer from exercising First Amendment rights while an application was pending. The Ninth Circuit found it dispo <clears throat> dispositive there, but not here, that the country failed to demonstrate a need for the five-day period. In another case, the Ninth Circuit held that the laws embracing traditional marriage failed heightened scrutiny because the states present no evidence other than speculation. While those laws reflected the wisdom of thousands of years of history in every society known to have populated the planet. They face much tougher time in the Ninth Circuit than California's new and unusual waiting period for firearms. In the, <clears throat> in the Ninth Circuit, it seems that rights that have no basis in the Constitution receive greater protection than the Second Amendment, which is enumerated in the text. And that's why my colleagues are up here speaking today. We want a protection for the Second Amendment no different than you all talk about the Constitution for other protections. When we're standing up here talking about the Constitution, we can't just pick and choose which rights that we want to use for our arguments. If we're going to defend the Constitution, let's defend the Constitution for what it is. Our constitutional refusal to hear Second Amendment cases only enables this kind of defiance, which we see in here today, that we'll just push stuff like this through because that we know some courts that are political will stand beside these decisions based upon the state you live in or what region of the country you're in. <clears throat> I suspect that four members of this court would vote to review a 10-day waiting period. And when he talks about that, he talks about that there are justices that are going to look at these things not through a political lens. I would ask you all today to listen to the examples that my colleagues and I bring forth. We're bringing for, forth decisions. We're talking about studies. We're talking about law. We're talking about people that have much greater knowledge than we do. And they realize that once we start picking at the Constitution, how that can affect the butterfly effect. And I ask you again, please, if we're going to cite the Constitution in this chamber, let's back the Constitution 110%. We can't pick and choose the constitutional rights that we want to use to get our own personal agendas through. I have two daughters. I have a lot of friends that I know that have been through domestic violence. And whether you think that that gun could be used against them or not, 
Some of them will want to be able to know that they can protect themselves. They want to know that they have that ability to try to protect themselves. Who are, we to, who are we to tell somebody how they should be able to protect themselves? I can never imagine looking in my daughter's eye and say, you may want the ability to protect yourself. You may be in imminent danger, but you have to wait three days because 65 people decided that that was a good thing. That's hard for me to stomach. I think that's hard for a lot of people to stomach. We talk about here about saving people all the time. And we run the gamut of why we should save people. But once again, we pick and choose who we save and how they can save themselves. I hate to say it, but sometimes there's hypocrisy in what we speak about. And sometimes the voices from all of Colorado aren't heard. We constantly talk about this as a Colorado for all of us. Well, I can tell you my constituents do not believe that this bill creates a Colorado for all of us. They want to be able to know that their constitutional rights aren't attacked. And they see this too. People joke, but they watch these videos. And they see the double speak when we talk about the Constitution. I've had constituents reach out and go, Representative Winner, how come the Constitution matters on some days and not the others in that chamber? And my answer is, I don't know why. I do not know why the Constitution matters some days and not the others. So I humbly ask you to vote no on this piece of legislation. I humbly ask you to listen to the constituents of those of us that are in here speaking in support of the Second Amendment and your ability to defend yourself. I stand in front of you here today and I ask you to vote no on this piece of legislation. Thank you for your time. Representative Parenti. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you. Colleagues, my comments are going to be brief, but I hope important uh, introduction or an important piece of this conversation. I, I want to speak to you tonight as a, as a mother, a sister, and as someone who has lived with a loved one, in fact, a fellow veteran who was actively contemplating suicide. I often hear people at this well talk about how much they value veterans and our service members. Our military community is often used as a pawn, a convenient talking point, but too often when push comes to shove, we fail to take actions that will make real positive impact on their lives. Folks, we lose 17 members of our veterans community every day to suicide and more than two-thirds of those are completed with a firearm. Like one of our bill sponsors, my experience with a loved one struggling with mental illness is that these feelings are very real, they are oftentimes overwhelming, and they were not persistent. I saw firsthand how waiting matters. Several colleagues have spoken today about how this proposal will not end all instances of gun violence or prevent all suicides. It may not even end most instances of gun violence or prevent most suicides. Absolutely, no one piece of legislation is going to end the scourge of gun violence in our country or our state. We have to see this proposal as one piece, but a very necessary piece of a larger puzzle. I've also heard colleagues today question the constitutionality of this proposal. So I thought it would be very helpful to introduce to this conversation the recommendations released, I believe, earlier this week from the Pentagon's Suicide Prevention and Response Independent Review Committee. Let us hear what the organization generally understood to be dedicated to the defense of our Constitution is recommending to reduce suicide in the armed forces. They recommend raising the minimum purchase age to 25. They are recommending a seven day waiting period on the purchase of all firearms. They are recommending a four day waiting period on the purchase of ammunition. And they are recommending a DOD wide 
service member gun registration. This is what the Department of Defense is recommending to protect the health and safety of its own people. So I would offer that if we truly value veterans, if we truly value service members, if we can save even one or one per day, then this law would make a very good step in the right direction with, in the end, a minimal impact on overall gun ownership. And is that small measure not worth the lives of our veterans and service members who are so disproportionately victims of this crisis? Colleagues, I would urge a yes vote on this bill. It will save the lives of Coloradans in our state. And I thank you for your attention. I have Representative Mabry. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. The honor is mine. Uh, first off, I'd like to, I'd like to start uh, my, and I will be brief, um, but I'd like to start my brief remarks by thanking the sponsors for bringing this important legislation. Gun violence and gun deaths are a uniquely American problem. We have the loosest gun restrictions, some of the loosest gun uh, restrictions in the world. And uh, uh, we see that that leads to many, many more gun deaths. The states that have stricter gun laws generally have fewer gun deaths. Um, and so I believe that this policy is evidence-based, and um, I'm honored to stand with my colleagues in supporting this important legislation. You know, a lot has been said about the Constitution and interpretations of the Second Amendment. I went to law school, and I, I studied the Constitution at length, and I think it is fair to say that constitutional scholars have conflicting good faith interpretations of the meaning of the Second Amendment. Um, but um, one of our colleagues earlier this evening mentioned judicial activism. Um, for more than 200 years, the court did not rule that uh, the Second Amendment converted an individual right to possess uh, a weapon. Um, it, it, that wasn't until 2008. A lot of the court cases that we're hearing be spoken about today were court cases that were um, after 2008. For, for before then, before then, um, there was plenty of Supreme Court jurisprudence on gun regulations where the Supreme Court and lower courts upheld reasonable gun regulations. You know, we could go word for word, toe for toe. I, I had thought about um, printing out the uh, Justice Stevens dissent uh, in Heller. Um, in that dissent, Justice Stevens confronted Justice Scalia on his own turf. He made an originalist argument looking at the historical record, looking at the same linguistic facts, and came to the opposite conclusion. He found evidence that a native speaker of English reading the words of the Second Amendment from 1791 would have understood them to convey a military meaning. Justice Stevens quoted Scalia's own words back to him. The court does not appear to grasp the distinction between how a word can be used and how it was originally used. And most historians agreed with Stevens' interpretation, emphasizing that the phrase, the phrase to bear arms was most often uh, used in a collective military sense. Um, you know, other constitutional scholars note that not a single word about an individual right uh, to own a gun for self-defense was mentioned in Madison's notes from the Constitutional Convention, and with a few scattered exceptions in the records from uh, ratifications from debates in the state. Nor did the U.S. House of Representatives discuss the topic as it marked up the Bill of Rights. In fact, 
the original version of the Second Amendment included a conscientious objector provision implying that this had to do with military service. Look, we can go back and forth all we want about our good faith reasonable in interpretations um, of the Second Amendment. Um, you know, there are court cases where courts, depending on uh, the party of the president that appointed the judge, are coming to different conclusions on the Second Amendment. And, and I don't, uh, uh, and, I, and, I, and I do believe that, that people have good faith interpretations of the Constitution on both sides of this issue. What we do know, however, is that more guns lead to more gun deaths. More readily accessible guns will lead to more gun deaths. States that have waiting periods do have lower suicide rates. They do have lower rates of gun violence. And um, for that reason, I'm very excited to stand with my colleagues in support of this legislation, and I urge an aye vote. Representative Armagost. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to readdress the, uh, I guess, appropriation of using the military as a reference point for this bill. I don't think it's pertinent to bring up the general staff of the military and their political beliefs of where they think firearms are when we all know military has issued firearms at 18 years old, sometimes 17 years old, with a parent's signature to enlist in the military or go in as an officer. I joined the military at 17, I was issued a firearm. Out of 22 years in the military, 11 years active, all of that on the ground is infantry and military police. I had a firearm the entire time. So no matter what a general staff officer believes, meaning somebody in the general ranks of the military, they can express their political beliefs as far as uh, firearms or anything goes. They can be as woke or as conservative as they want to appear. That doesn't matter as far as our lawmaking goes inside this body. <clears throat> so as far as using the military as a token to compare to something in this bill, it is not relevant. We need to focus on what this bill does to not only American citizens that want to carry from the age of whatever. I started hunting when I was 12 years old. Uh, had a firearm even before that with uh, my parents' supervision. That's an American right. So the military does not pertain to that. The only thing that the military pertains to that is that our military members fight overseas to defend those constitutional rights that we are trying to protect here today, that we all swore to protect here today. So the only pertinence and relevance that the military has in this body is that they are out there fighting the fight to maintain the liberties that we have here that we're addressing today in this bill. So as far as the relevance of military general staff goes, it is completely irrelevant to this bill. Our military members are issued firearms at 18 years old, and they carry those firearms on a daily basis. So with that, the only thing our military has to do with this is as military members and veterans, we went out there and fought and protected those rights that we are protecting here today as a body that we swore to do to protect and defend our Constitution from enemies foreign and domestic. Colorado and national constitution, that is what we're here to do today. So I just wanted to readdress the fact that our military does not dictate what we do in this body in the Colorado House of Representatives. Our military does what they do overseas and domestically to give us the right to do this, what we are doing here today in our republic to be able to make these laws or be able to prevent unconstitutional laws from going through. So we just need to make sure we're staying on task and focusing on what we do as a body in protecting the constitutional rights of our Americans and our Coloradans that we represent for our districts, whether they voted for us or not, rural, urban, left or right. We are protecting the rights of all Coloradans here. We're addressing victims, whether they are the victims that need a firearm or the victims that might have been, unfortunately, the victim of some sort of violence that had to do with a firearm or other, other tool of violence. That is what we are presented with. Let's focus on the tasks that we're doing here today 
and if we really want to address the real issue underlying here, like I said before, mental illness needs to be addressed, not firearms that we're all lawfully entitled to be able to carry on a God-given right. Thank you. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. If you'll just give me a second. I got a few things I have to set up. Thank you. First, esteemed colleagues, I know that there's a lot of constitutional questions and this is a constitutional issue. I'm sure throughout this evening we're going to talk about constitutionality, we're going to talk about Supreme Court cases, we're going to talk about rulings, we're going to talk about justices' opinions knowing that there's bias in all of that. <clears throat> but that's a conversation I think we need to have. I do want to speak to my colleague on the Veterans Caucus. <clears throat> the DOD recommendations, I'm not sure when they were purported, probably in recent years, by a DOD that's progressively, progressively moving into political areas that are supposed to not be a realm of the military, because the military is supposed to say apolitical, but that even has been infringed upon lately. But I will tell you that recommendations by DOD, particularly the ones I heard, are quite interesting, and also those recommendations violate the Constitution. For a military that's supposed to swear to uphold the Constitution and defend it from both enemies, foreign and domestic, how in the world would we promulgate policy that infringes upon constitutionality? Now, I believe that her comments were only for active duty military or military service members that were under contract, but I'm not sure because that was new information presented to me. But absolutely, if you're 18 years old and you are in the military and you are trained how to carry a firearm, why would your rights to own firearms be infringed? They shouldn't be. Now, the true issue of suicide in the military comes from what? It doesn't come from a firearm. We're around firearms every day in the military. Complex systems, weapons of war designed to destroy the enemy who opposes us of all calibers. So that's not the issue. The issue, ladies and gentlemen, is mental health. You want to talk about stopping suicide, then let's talk about a bill, instead of addressing waiting periods to deliver a firearm, how about if we have a bill that says programs to help veterans with mental health or PTSD? <clears throat> and private, provide additional resources in a wholly under-funded and under sector in Colorado. But no, we're going to talk about firearms. We're going to talk about how we need all these gun control bills and laws that infringe upon the Second Amendment because that's the problem. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you this isn't going to solve it. You're not solving it. 
Now, even the bill sponsor has said that three days is a cooling off period. We'll reduce suicides by so many in this state. <clears throat> but yet we skirt around the problem of suicide by drug overdose. We skirt around the problem of fentanyl. I would argue there should be a bill other than waiting period to deliver a firearm. We should be talking about fentanyl right now and what we're going to do to stop death and overdose by fentanyl. Representative Holtorf, I'll ask you to stick to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your leadership. I did drift off to the biggest killer in Colorado, which is drug overdose, and I apologize for that. But it bears to be mentioned, unfortunately. Now I want to go back to the military. Yes, military suicides are high. Service, military service is hard. And you encounter a lot of things, particularly when you go downrange. And you have to come back from that, and you have to live with those things. Mr. Chair, it's getting a little noisy. If you'd help me out here with, on the left here. Yeah, of course, Representative I appreciate that. I'm having Folks a hard time concentrating. I got down. my notes right here, and I'm having a hard time with it. I'll wait. Folks, keep your conversations down, please. Thank you, Representative Mr. Chair, Holtorf. for your kindness and your decorum and your courtesy. I understand there's a lot of important discussions that we need to have tonight, and I appreciate that. <clears throat> As I was saying, the issue is mental health and how we deal with our mental health issues. The way that someone wants to complete suicide <clears throat> can come in various forms. Firearms is only one of them. How many suicides in Colorado come at the hand of an automobile in a garage with the engine running all night? the silent death of carbon monoxide. How many suicides come at the hand of a fistful of pills that stops life because the biology can't handle all of the poison that are the pills? How many how many suicides come from the cut of a razor blade or the cut of a knife? <clears throat> if we want to talk about suicide prevention, let's run a bill that speaks to suicide prevention, not gun control. I care about the human spirit and life as much as anybody in this room, and in some cases, maybe more, because I would give my life for any one of you right now. Right now. For all of us. I don't know if you understand that commitment. I made that oath in military service and meant it. And I told my soldiers, I told my soldiers downrange, I said, if you've already written off that inevitability and given it up, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Now let's go do our mission. That's what we're here to do. When your time comes, it comes. I believe it is written, but that's my belief. So we want to talk about suicide prevention other than the ledge deck, and we'll look at the bill later again, later this evening. 
Where is the language specifically addressing suicide prevention and the steps and the Colorado Revised Statutes other than gun control in this waiting period that are going to really address, address that in this, in this bill? I feel it's woefully inadequate and short and falls short of the real problem. Now I will tell you one of the bill sponsors has life experience and is passionate. She's not the only one with life experience in suicide in her family. And I'm going to tell you all a little story. I got two stepsisters. Yep. One of them, Julia, Julia Stam, was very troubled. And she tried to commit suicide. This bill would have done nothing, nothing to save her. And here's what's really troubling, ladies and gentlemen. I was in the house when she did it. <clears throat> here's what else is troubling, ladies and gentlemen. We didn't know. Yet we were all there. We didn't know. We didn't get the privilege of a gun shop owner saying, hey, this, this happened, or we're a little concerned. We didn't know. How can you be so close to somebody and not know? Well, that is the invisible shadow that is suicide. One of my colleagues told me a story about his best friend. They were together a few days. They, they rode in a car together. They were best friends, and they didn't, weren't talking, and, and he didn't know. I feel his pain. I've lived his pain. When the blood's squirting out and you're trying to wrap that stuff up and you're trying to get medical help, whew, it's tough. And you know what the underlying cause was? Mental illness. Mental illness. You know why I'm still on the public health committee? Many reasons. And I share my passion with everyone on that committee. I've seen the face of mental health illness so close it scares me. And I care, as we all do, about saving lives and preventing suicide. But ladies and gentlemen, my fear is, despite the best intentions of my colleagues, and I know their intentions are sincere, this isn't going to stop it. Because if someone wants to kill themselves, and they cross that bridge into the dark place, and many of you know I'm a Christian, and I don't want to get, try to be prophetic because I'm not a prophetic man. I will tell you, when the devil grabs your soul and takes you the darkest of places, How do you get out of it? <clears throat> That's the question for that person in that time. So what I would like to see is let's get more serious about mental health and less serious about firearms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please be seated. I do appreciate your compassion. My stepsister isn't with us anymore. We're about the same age, and it's sad for me and my family and my stepmother, my brothers, and her sister. <clears throat> so I understand. I understand the pain. I understand the desire to make a difference. I understand the compassion and the desire to save life. But mental illness is what we have to focus on. Now, <clears throat> we're going to talk a lot about, we're going to talk a lot about the law, and I'm not a lawyer. 
But I will tell you something. I represent rural Colorado. And in rural Colorado, to get a firearm, you might have to drive 20, 50, 80, 100, 120 miles. I will tell you, and, I, and many of you know I have five daughters, all over western Kansas and eastern Colorado, and even here in Denver and one down south in Colorado Springs. But I will tell you, if you need a firearm as a woman, and you have one trip to go to town that week, and if you need that firearm and you know you need it, and you can't get it because of this law, and it's one of my daughters that's suffering physical abuse, psychological abuse. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. I have one of my daughters that was threatened. I had to rescue her from a very bad person. <clears throat> She's okay. My grandson's okay. But that could have gone very differently, very differently, without extraordinary measures by those that love her. But those things are real. Abuse is real. It's horrible. Now, I've told all my daughters that you have to take care of yourself. If you're in an abusive situation, you have to get out of it. But I said, if you ever have your life threatened, you need to apply the same rules of engagement that we were given in the military. And if that means you have to use a firearm to protect yourself, God help you. I hope you have one available, and I know, hope you know how to use it. And believe me, every one of my daughters knows how to use a firearm. They have concealed carry permits, not all of them. They own firearms, not all of them. Because out in the country, 911 takes 30 to 45 minutes to get there, if not an hour. There is no 911. That's the rural urban divide. And to put something like this on somebody who knows, particularly one of my daughters, and this is one of the reasons that I'm passionate. The bill sponsors need to know this because this could be the meaning between life and death for people in my family. If you're in that situation, you're married with a husband who's a counterfeit and he wasn't what he represented himself to be, but then something changes and his real self comes out, and now he's hurting what he's supposed to love. Or somebody is living with a boyfriend, and that boyfriend now is controlling, what do they call it, narcissistic, and wants to suppress or control his girlfriend, and then he becomes violent and threatening, potentially the point of crisis, and things ex escalate. I will tell you, I don't want any of my daughters ever to be in that situation. And I have raised them to know, to respect firearms, and know that if they need to use them, it is a tool. And if they need one, they better have one. And if they have one, and they get to that crisis point where their life is threatened, the rule of engagement is you can defend yourself to save your own life. But with this bill in rural Colorado, that may not be afforded.
because the crisis point may come between the trip to town one week and the trip to town the next week. It may be too late. <clears throat> you see, this is real. You have heard me say so many times in this chamber, ladies and gentlemen, that one size doesn't fit all. One hand doesn't fit every glove and one foot doesn't fit every boot. Or one glove doesn't fit every hand or one boot doesn't fit every foot. But with this type of bill, that's what you're saying. Three-day waiting period. Well, I will tell you, if you really want to get serious about firearms, how about the illegal firearms that are on the streets committing crimes? How about the fact that if somebody wants to get a firearm, I can go down here on Colfax and for less than $200, I can have a 38 Special. All I got to do is say it, and I tell you what, it'll come. I'll put the money on the table, and it'll be there. But what is the penalty for that as we go soft on crime? But we're going to go hard on guns. I will tell you, I would like to see legislation that is, provides very serious punishment for those firearms that aren't properly owned. <clears throat> very serious. For firearms used in domestic violence, very serious penalties. It's not okay. But, to sit here and say that this is going to solve the problem of suicide and this is going to help, I really have my doubts. And I'm going to tell you why I have my doubts. <clears throat> yes, there's a cooling off period. But I will tell you, some of the statistics are about half. There's still a lot of other ways to take your life. I hearken back to another time in my life where I faced suicide up close and personal. But it wasn't at the hand of a firearm. You see, it was when I was in the military as a junior officer. We had a soldier who was having serious troubles with his marriage. And we knew about it. We invoked the battle buddy system, having his peers talk to him, the chaplain visiting with him. The first sergeant, platoon sergeant, doing all those things that we try to do in the military. And then one morning on staff duty, I was the staff duty officer and I was making the rounds. And guess what was hanging behind the barracks on a rope? It was too late. I tried to lift him up. Couldn't even do it. Called for help. Yeah, we lost another one. One at the hand of the firearm. And we tried. We tried to use those tools. And you feel guilt. An enormous guilt. Why couldn't we save this? Why couldn't we just save just one? What went wrong? Should we take all the ropes out of the barracks? Should we have a sign-in and sign-out sheet for any kind of rope material? I don't know. But it goes back to the troubled spirit and mental health. You want to solve this, let's talk about that. Not about gun control, gun restrictions, Second Amendment rights violations. That's a different subject. Now I'm going to get to what I really wanted to talk about, and I apologize for sharing too many personal stories here. I have so many, and many of you will 
wonder how they can all be true because we have so many different lived experiences and God has given me too many. Too many dark ones, I'll tell you that. But I want to talk about why gun waiting periods threaten public safety. This is a paper written by David B. Capel, and I was taught in graduate school to cite your references. So I want you to know that. And this speaks to this very subject. This is peer-reviewed. It's a bit dated, I'm not going to deny. But these problems transcend time, and they're not new. And even after all of this that we do in the Gold Dome, they're still not going to go away. So I'll begin with the executive summary, Mr. Chair. And I thank you for your leadership and your patience in the long conversation that is to begin. Honey, I forgot to duck. In quotes, remember the day Ronald Reagan was shot? The president grinned up from his hospital bed on March 30th, 1981, and was able to joke about a gunman's attempt on his life. But his press secretary, James Brady, fared much worse. Shots from the same pistol left him permanently disabled. The nation was shocked, and the gun control movement galvanized. 1981. If things got a lot better, <clears throat> have things got a lot better? Well, I think you know the answer. Even with gun control. Strict gun control in cities like Chicago and others, New York. Well, the answer is not much, if any. Probably not. More than a decade later, a gun control lobbyist, Jim Brady, and former President Reagan are working together to require that any retail purchase of a handgun be preceded by a waiting period during which a background check on the purchase of criminal and mental record could be conducted. A waiting period was strong initial appeal. Thank you. Silver tray next time, please. <clears throat> the trade-offs appear positive. Relatively small costs in exchange for significant gains in public safety, which is what this bill purports, House Bill 231219, waiting period to deliver a firearm. Relatively small costs in exchange for significant gains in public safety. If we could just save one, just one person. One person. But an exhaustive study of the issue by attorney and gun control expert David Capel concludes that this perception is misleading. When all the evidence is dispassionately weighted, all the consequences traced, Capel finds that there is very real there is a very real possibility that gun waiting periods could threaten public safety. In this case, threatens public safety. I've given you some examples earlier in my discussion about how in the country in rural Colorado with this law, a woman's life could be threatened. And it could be a man too. Any gender based on violence. The reason law enforcement resources diverted and law-abiding citizens disarmed. Law-abiding citizens disarmed. Well, that's a problem for me. Proponents are doubtlessly right in saying that a federal imposed waiting period would serve at least one, would save at least one life somewhere, the author concedes. Well, didn't we hear that tonight? Oh, yeah, we heard it although other lives won't be saved 
from other things. But he says that beside the point, if America as a whole would be marginally less secure against crime, violence, and fear as a result of this new restriction, Capel's research and analysis show why the waiting period's vast cost is likely to be more than is likely to more than cancel its apparent benefit. <clears throat> now that's interesting. Advocates of the waiting period, and this is a bit dated, use the Hinckley case as a symbol. Opinion polls to suggest momentum, criminology studies, and state experience of empirical validation and data. None of the four stands up to scrutiny, however. The proposed law would not, in fact, have halted the purchase of the gun used to shoot Reagan and Brady. Because <clears throat> we're talking about crime. Crime is so high right now in our society and in Colorado. We're at the top of so many categories in crime. Let's talk about how we reverse that. But we'll talk about this three-day waiting period to deliver a firearm. In California and other states with waiting periods show only a minuscule arrest rate and widespread unfairness to the law-abiding. <clears throat> there is shock value in the scenario of guns too easily bought by drug dealers, psychotic killers, persons bent on killing a spouse or themselves, or purchases intended to use them in hot blood. Yet hard data and common sense show little benefit from a waiting period, even in such lurid situations. Against the meager to nil impact of waiting periods on crime, control must be set. Their clearly negative impact on the average American's ability to count on police protection or be able to protect himself. Here's the problem. How do you protect yourself? How can you protect yourself? Should you have the right to have a firearm and should your constitutional right not be infringed if you think you need a firearm to go in there, purchase it, get the background check, which, oh, by the way, takes time, hours, in some cases, days, and you have to clear that background check. Now, if you really wanted to focus on something, maybe you should focus on the totality of the background check. Maybe you can expand on something there. But to actually say after someone's had the background check, they can't have their firearm? A law-abiding citizen? Maybe a person of sound mind and body, maybe not. But you're going to infringe on everybody's rights that is a sound mind and body citizen you're going to infringe on that constitutional right with this legislation right here, waiting period to deliver a firearm for three days or more. As the bill says, it could be five days, ten days, thirty days, whatever, whatever the jurisdiction says, 120 days. There's a huge problem in that for me. Who knows where that'll go as you open this door? And my colleague from Colorado Springs pointed that out. And it needs to be emphasized over and over tonight, past midnight, and as the hours wane in the morning and when we see the sun come up in the morning. It's not okay to infringe on the Second Amendment. I respect all the amendments. But the right to bear arms, the right to defend yourself, is your right. And in the country, you all have the privilege of 911, and well, it used to be, before crime blew the, at blew the top off of things, you could call 911 in the city, five minutes, law enforcement would be there. Ambulance would be there, the fire department would be there. Something would be there, five, ten minutes. Well, that doesn't happen in rural Colorado. Thirty, forty, sixty, hour, hour and twenty. Might be an hour and a half, two hours before anybody shows up. 
if they can even find you when that new deputy who just signed on doesn't even know where people live in the country and gets lost. That's happened. In fact, that means I need to talk about this because in my community, in my neighborhood, and believe me, my neighbors are five, six miles away, ten miles away, there was an on-farm accident. And they couldn't even find my neighbor's ranch to help because it was so remote. I had somebody from the sheriff's department call me and say, how do I get here? I'm on 55. Well, you need to be on 58. Well, how do I get to 58? Well, let me tell you, you got to take GG and go north. Where are you at now? And I had to guide them back to the right road, and I said, all right, now go, you're on GG, go north. You got three miles. And you're not going to see it because at the curve, you got to go down the hill on the two track. And the house is at the bottom of the two-track hill. And you won't see it from the road. And if you don't know it's there, you won't find it. But it's been there my whole life. Representative Holtorf, yes, we sir. appreciate I apologize. the directions uh, that you're giving us uh, to your home. But please you, stick sir. to the bill. I apologize. Thank you for your leadership. But these are real problems in rural Colorado. Wasn't funny for that family. Child killed by an armed farm accident and couldn't get the emergency rescue team there to help. Fatality. Terrible. Terrible for this family. But I'll get back to this study, sir, because I do appreciate you getting me back to the bill. Thank you. <clears throat> In this particular study, it says specifically, it is desirable to have law enforcement agencies bogged in a vast new paperwork morass, especially when most rank and file and harried with lawsuits over insignificant background checks, to have a threatened person face dangerous, sometimes indefinite delays to obtain a self-defense gun. And this is a, this is a dangerous delay and perhaps indefinite. Who knows? 100 days, 120 days, 300 days? Who knows? To set in place mechanisms for de facto gun registration. Oh wait, that's coming later. And political stepping stones to outrun gun prohibition, perhaps. To legislate in disregard of the no prior restraint and less restrictive means principles that should safeguard not only the Second Amendment but the whole Bill of Rights. All these are foreseeable effects of this type of proposal. Alternatives to the waiting period proposal might include a Virginia style instant phone check on the purchaser's background, creation of a firearms owner ID, or adding one's fingerprint to a computerized driver's license, the so-called smart card. For those of you that got to hurt my, hear my uh, ID bill in state affairs, we know that there are smart cards now. But the technology is still to be perfected. <clears throat> These measures are preferable in many respects since they are at least as effective as waiting periods at disarming criminals and are less likely to be used to disarm good, honest citizens. Yet these alternatives, like the waiting period, are subject to evasion by criminals and abuse by government administrators and create serious risks of privacy violations. Ultimately, the Capel study concludes practically and constitutionally these rights are best served by strategies that aim to cut gun crime not by targeting the legitimate retail firearms trade. Get tough on gun crime. For Crown Allot, Colorado, let's get tough on crime at all. Not by targeting legitimate retail firearms trades, but instead by aiming at the black market or criminal activities or criminals and where they get their guns. Now, I just talked about that a little bit. 
public and police opinions are something we're going to talk about in this study, criminological studies we're going to talk about, the waiting period in action we're going to talk about, particularly targets of waiting periods we're going to talk about, problems caused by a waiting period we're going to talk about, constitutional issues we're going to talk about at length, at length, alternatives we're going to talk about, and then there is a conclusion. So let us weigh in, Mr. Chair, esteemed colleagues. Waiting periods, many states already have them. Most national police organizations, most people, and most gun owners may or may not be for them. In the 1970s, even the National Rifle Association supported the idea of carefully crafted state laws that may include a waiting period. So why would law-abiding citizens, like my constituents from Northeast Colorado, gun-toting, beer-drinking, God-fearing, I'm not going to call them that, but they are, and I am, but it has to do with the color on the back of your neck, why would they be so opposed? Why would we be so opposed? What's wrong with you, Representative Holtorf? It's only three days. What's wrong with you? Well, there might be a lot of things wrong with me, but I'm going to tell you why we're so opposed. This paper suggests that sometimes a majority of gun overs and even a majority of all people may not always be right. Just like if this body passes this type of legislation, they may not be right. And suicides won't stop. They won't even stop by guns. With or without a waiting period. Veteran suicides aren't going to stop unless we heavily invest as a society and as a state in mental health treatment. And we get an F, in my humble opinion, in all regards. When we want to get serious about that, and we want to start putting bills on the marquee about that, and we have, but not enough, then let's go. I'll be behind you 110%. Let's do that, but not come after guns like guns are the problem. Our guns are going to stop the problem. Or waiting three days or any number of days is going to stop the problem. Because it's not. And this particular study is going to highlight that. Although HCI backs the new comprehensive weights in California and other states, as if California's got it all right, ultimate goal is an even stronger comprehensive weight. 1990, Colorado State Senator Pat Pasco. Anybody remember him? He introduced a waiting period bill which HCI Chair Sarah Brady called everything on my wish list. So copy in California is not new to Colorado. As in California, a comprehensive background check and a waiting period on both handguns and long guns for all transactions, including intra-family gifts. So does that mean my daddy can't give me his rifle when he's on his deathbed? and say, boy, this is yours now. It's got to wait three days. Seriously? Each gun purchase would require a background check up to two weeks, followed by a waiting period of one week. Oh, here we go, three weeks, 21 days. An applicant would then be given a permit to purchase. Good for 60 days. Well, thank you. Thank you, state government, for allowing me to exercise my constitutional rights. 
like I have to mother may I. Like the state has the authority to tell everybody what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. That's not how we live in eastern Colorado. Nor in southeastern Colorado, or eastern Colorado, and in western Colorado. I promise you, the company I keep, they're not interested. Of course, the applicant would pay a fee up to $20 probably more now, based on the high inflation. There would be an exception for a person who needed a firearm for self-defense. Well, we don't have that. In fact, even if the police strongly wanted the citizen to acquire a gun because of imminent daily, deadly threats, a one-week delay would still be mandatory on this. So why don't we have that? Why don't we have that in this bill as an amendment? And I've heard all the amendments have been rejected, which is really troubling. Another reason we're going to be here for a very, very long time. Why don't we say if there's a person that they're an imminent threat and law enforcement has con con confirmed this, that they can get a firearm without delay? Because their life matters. Does their life not matter? Bill sponsors and members of this chamber? Whose life matters? You want to talk about life? Everybody's life matters. And one policy shouldn't infringe on another's liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this bill infringes on that. If there's a person in harm's way who needs a firearm, drives 80 miles to town to get it, and gets told to go home, see you in three days if they didn't get back to town to do it. Better not be one of my daughters. Better not be one of mine. I'm just saying. The waiting concept, both limited and comprehensive, reflects the belief that there should be a police check before a person buys a gun or some type of check in the form of an instant check. Um, Providing the system is structured properly, and we have that now. Instant check, there's no such thing as an instant check. But there, in, back then, in this time when this was written, there were background checks. Virginia, Illinois, Wisconsin, Florida, Delaware. Um, handgun Control, Inc. accepted the background checks in Virginia and opposed it in Ohio. Since the telephone check is sometimes referred to as an alternative to a waiting period, the telephone check is discussed in this paper. Now that's a bit antiquated. Now we have online checks, they're digital. You get on a web-based application, you fill out all the information, they run it through the uh, NCII or NCIB, I need some law enforcement people to help me out with that acronym. NCIC, thank you, the NCIC check, I believe it's a national database and that is you are checked and determined if you uh, can have a firearm. But let's not forget that if you're a criminal, <laughs> you're not going to a gun store. You'll go to the street, and you'll still get what you want. And that'll never change. Drugs, guns, whatever you want, you're going to get it, because it's there. I continue. This paper discusses the following issues. What a waiting period have stopped John Hinckley in this case. Now, he committed a crime, not suicide. The answer is already no. What do the polls of police and citizens say about the waiting period? And what implications should be drawn from the results? What have the criminologists learned about waiting periods? What good have they done in states where they already exist? If a waiting period could save at least one life, isn't it a good idea? What are the disadvantages and risks of waiting periods? Well, I've already talked to that in my own family and personal experience. I'm not going to belabor that too often tonight. What about police permission systems? These instant checks. Are there meritorious alternatives to waiting periods? This paper also offers suggestions about how a waiting period should be structured. If a legislature elects to enact one. Well, here we are in a state exercising federalism to impose state laws 
on state citizens. Now I want to... Well, I'll go into this a little bit. The National Waiting Period is commonly known as the Brady Bill. It supports, was named after Sarah Brady, the Sheriff's HCI. To many people, the fact that a waiting period would have stopped John Hinckley from shooting President Reagan and crippling his press secretary, Jim Brady, is reason enough to enact such a law. Both the perpetrator and the main victim of Hinckley's attack agree that a waiting period would have prevented the crime. Currently under a undefined commitment to St. Elizabeth Mental Hospital in Washington, John Hinckley has petitioned to be allowed to access to reporters so they can speak out for handgun control and for a waiting period. Hinckley explained that he is in a Valium depression when he acted. Valium depression. There's mental health. Boy, right back to mental health. Was he getting proper mental health? No. How many times have we talked about mental health and getting expanding mental health capacity and getting people the proper mental health they need? So a Valium depression when he acted, a waiting period might have given his better time, better self time to reassert control. But in fact, Hinckley bought the assassination gun in October, months before the assassination attempt. So in this particular argument, a wait would obviously have had no impact. So if you buy a gun, and the argument made by the bill sponsors, well, you know, that one or two or three days, the cooling off saved, would have saved somebody or anybody. That's not true. That's not true. Because if someone wants to, and I'm going to respect the person that said don't say it this way, if someone wants to harm themselves or terminate their life, guess what? There's a high probability they're going to find a way to do it. And don't think that that thought hasn't occurred more than one time in that dark spiral. And more than one way to do it has been thought about. Because they have. And the opportunity might arise at any time in the depths of despair if they don't get help and mental health help. And even when you have intervention, as I told you in a previous story, sometimes you can't stop the successful termination of somebody's life at their own hand. I'll move along here, Mr. Chair. Legislators usually pay little attention to the policy suggesting to policy suggestions of the criminally insane or other mental health issues. The more persuasive spokesman for the waiting period, in this case was Sarah Brady, wife of the man crippled by Hinckley. Had a waiting period been in effect seven years ago, John Hinckley would not have had the opportunity to buy the gun he used, claims Mrs. Brady. But that's not true. He bought the gun months earlier. Mrs. Brady bemoans the fact that Hinckley was able to buy the gun with no waiting period to see if he had a criminal or mental illness record. But Hinckley had no public record of mental illness, hence a mental records check would have done no good. And that's kind of this red flag thing we talk about. Obviously, red flag laws haven't stopped the problem either. But let's pass more of them. As for the criminal records check, a police background check was run on Hinckley a few days before he bought the gun and nothing turned up. Hinckley was caught trying to smuggle a gun aboard a plane on October 1980 in Nashville. His name was run through the NCIC, thank you, Representative Evans, which reported correctly that he had no felony convictions, promptly released, paid his fine, pled guilty to the misdemeanor, Let's ratchet down all those crimes so we can just get a misdemeanor, get our parking ticket, and walk out the door. Although Ms. Brady complains about the lack of criminal mental health checks on Hinckley, she does not explicitly affirm that such checks would have affected him. Indeed, Mrs. Brady's denial explained 
The detailed explanation involved Hinckley's resident status. In 1980, later 1980, John Hinckley walked into the Rockies Pawn Shop in Dallas, Texas, and walked out shortly after with two 22 caliber revolvers. As with the retail purchase of any firearm, the gun dealer was required to complete a federal form which listed Hinckley's address because Hinckley was buying two handguns in the same five-day period. <clears throat> in fact, at the same time, the dealer filled out another federal form. The federal form was sent to the local office of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, commonly known as ATF. By federal law, the dealer was required to verify Hinckley was a resident of the state in which he was buying the handgun. When asked for identification, Hinckley offered his Texas driver's license. Ms. Brady detailed how a background check might have helped. Hmm. Doubtful. He lied about his address and used an old Texas driver's license to purchase the revolvers. He was not even a Texas resident at the time. Now, I believe nowadays he can't do that because there's a more comprehensive system. The police check would have stopped him from buying a handgun in Texas, as she puts it. He lied on his purchase application. Given time, the police would have caught the lie and put him in jail. Well, that didn't happen. According to Mrs. Brady, she states a simple check would have stopped him. John Hinckley might well have been in jail instead of on his way to Washington. Well, that's an interesting idea, because if somebody's in jail, they can't hurt anybody else. Maybe they can't hurt themselves, and maybe we can get them help. Indeed, her assurance that the waiting period would have stopped Hinckley is often unequivocal. There's no doubt that he would not have been able to purchase that gun, or John Hinckley would never have walked out of that Texas pawn shop with a handgun that came within an inch of killing another president of the United States. But the result is hardly as clear cut as is asserted. <clears throat> Hinckley moved around a great deal from one address to another. The Lubbock address he listed on his federal gun form and the address for was the address for a boarding house. It was different from both his driver's license and the address that he currently held. Of course, moving fr frequently is not a federal crime because the only purpose of the driver's license is to prove residents in the state there's no federal requirement that a handgun purchaser resides on the street address and the license. Okay, I have a notice here. Um, so I'm going to, uh, Senator Pat Pasco. Okay, thank you. I'm going to stop here for a minute, and um, I'm going to allow my colleagues to come forward. I do have a very comprehensive report and I would like to ask my leadership to have the opportunity. I'm on page five, and I do want to get to the end of the report tonight or tomorrow morning sometime. So I'm going to suspend this. It's 85 pages. I have 80 pages left to go. But I'm going to suspend this right now, and I'm going to let my uh, colleagues uh, take over this dais. Representative Vigil. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's such an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. So colleagues, I had a whole lot more remarks prepared, but there were some interesting que questions and statements made by my colleague who was up here before me. I asked some really interesting questions about suicide methods that I just, I can't, I can't just skip over the opportunity to address them. I think one of the one of the questions was how many how many are we losing at the end of a, a razor blade or a sharp object? I don't know about the whole state. I certainly don't know about the whole country. I can tell you about El Paso County. I had 176 suicides in 2021, exactly two by sharp force. I asked about how many how many of those completed suicides are coming as a result of overdose of pharmaceutical or over-the-counter drugs. 176 suicides, 22 total. That's like the next most common. Asphyxia, four. Ligature, 30. Couple of other miscellaneous. 114 out of 176 completed with a firearm. 100, that's, that's more 
than all other methods combined twice over. We can go into the homicide rates as well. Those, those are actually even worse. 85% of homicides completed with a firearm in El Paso County. The fact is, the majority of suicides are completed with a handgun for the same reason that the majority of homicides are committed with a gun. It's because a gun is a uniquely lethal thing. And I think we're all adults here and we can say that. Nothing else comes close. You all heard me get up and talk a bit this morning about why this is so close to me that I'm a survivor of an attempt myself, that I've nearly lost a loved one to an attempt. When I say I nearly lost a loved one, I mean that she was minutes from death. Minutes. And the reason she was minutes from death is because the only thing that was available to her to use was not immediately lethal. It took a lot of steps. It took a lot of planning. There was a lot of time for something to go wrong. There was time for her to be interrupted. And even so, there was a whole phone tree that led to that interruption. If the last person hadn't picked up the phone, she wouldn't still be here. It's really taboo in the mental health space to talk about methods of ending one's life. So I, I do tend to be a little cautious about it. But unfortunately, this is why this bill matters. And not just this one, but all other types of gun violence prevention that we that we take on in this chamber and elsewhere, as well as mental health care. And I really hope that everyone who has come up to this well to talk about how mental health care is the number, number one thing we need to do, I hope you will stand with us when we fight for universal access to health care for every Colorado and especially for their mental health, because that is really important. But in the meantime, you can't live to fight another day if you don't live. And there is nothing that someone could use to attempt to take their own life that is more immediately lethal than a bullet through the head. There just isn't. Everything else takes more time. Everything else takes more steps. There's a reason I didn't die in March of 2010, and it's because the only things that were available to me take too many steps. So I had a moment halfway through my attempt to decide that I wasn't gonna do that to my brother and my sisters. And like most other people who have made an attempt, I never tried again. Because 90% or more of people who make one suicide attempt never try again. That's the power of surviving one, just one attempt. If you survive once, you you're almost certainly never going to attempt it again. So I have to look at those 114 deaths in one year in my county and figure to myself how many of them didn't need to go because I look at that other smattering of methods that somebody may or may not have tried, that may or may not have been lethal, that may or may not have been interrupted. And just imagine that any one of them, half of them, a fraction of them, had to wait for a minute. Or they got counseled into voluntarily putting their gun somewhere else for a while. That's important too, we don't talk about that enough. Or that they had a red flag order that separated them from their gun, even if involuntarily, for a short time. It all matters. Nobody thinks this one bill is the bill that ends it all, that gets rid of all the gun violence, that gets rid of all of the suicides, that stops every homicide. Nobody thinks that. But we're going to do this one because it's something that can save some lives. And if it was a loved one of yours, I would hope you would care about that and vote yes. Representative Amable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the comments that my colleague from Akron was making about mental health. And it, it is true that we don't, we don't um, do enough on mental health. Uh, but I want you all to know, and I think you do know, that I, don't, I care about that deeply. And I'm here every day trying to make sure people can get mental health care in a timely fashion, care that's good and care that's appropriate. And what we really need to realign is that right now, it takes you 60 days to get in to see a psychiatrist, but you can buy a gun in three hours. And that has to change. We have to flip this, that equation because 
it should be easier to get care than it sh is to get a weapon that you can use to kill yourself. So I just wanted to add that because I do hope you'll all join me and the rest of my fellow legislators who really care about this topic and help us get more care in our state. Thanks. Representative Soper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you. Members, it's uh, good to be able to come down and talk about this bill. I'm uh, one of those that um, likes to look at an issue and to look at why it's being brought and then the counter arguments. I certainly um, respect the, the arguments that are being brought forward that a delay period stops that impulse by to have the uh, commission of, say, uh, committing suicide. Or... But there's the other side to the argument, which is if someone's been a victim of a crime or a survivor of a crime, they have the right to be able to buy a firearm immediately to defend themselves or to defend their family. And that right should not be infringed. Recently, um, I left Delta at 2 a.m. Uh, to get to the Capitol on time on a Monday morning. And I saw all this police activity in North Delta. And I thought, hmm, I wonder what's going on. Because it seemed like every police car that the town owned was there. And you saw the yellow tape that said crime scene immediately laid out. And it just didn't feel right. And I had to wait till the newspaper came out on Wednesday because we only have a weekly newspaper out in Delta. And it talked about that a man had uh, been shot at, uh, a few minutes before I had driven past. He had been shot around 1.30. He had been shot twice. And he survived. And then the article went on to say that the alleged shooter was still at large and that they were still uh, searching for the shooter. The article explained that they felt like the community as a whole was safe because they felt like the shooter was only targeting this one individual and that there was a, a grudge there. And that one individual who was shot who knows that someone is out there, they should have the right to immediately be able to buy a firearm to protect themselves and to protect their family. Of the 10 other states that have um, waiting periods, all of them have some form of exceptions built in. And it's not absolute. And the ability to say that um, we should be able to have an exception in a case like this. That's why I, I offer amendment L015 and it asks that it be displayed. That's okay. That amendment is properly before us. Please proceed. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to make sure I said uh, I move the amendment and ask for it to be displayed in case I said something else. Thank you, Representative Sofer. That amendment is properly before us. Please proceed. Thank you. So what this amendment says is the sale of a firearm to, a, uh, so it's the list of exceptions, and then it says the sale of a firearm to a person who is a victim of a Victims' Rights Act crime as defined in 24-4.1-3021, and the alleged perpetrator of the crime is not in the custody of law enforcement. So this is the scenario I just described to you. And in case you're not familiar with the VRA crime list, these are the most heinous crimes in Colorado. So we're talking murder, um, homicide, attempted homicide, rape, sexual assault, domestic violence, uh, kidnapping, uh, menacing, stalking. Um, the list is fairly long, but it's also very finite as well. These are the worst crimes that can happen to an individual and the ones that you would never, ever want to dream of happening to a person. 
And in this particular instance, that victim should be able to immediately go down and assuming they pass the background check, because that's still in place, they should be able to purchase a firearm for their self-defense because they're obviously fearing for their life and what more horrors could happen. And I would ask for a yes vote. Representative Armagast. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is what I was speaking of as far as uh, protecting the victims, the victims of violent crimes, the victims of domestic violence, victims of stalking, those that can't protect themselves from somebody that can be a, a perpetrator that could overtake them or catch them off guard, somebody that deserves the right to be able to get a firearm in an emergent situation. This is who we need to be protecting, uh, the people that cannot protect themselves from violent people, mentally ill people, things like that. So this is something, like I mentioned, that we should all be in support of in being able to protect those people that deserve the right to be able to protect themselves with a firearm, not having to wait for whatever arbitrary period of time to be able to purchase or re receive their firearm. They should be able to purchase that firearm to defend themselves on any occasion at any given moment. This would get them that right. I'm in support of this amendment and hope you are too. Thanks. Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also rise in support of this amendment because I've seen this situation happen. The situation I'm referring to happened back in February and March of 2021 in and around the city uh, where I was employed at the time. I forget if I was a sergeant or lieutenant. You all know I was a cop. I don't ever say the name of the perpetrator because I don't think that the perpetrators deserve to have their name said. So I'm just gonna refer to him as the suspect. But the suspect had a domestic violence restraining order against him when he kidnapped his victim earlier this month. So like I said, February, March timeframe and held her captive for an extended period of time. He kidnapped her by breaking into her house on a Friday morning when she was running errands with her brother. When she and her brother returned, the suspect stabbed the victim's brother, uh, I believe it was in the stomach, and then took the woman uh, hostage, basically kidnapped her. It was like something out of a movie. Um, when she was kidnapped, he had her uh, locked in, I forget if she was locked or tied uh, in a room. He had a bunch of things like blow torches in that same room. And when that crime was interrupted, he managed to escape. Uh, fortunately, uh, it was interrupted before he committed any serious harm against her, but he got away. And we spent the next several months looking for this individual who had obviously displayed the intent to premeditatively kidnap, torture, and kill, she, uh, she was his ex. Uh, kidnap, torture, and kill his ex. He was at large for a long time. And she, unfortunately, did not have the resources and did not want to leave her home. So for a few days, she basically couch surfed with friends and family so that we could keep her at an undisclosed location so that she would be at less risk from another uh, kidnapping attempt uh, by the suspect. Uh, and eventually she said, I wanna go home. And we told her, if you go home, you are gonna be in danger. She said, that doesn't matter, I wanna go home. And we told her, well, we don't have the manpower and the resources to protect you 24-7. We'll do drive-bys of your house to try to make sure things are okay, but we can't protect you 24-7. And the perpetrator was still at large. And so if that victim, who had been kidnapped, almost tortured, most likely would have been killed by her ex, if she definitely a victim of a Victim's Rights Act crime. If she had to wait three days in order to get a firearm, in order to be able to defend herself from a deranged individual out there who wants to do horrible, gruesome things to her, I find that to be of grave concern in the interest of protecting a victim. Real story, like I said, I saw it, I worked the case, I helped figure out how we're gonna to try to keep her safe. Ultimately, um, her family ended up having to step up 
and also try to keep her safe. They were the ones that effectively provided 24 seven uh, protection for her for a while. So this is real, this has happened. I've seen it happen. It happened a couple of years ago in a jurisdiction where I was working. Thank you. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I, uh, I want to weigh in on this. This amendment seems to make sense to me. If you've been the victim of an attack, what would you do? How would you do it? If you knew that that individual was still in the community at large, what would you do? We can't spend our lives hiding. This is an exemption that makes sense. It gives the victim an opportunity to at least feel like they would have an opportunity if they were victimized again. And just knowing that you have an opportunity to protect yourself is worth an awful lot. <clears throat> I have no idea what this would feel like. But I do know that I would feel very frustrated if I could not get help for myself. And we have people that are living alone in these cities. They came from countries like mine. They don't have families. They don't have that many friends. And on their own, what are they going to do? Probably part of the problem is they were on their own. You know, I have a daughter that's in her, in her mid-twenties. And she's asked me a number of times, Dad, should I buy a gun? Dad, do I, do I need a gun? Three times she's asked me. And I said to her, babe, you don't need one until you know you've got problems. And now I'm finding that maybe I put her at risk with that kind of advice. Because if she realizes I'm that worried, I'm that scared, I need something and can't get it, then what? And she lives right here in Denver. You know, I'm not here all the time. But if she had been attacked or she'd been a victim, I don't know why we don't think that this is a good idea to give them an opportunity to feel like I feel safer now. We've talked about a lot in this building about they make me feel unsafe with their language or with whatever it is. I don't feel safe. And we've passed bills because of that. That people don't feel safe. Well, here's an opportunity for us to help a victim feel safer. Certainly not completely safe. <clears throat> After you've been through something like that, I'm sure you're going to be a long time before you feel safe. But this is a common sense approach. It's well thought out. Representative Soper doesn't bring amendments that don't make sense. This one makes sense. So from my point of view, this is an opportunity to make a difference in a life that has been damn near wrecked. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. That's been almost wrecked. Let's give them a chance, man, woman, or child. Thank you. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the same way that uh, Rep. Amabile has devoted herself to addressing mental health issues in the chamber, I have put considerable work into addressing issues around victims and working with victims' organizations. And um, I understand the emotional pull of this amendment but uh, the language is actually challenging 
what constitutes, um, how are we establishing the victim and how are we establishing the perpetrator? And those, the, the establishment of those things happens so long after the crime and, um, and certainly understand the impetus behind this, but we're asking for a no vote. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Victim. Victim's rights. Perpetrator. I've sat here for several years now and listened and watched and listened. And here's what's frustrating. This is a good amendment. Darn good amendment. But if the victims, or rather the perpetrator's the victim, then the victim somehow shouldn't be afforded rights. Maybe they're the criminal some strange way. <clears throat> when you reject this amendment, then you obviously don't understand victims that victims have rights that need to be protected. Or maybe victims' rights and the Victims' Rights Act that clearly highlights that victims have rights. Maybe you refute that. Maybe you don't care about that. Maybe you don't care about victims' rights. Maybe they're not that important. Representative Holtor, please don't impugn the motives of members of this body. I'll just talk in general terms. Do victims have rights? Should we support the Victims' Rights Act? Do members of this body understand that the Victims' Rights Act is to protect victims? And the amendment specifically states that. <clears throat> One of the reasons crime is so high is because victims' rights are infringed upon all the time when we don't deal with perpetrators of crime, who in many cases are criminals, and they're not the victim. I don't think the Victims' Rights Act is supposed to help the perpetrators or the criminals, but boy, we'll go a long ways to help them. Now let's talk about this amendment. The sale of firearms to a person who is a victim of a victim's right acts crime. And the alleged perpetrator of the crime is not in the custody of law enforcement. Boy, if that's not a domestic violence opportunity, I don't know what is. Yeah, look at it, people. Look at it close. Get up there and study those letters. Victims, victims' rights, victims' rights act. Something to try to help victims. A perpetrator, perhaps somebody that's violent, abusive, for those women or men in here that have been victims of abuse. Maybe had their lives threatened. Wouldn't you want this? Let's be honest. I sure know my five daughters would want this. And so would their father, and their mother, and their grandmother. Anybody in Colorado, the father or mother of any child, adult child, who's facing domestic violence would want this. Give them some grace. Oh no, we're not going to have your amendments, none of them. Why? Why? Do victims' rights not matter? If you vote no on this amendment, 
Representative Holtorf, again, please do not. That may be the interpretation. I'm not inferring anything, Holtorf. but that may be the interpretation that someone might infer. Now, I'm going to step away from this because I think my blood pressure is going up. But I tell you, I care just as much about my daughters as anybody else cares about their children. And they should have the same right and respect. And their rights should be protected. And their lives should be protected. And nothing speaks to that more, Colorado, and gentlemen and ladies in this chamber, than this amendment. Boy, if you can't see that, I don't know what you can see. Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to state for the record that law enforcement is going to know on scene within a couple of minutes as to whether or not the victim is covered under the Victims' Rights Act. We have pamphlets. We have victims' advocates. Those victims' advocates are going to respond on the scene. We're going to be giving pamphlets that cover their rights and privileges under the Victims' Rights Act. Typically, that same, you know, the very first time that we respond out to that scene there. So this information here uh, about whether or not this person is a victim of a qualifying VRA crime, that's going to be known within a matter of minutes to hours of the of crime being reported to law enforcement. So I just wanted to state for the record that's something that's known almost immediately. That's not something that's determined later on during the court process. Thanks. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In response to my colleague from El Paso County, who implied we didn't by saying, I'd hope you'd care, we do care. We do care very much about the ideation. We care very much about life. There's a lot of problems with this bill that don't involve caring. What we're talking about here is we're talking about victims, we're talking about victims' rights. We're talking about whether, whether that victim's life is as important. I'm not really sure what's not clear about this amendment. Does it not correspond to the original intent of preventing victims? This amendment is very clearly intended to take away what we would have thought was the unintended consequence. We identified it. There's a weakness in the bill. That's why these bills come to the floor. In theory, it's a deliberative body, not a rubber stamp. We look at the bill. We're talking about putting something into law. We're talking about putting an infringement on constitutional rights that has no historic basis, that has lots of constitutionality against it, besides history, besides language. We're just saying, why don't you, let's just moderate this bill and prevent some more victims. Let's read about some victims. My name is Peggy. I live in Loveland, Colorado. I'm actively involved with training and educating women regarding firearms usage and safety. It's very important for women, homogametic individuals, if we have to go that way. The firearm is intended to equalize the application of force, whether that's against a perpetrator or against the government. I'm a facilitator for a girl and a gun which is a national organization that promotes and encourages women to get firearms training in a safe and non-judgmental environment. I'm passionate about the Second Amendment and the right of U.S. citizens to own and use firearms. I'm testifying in opposition to 1219. Approximately three years ago, I was taking my dog to the groomers in downtown Loveland. I pulled their, into their small parking lot and got out of my car to drop off my dog. On the way back to my car, the man in the car next to me began to yell obscenities at me. I had absolutely no why, and before I got in my car, he got out of his and started towards me with pepper spray. I yelled at him and told him I was going to call him, call 911, and he said, go ahead and call them. I took a photo of his license plate, got in the car, and drove away. I was absolutely terrified and didn't stop shaking until I got home. I contacted the local police who said it was an assault and that they would arrest him if I pressed charges. After discussions with an attorney in fear of the repercussions, I decided to drop it. However, it impacted me in a negative way. 
During this instant, seven, several bystanders saw what was happening, including the grooming shop owner, and no one offered to help me. We are truly our own first responders. I have a chapter of Girl and Gun in North Colorado of nearly seven women, ranging in ages from 18 to 87. In addition, I have taught many women in my women's handgun and self-defense class and the stories they share regarding stalkers, angry ex-husbands, boyfriends that have threatened them and their children is mind-boggling and tragic. These incidents prompt these women to want to protect themselves with a handgun, either as a concealed carry or home defense. Probably a lot of the women that are, a lot of the individuals, probably don't want to go and get, they probably wait if they don't want a handgun in general and they wait until the last minute. And then they wait until the last three days, the last 10 days, the last 30 days. How long? We don't know. Because the intent of this bill was stated that localities will be able to make it longer than three days. Three days is intended to be a minimum. So any reference to this bill being called a three-day waiting period is just purely a rep misrepresentation. I have taught many women and the stories that they share regarding stalkers, ex-angry husbands, and boyfriends that have threatened them and their children is mind-boggling and tragic. These incidents prompt these women to want to protect themselves with a handgun, either as concealed carry or home defense. Both of these overreaching bills, also referring to 169, limit the ability to purchase a gun, a three-day waiting period, again, a misnomer of what this is about. There are many single moms in Colorado that are under 21. Their constitutional right to protect themselves would be stolen. Responsible gun ownership and gun safety should be the focus of the legislation instead of taking away the rights of law-abiding citizens. You will leave guns in the hands of criminals with this bill. You will remove guns from the hands of law-abiding citizens with this bill. After a series of mass public shootings throughout California last month, despite an incredibly strict gun laws and gun and control laws, Governor Gavin Newsom, a Democrat, blamed Second Amendment, lamenting to a reporter that the right to keep and bear arms is becoming a suicide pact. His anti-gun re rhetoric ironically came during an interview, which he obviously was protected by several well-armed members of the California Highway Patrol, just like we're protected here. We're protected here by numerous people. Representative DeGraff, I'll remind you that discussion right now must be directed at the amendment. We're talking about, thank you, Mr. Chair, we're talking about the uh, victims. Police officers are exempt. Newsom's disdain for an armed defense didn't extend to the very special people like himself. Almost every major study has found that Americans use their firearms in self-defense between 500,000 and 3 million times annually. According to a 2013 report by the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, in 2021, the most comprehensive study concluded that roughly 1.6 million defensive gun uses occur in the United States every year. How many of those are inside the three days? How many inside the 10 days? How many inside the 30 days? How many inside the 60 days? How many inside the 90 days that this bill intends? This bill is not about three days. Maybe, it, maybe it'll be about three days here, but it won't be about three days when it leaves. And what matters is how this bill is written and this bill allows it to be greater than three, three days as has been specified. Representative DeGraff, to the amendment, please. The incidents below show a small portion of the news stories in defensive. January 1, Philadelphia, in the potentially first media verified defense of Ghana use in 2023, the police said a woman with a license to carry a firearm shot and wounded a man who assaulted her during an incident of domestic violence. January 3, California, concealed permit holder was attempting to assist a driver whose vehicle had been stuck when the driver became angry retrieved an axe from the trunk, took a swing at the Good Samaritan, the permit holder, shot the axe wielding in self-defense. January 9, Georgia, police said an armed robber who tried to hide his face under a pair of women's panties under, entered a combined gas station and convenience store, pointed a handgun at the clerk. What he didn't know is that all three customers inside were legally armed. Working together, they disarmed him. 
Florida, police, are, police said that a man who was angry over lost property began shooting into a bar at closing time while multiple patron, patrons were employed inside. One patron who had a concealed carry permit heard gunshots, ran towards the door, and fatally shot the gunman before anyone else was harmed. A well-known social media influencer lived, living in what was described as a heavily secured neighborhood awoke to find two armed intruders in his bedroom, what police believe was a targeted attack. The intruders physically assaulted him and shot him four times in the leg, but he eventually was able to grab his own gun, defend himself. He exchanged fire as they fled. When a disgruntled customer at Applebee's restaurant slashed an employee across the face with a steak knife, police said an armed diner with a concealed carry permit intervened. To protect himself and his customer, police said a gas station employee shot and critically wounded a masked man who tried to rob a station at gunpoint. The employee was able to draw his gun after the customer briefly distracted the robber. A concealed carry permit holder shot and wounded an armed robber and threatened him and other passengers on a subway train during rush hour. Although his weapon jammed four times, the permit holder fired 18 rounds during the gunfight. The robber, a longtime felon with 32 arrests since 2014. 32 arrests. Why was he? It's 2023, 32 arrests since 2014. Maybe the problem isn't the gun. Maybe the, import, maybe the problem is something different. Spartanburg, police said that an armed driver returned fire after a 19-year-old shot at him during a road rage accident. New Mexico, a woman fatally shot her husband in self-defense after he beat her and threatened or kill her inside a business they owned. The night before, the couple had an argument. A concealed carry, January, Florida, a concealed carry permit holder returned home to his girlfriend to find two intruders in the kitchen. The homeowner drew his gun and fired five rounds at one intruder, striking him four times before fleeing with his girlfriend and calling police. Responders found the wounded off, wounded, a convicted felon near the home, trying to identify the lo and the locate the second intruder. In response to the shooting, one should expect that if you're brazen enough to enter one's home and residence, it is not yours with intent to commit all unlawful acts. Excuse me, Representative DeGraff. Members, it's starting to get loud. Could you please keep your conversations down? Representative DeGraff. Thank you, sir. Unlike California Newsom, Governor Newsom, Gorick understands that the right to keep and bear arms isn't a suicide pact. Most Americans who are faced with violent threats don't find themselves surrounded by taxpayer-funded bodyguards who are exempted from the state's burdensome gun control laws. When their lives and livelihoods are on the line, they often only have themselves and the right to keep and bear arms to depend, depend on their own offense. So the weapons, the guns, the means of self-defense have been maligned as being used for crime, for being used for suicide. Millions of times per year, millions of times per year, these handguns are used for the lawful protection and to prevent this. So this, this amendment that just says we need to protect the victim's rights and get inside that 60-day window, 90-day window, whatever, whatever they decide it to be, these people need to be protected. I urge a yes vote on this amendment. Members, I will remind uh, all of us that there are rules against impugning motives and implying that people do not care about victims is impugning motives, so we will not tolerate that. Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So since this amendment talks about the Victims' Rights Act, I figured I'd give a little bit more uh, detailed information about how the Victims' Rights Act is actually applied uh, when these crimes are reported. So as part of their training, police officers are required to go through a whole bunch of training on the Victims' Rights Act, the Victims' Rights Amendment, and what crimes qualify under the Victims' Rights Acts and Amendments. Most, if not all, law enforcement agencies, as uh, part of the requirements of the Victims' Rights Act, also have pamphlets on hand that list all of the qualifying crimes and that also list the response, or the, excuse me, the rights and the privileges of folks who have been the victim of a Victims' Rights Act. So when a crime is reported that might potentially fall under the Victim's Rights Act, what happens is law enforcement is dispatched out to investigate that crime. 
when law enforcement gets on scene and they start collecting their information, whether the crime happened you know, mere moments ago or whether this is a crime that uh, has taken a little bit of time to report, law enforcement will collect all of the information that they can to figure out what actually happened here. Do we have a crime? Do we not have a crime? The standard for determining whether or not a crime can be charged is probable cause. So if, after conducting their investigation, law enforcement has probable cause to believe that a crime occurred, the next thing that they're going to do is say, hey, this crime that I have probable cause to believe that it occurred, is this crime a VRA qualifying crime? If it is, in fact, a VRA qualifying crime that the law enforcement officer has probable cause to believe occurred, they are required by the Victim's Rights Act to provide information to the victim of that crime. That information includes, but is typically not limited to, providing the pamphlet that talks about their rights um, and uh, excuse me, privileges under the Victim's Rights Act. Law enforcement agencies also either employ or contract with victims' advocates. Victims' advocates are non-law enforcement uh, individuals that are familiar with the Victims' Rights Act. They also have connections to a lot of the different resources that they can provide to victims. So if you have a woman who is a, a, a victim of domestic violence and needs a safe play to place to go, Law enforcement would contact a victim's rights advocate, and that advocate would either respond to the scene, contact the victim by phone. There's a, a whole different uh, variety of ways that it can go, but basically that victim's advocate will be put into contact with the victim of the crime. That victim's advocate can then help get that crime victim the resources that they need. They can get them to a shelter. They can get them food. They can get them emergency clothing. If there's a kid involved, they can get a car seat to transport that kid. If uh, a cell phone was broken, they can help get them a mer an emergency cell phone. The victim's rights advocates have a ton of resources in order to comply with all of the requirements of the Victim's Rights Act and to actually help that victim I say the night of, even though these things could happen in the daytime, but most of them in my experience happened at night, that can immediately provide resources to that victim. This whole process is creating a paper trail. You're gonna have a police report that clearly stipulates that the Victim's Rights Act was met, that threshold was met, that victim's rights services were offered if a victim advocate responded, and then even if the victim of this crime did not want to have a victim's advocate respond, or they did not need any services, that law enforcement officer is still going to be required to forward the contents of their police report to the victim's advocates. So you're gonna have a minimum of two paper trails. You're gonna have a law enforcement police report that has all of this information that they're required to put in there, because if they don't, then they get jammed up for not complying with the Victim's Rights Act. So it will be in the police report that VRA was triggered and that services were offered. And then it will be forwarded on to a victim's advocate who would then also have a paper trail. So in order to comply with this amendment here, all we have to do is ensure that a victim is presenting one of those two paper trail options, either the law enforcement police report that's gonna say that VRA was triggered, VRA services were offered, and whether or not the victim chose to accept them or not. Or the victim's advocate can also vouch for the fact that, hey, I was either notified of this, I responded to the scene, or um, if the victim did not want those resources provided, the victim's advocate will at the very least be made aware of this event so that the victim's advocate can also make sure that that victim has provided the resources to which they are entitled under the Victim's Rights Act and Amendment. So the whole point of this explanation was that yes, there's gonna be a paper trail. That paper trail is going to be created pretty much the day that this crime uh, was reported and that that paper trail will reside both in the law enforcement report and also with the victim's advocate. Thanks. Representative Froelich. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, folks, there's not a single victim's advocacy group that came in testimony that advocated for this. We asked for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
So I just wanted to follow up on this, <laughs> that the Victims' Rights Act was put into place in order to protect the rights of the victims. And I think that it's important that we have this discussion to ensure that those victims' rights are being considered. Thanks. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I find it somewhat callous to note that no victim rights organization Representative DeGraff, showed up. Yes, sir. Please don't characterize the choices of others. Just speak to the policy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was told I don't care a little while ago, so I thought we we're on uh, different terms now. But I Representative DeGraff, if I hear someone say that you don't care, I will make sure to correct them as well. Thank you, sir. I fail to see how it's immaterial or that a victim's rights advocacy group did not show up about this. There are victims. There are, there are victims. There, there are clearly victims. This is an easy solution. This is a very easy solution to make sure that the victims that we know are in Colorado, that maybe they don't even know they exist yet, don't have their lives deprived of them while they're waiting to be granted by this body their Second Amendment rights. It's a very significant We've talked about the level of violence. We've talked about it's, 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 this is an easy, this is an easy amendment. There are victims. We know that they're victims. They, our constituents expect us to speak on their behalf. We shouldn't need to have victims show up here to relive their victimization, to advocate for their Second Amendment rights. Because this body swore to uphold their Second Amendment rights. This body swore to uphold their Second Amendment rights, their Fifth Amendment rights, their Fourteenth Amendment rights, and every other amendment. This body swore to uphold and protect. So why would a victim decide that they need to come here? A victim needs to come here to, to make sure that you're doing what you told them that they were going to, that you would be doing? That's ludicrous. This is an easy amendment. It's an easy amendment to make sure that people who need the help the most in a time of crisis don't become additional statistics in support of an ideology. It is starting to feel, it's ironic to me that it is pretty clear, well, it seems, I shouldn't say it's clear, it seems that this amendment violates the original intent of the bill. I ask for a yes vote on this amendment to protect these victims. It doesn't degrade the bill. It doesn't degrade the degradation of the Second Amendment. Just support the victims. Vote yes on the amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L-15. All those in favor, please say aye. A division has been requested.
The question before us is the adoption of Amendment L-15. A division has been requested. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please be seated. All those in favor of Amendment L-15, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count is taken. You may be seated. All those opposed, please stand and remain standing in one place until the count is taken. You may be seated. Amendment L-15 is lost. Is there further discussion on House Bill 1219? Assistant Minority Leader Puglisi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pro Tem, um, I'd like to move L-04 to House Bill 1219 and ask that it be displayed. L was it L-42? I apologize. Um, I move House Bill L04 or Amendment L040 to House Bill 1219 and ask that it be displayed. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Um, this amendment uh, gives an ex exception or exemption for the sale of a firearm to a person who has been the victim of a sexual offense. Um, I think it's really important that we do talk about, we just had a lot of great conversation around victims and making sure we protect victims' rights. I'm incredibly concerned about victims of sexual offenses and giving them the ability to um, be able to purchase a, a firearm if they wish, if they choose. I don't know why we would take that right away from them um, to do it within those three days. Um, and so I'm asking that we think about victims um, of rape or violent sexual assaults. Um, it's not a question of how long should they wait. It's really a question, rather, of if they can wait. And so I'm asking for an I vote on this amendment. Thank you. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It is honor an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. I, I stand in favor of this amendment. This is a serious matter. When we are talking about someone who has been victimized, who is a victim of a sexual offense, they are extremely vulnerable. And waiting periods can prevent those vulnerable individuals from accessing firearms for self-defense. I think that we've heard enough testimony this evening about the importance of being able to defend yourself and how it is a right in this country. There are situations where someone is in immediate danger and waiting periods can be deadly. Victims of domestic violence, for example, may be in urgent need of a firearm 
and a waiting period can prevent them from obtaining the means to protect themselves. We have got to stand up for these individuals and make sure that they have the ability to be safe. Representative Bradfield. Thank you. I also rise in, in appreciation and support of this amendment. Um, the vulnerable woman at that time doesn't know always what she needs, but she, if she figures it out that it is protection for herself, she should be allowed to um, purchase that protection. And so I urge an I vote on this amendment. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Representative Holtorf. Mr. Chair, members of the chamber, I think it's very important because this is a very serious matter that we all understand that this particular amendment speaks to Victims of a sexual offense described in Part 4 of Article 3 of Title 18 of Colorado Revised Statutes. And at this point in time, I believe it's important that we understand the full context of this section. So I have before me Title 18. I have identified Part 4 on page 506 if you all would like to follow. Now this is an extensive section, Mr. Chair, but I would think it's important that all of us understand what's at stake here. Part four of Colorado Revised Statute, unlawful sexual behavior. Now there is an editor's note Mr. Chair, do you think it's necessary to read that? You're much more versed at this than I am. No? If you're asking my opinion on what you should read, that is not the purview of the chair, as long as you stay within the decorum rules. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will review and scan this to see if it's relevant to the importance of Part 4, Unlawful Sexual Behavior, of Colorado Revised Statute Title 18, sir. It is my opinion that it is not necessary to read. Is there further discussion? Yes. Please continue. There's a list of definitions here. There's a list of uh, Defendants, charges, annotations, sexual abuse, perpetrator's motives, distinction in numerous intimate parts, semen does not constitute, eject, I'm not going to mention that, striking of a person, consent, non-consent, jury, patterns of sexual abuse, two phrases in the sexual contact. Mr. Chair, I believe that this is so divisive so contentious that maybe it's not a good idea that I read this. This is some terrible stuff. Terrible things. With respect to victims of sexual offenses. But the reason I rise up here is to point out the totality of this and how ladies and gentlemen Another amendment brought forth by my Republican colleagues, which they're going to talk about, I believe, and I will defer to the ladies of my caucus.
Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I wasn't planning to um, speak yet, but because of some issues, I guess I'm the next up. Um, bear with me. I hate this amendment. I hate the idea that this bill would require a woman to enter into a gun shop and express her sexual history in order to be able to protect herself. But that's what this bill puts us. Nothing that has been shared so far today that I've heard suggests that people purchase a weapon within, and then within three days commit suicide or a violent crime. I haven't seen those stats. I've looked for them. What I've found is that if you have a gun in your house, you have a statistical um, a greater chance, even though it's unclear because we don't have proper documentation, of possibly killing yourself with that weapon. But nothing that I've seen, and please correct me if I'm wrong, if there are studies out there that show the opposite, please bring them forth that, that say directly that this bill will accomplish what it seeks to accomplish, i.e. that people go and buy a gun and, and within three days they, they use that gun as opposed to one that they already have in their home. This, however, I find a lot of support for. The idea that a woman who has just been raped goes out and purchases a weapon in order that that same violation does not happen again. That is a reasonable correlation. And yet under the bill as currently written, we say to that woman, I'm sorry, you're going to have to wait. And for those three days, hopefully you can find a space that you feel safe in. We say you're right to defend your life is limited in these ways because we've arbitrarily decided that somehow three days will, it will work in some way because we have to do something. This amendment says we recognize you victims of sexual assault and we want you to be able to protect yourself. And so we'll give you an exemption to this bill. But in order for you to receive that exemption, you have to demonstrate that you are a victim of that crime. That's despicable. And so I find myself up here conflicted because I, I hate the idea. This is why our principles matter. This is why it shall not be infringed, because who gets to make these decisions of where these lines are drawn? These things are life and death indeed. They're life and death indeed. I don't think anyone wants to just spend hours upon hours reading and discussing for the sake of reading and discussing these are things worth grappling with. It's not time wasting. This is our job. We have to figure out, is this policy workable? And is it workable for the population that the bill sponsors intended to support? But we are people who represent vast constituencies. Stated another way, we are called to love our neighbors, all of them, all of them. Write them all out, all of your neighbors who will be impacted by this bill. And ask yourself, have we struck the right balance? Those are hard questions, and I don't think anybody is taking that lightly. But how do we respond to these women? What do we say to them? I would much rather say to them, 
You can go and get whatever you need to protect yourself, dear one, without having to lay out what has brought you to that counter. That would be my preference, that that right to protect herself is just granted. But if this body isn't going to recognize that God-given right, then perhaps we have to put her in that horrible position of explaining why she needs an exemption to that three-day waiting period. And maybe there, as other customers are looking at items, we say, yep, you need to explain. What are we doing, ladies and gentlemen? What are we doing? Thank you. Is there, is there further discussion on the amendment? Representative Amable. Uh, we urge a no vote on this amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L40. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Did I just hear a division? Okay, I apologize. That we had started to call the vote, but I think you caught me just barely in time. So a division has been requested. The question before us is the adoption of Amendment L40. A division has been requested. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please be seated. All those in favor of Amendment L40, please stand and remain standing, or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count is taken. You may be seated. All those opposed, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count is taken.
You may be seated. Amendment L40 is lost. We are back to the bill. Is there further discussion? Seeing none. Is there, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hands. Which of you would like to rep Assistant Minority Leader Puglisi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Um, I move L041 to House Bill 1219 and ask that it be displayed. Thank you. And one quick note, I, I appreciate the use of the full fancy Latin title, but actually technically you can just call me Mr. Chair when I'm in this position over the cow. Thank you. Thank you. Always the amendment is properly before us. You can proceed. Uh, thank you. Always so much to learn. Um, and before I go into this amendment, I do want to say for my, to my colleague from Boulder um, how I do understand how difficult it is to find mental health services for your child. Um, I've been struggling with that for over a month. And um, I do feel for you because I'm in a lot of this. I understand a lot of what you're going through. So I just I wanted to put that on the record. Um, <clears throat> however, I don't think that this bill will address those issues. This amendment says this, it's an exemption again for the sale of a firearm to a person who's a victim of domestic violence offense. Um, I want to read this story. Um, and she says that she's a domestic violence survivor and mother. Her abuser put her through mental, physical, and sexual abuse for an entire year before she left and pressed charges. He tried to kill her on numerous occasions and had a violent record and even previous domestic violence charges. When she finally had the strength to press charges against him, she learned that the justice system wasn't there to protect her or her family. She's had a total of three domestic violence charges against him and a total of six protection orders throughout the last year, and they've given him chance after chance, released him from jail, and he has been a habitual domestic violence offender. Um, he was only given 120 days with fines waived as opposed to the class five felony of one to three years in prison and up to $100,000 in fines. Going through all that made her realize that she, it was up to her to protect herself and to protect her family. And so she purchased a firearm and worked with amazing instructors to receive proper training and obtained her concealed carry permit. She does still have a protection order, but realizes it's just a piece of paper. It is so hard to know that you're a target. It is really hard to live in fear every day, but today may be your last and that you need to protect your children. And the system often will not protect us. Again, this is not a question of how long to wait, but rather if we should wait. Thank you. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In 2021, statistics published by the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence in Colorado, there were 91 deaths related to domestic violence. 88% of domestic violence victims were identified as female. 90% of perpetrators were identified as male. Just more than half of the fatalities involved couples who were currently or formerly dating, while 48% were among married couples. A little more than one quarter of those couples were broken up or estranged at the time of homicide. In the United States, on average, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. During one year, this equates to more than 10 million women and men. One in four women and one in nine men experience severe intimate partner physical violence, intimate partner contact sexual violence, and or intimate partner stalking with impacts such as injury, fearfulness, post-traumatic stress disorder, use of victim services, contraction of sexually transmitted diseases. One in seven women and one in 16 men have been stalked by an intimate partner during their lifetime to the point in which they felt very fearful or believed that they or someone close to them would be harmed or killed. Disturbing new numbers released this month from the Colorado State Attorney General's office show, again, 91 people, victims, and perpetrators died in 2021 in domestic violence-related incidents in Colorado. It's the highest number of domestic violence fatalities in the state since 2016. News 5 Maggie Bryan dug deeper into the report and the recommendations are given to legislators to hopefully lower those numbers. Colorado Attorney General's 
Office released the latest domestic violence fatality numbers this month, showing disturbing statistics of those killed in 2021 and recommendations for legislators to address the problem moving forward. In 2021, 91 people died in domestic-related violent incidents in Colorado, the highest number since 2016. Of those, 45 were primary victims, 32 were perpetrators, and 14 were collateral victims. The youngest fatalities was one month old and the oldest was 91 years old. 88% of victims were women, while 90% of perpetrators were men. In four out of five fatalities, the perpetrator used a firearm. My point to this amendment is, if we don't protect women that have an imbalance of force from their male counterparts, we are doing them an injustice. My stepmom tried to leave her first husband and was beaten to an inch of her life. She was in the hospital with a newborn baby with police standing outside. She deserves the right to protect herself. And I know a lot of you have gotten up and said, this doesn't happen very regularly. I will tell you with a broken jaw and multiple rib fractures, she will tell you that it does. And she deserves to be able to protect herself. Thank you. Representative Bradfield. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, today I'd like to read an article that was published in 2019 in the local news. I'm sorry, I don't know whether this is newspaper or um, television, but it happened right here in the Commerce City, Colorado. It's not long, it won't take me long, but it's very impactful. A local real estate agent survived an attack by a man she was showing an open house to in Commerce City. At 11.30 a.m. on Sunday, real estate agent, leaving her name out, and her realty company, pulled up to the condominium for her scheduled open house. This realtor had been in the business for 14 years. As she turned on the lights at the home, a man knocked at the front door. He said he was interested in the property. He was asking all of the right questions about how long it had been on the market. We talked about loans and what he might qualify for, the realtor said. Cornered in the master bedroom, the realtor said the man laid out a knife and a six inch rope. He wanted me to take off my ring and go into the closet, and at that point, his intentions were deadly, in my opinion, she said. Fearing for her life, the realtor drew her handgun that she was licensed to carry. As I drew my firearm, and he saw that I had that, he doused me with pepper spray, and at that point, I could not see I could barely see. My skin was burning. My eyes were on fire. So I fired. Police say it's unclear if the bullet hit the man, but he was spooked and ran off. My primary purpose is to capture this man. We want him off the streets so we can live in a safe society, the realtor said. My life was in danger. And if I did not have my firearm, I would not be here today. Meanwhile, the realtor hopes to encourage other realtors and women to be prepared for the unthinkable. I've heard about fearing open houses. The realtor said, I don't live in fear. I live my life in faith. Faith trumps fear. For my fellow realtors, we always here, take two to an open house. Two is not enough. You need to know what you're going to do in any circum certain circumstance and be able to act on that. For my fellow women out there, every woman has experienced some kind of trauma. And if you are, have not shared your story with police, and perhaps it needs to go to the police, then share it. There's healing and sharing. Um, if that woman had not come to her open house prepared for 
an, uh, a scary situation, a frightening a death potential, she might would not be here today. If we do not protect the women, the vulnerability that can happen and allow them to um, not have the uh, three-day wait time, um, we are not serious about their rights to be protected. I urge a yes vote. Thank you. Your second. Representative Frizzell. Representative Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You all know it's a distinct honor of mine to represent House District 47, but also rural Colorado. And as we do some research, we find out that domestic violence fatalities occur disappropriately in rural Colorado. Gilpin, Baca, Route, and Montezuma counties have the highest rate of domestic violence fatalities per capita. In our counties, we don't have domestic violence shelters. We have groups like Ada that work hard to help women that are in bad situations. <clears throat> but we don't have the resources in rural Colorado that you all have here in the cities. That's part of, and I'm gonna echo uh, my good friend from Akron, the urban rural divide. There's things that, that we lack in rural Colorado. And to find out these statistics that women in rural Colorado face more domestic violence and perish from domestic violence more per capita than in the urban center, it's eye-opening. I think it's something we should all think about. If we look at this amendment here, I think we should really think about it. As a good representative said earlier, it's a shame that we even have to have the discussion about some of these things. And put women in a position to where they have to say things to somebody so they have the right to defend themselves. As we sit here and we debate an unalienable God-given right that in my opinion we shouldn't be debating. Like I said earlier, it seems like in this chamber we use the Constitution when it suits an agenda. I don't even think we should even have to be up here speaking about amendments to this bill. But if we have to get up here and try to run amendments to protect women in rural Colorado, well, I'll take on that fight for them. If I have to stand in this well all night, I will for him. So I urge you all, we hear it all the time, a Colorado for all of us. Let's work on a Colorado for all of us. Colorado for all women. I urge an I vote on this amendment. Thank you. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I stand tonight for women, for the women in my life, the women around me, the women of Colorado. Because we know statistically, Mr. Chair, domestic violence occurs predominantly against women. It's ironic that it's Women's Month. We've celebrated Women's International all these things for women this month. It's ironic that we have these celebrations, we stand here, but then when it comes down to really putting our money where our mouth is and we can do things to help women, that we reject these amendments as if they don't matter. I find that ironic. But what I wanna do now, Mr. Chair, Let's talk about why this amendment is so important. You see, there's an organization, even in little old Washington County, even in my rural communities, it's called Well-Armed Women. Well-Armed Women. In fact, in Washington County, 
the county commissioners that are in my county, one of them isn't a woman. And you know who's the president of Weld Armed Women of Washington County? My female county commissioner, who I've known my whole life and have great respect for. And she cares about women and women's rights, and that's why she does the program she does. Because she knows in rural Colorado, if you want to defend yourself in a domestic violent situation, if you want to protect yourself at all, and there's not loved ones or siblings around, or a male around, you might need to be a well-armed woman. Because if you've heard me say before, and I will say again, God takes care of those who take care of themselves. And sometimes you're alone in rural Colorado, and you're a woman, and you have to take care of yourself. Because the emergency responders are hours away. Hours away. So I will tell you, these amendments respect women. They respect women's rights. They help women. They empower women. They lift women up to protect and defend themselves from the very thing that is in this amendment, Mr. Chair. Domestic violence. And I've got some stories here, and I'm going to start telling them. Because I think it matters. Because in every one of these stories, the outcome is domestic violence. But there's one exception, ladies and gentlemen. There's one exception that changes the outcome of the story. And I'll let you wait for that as I begin. In this story, I've been working in the night shift, says a woman, for several months. So I had turned into quite the night owl. I decided to go to the Walmart around 11 p.m. for some milk and some other necessities. I'd pay for the items, and I was walking down the parking lot to my truck when a man approached me holding a large pocket knife. He told me to get my wallet and give it to him. My wallet was in my purse, so I reached in slowly as if to retrieve it. But what he did not know was I had my gun in my purse as well. I drew on him and told him it might be a better idea to walk away. He did. And when I made it to my truck, I locked myself inside and called the police. I was able to give a full description and they found him only 20 minutes later with a couple of other women's wallets. Domestic violence against women. And a few hundred dollars of their stolen cash. Thankfully, I did not have to pull the trigger. He certainly thought he had the upper hand preying on women all that night with his knife until he met me. What changes the outcome of that? Are you trying to videotape me, ma'am? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We can get you copies if you like. Now, now we're talking about women, we're talking about protecting women, sexual assault, domestic violence, domestic violence offenses, another good amendment. Let me tell another story. In August of 1980, I was asked if I would drive to Houston to pick up a friend. At the time, my vehicle didn't have air conditioning, so I opted to drive at night because of the extreme heat in southern Texas. And for those of us that have been to Houston in the summer, it's dang hot. Africa hot. 
<clears throat> as in the movie Biloxi Blues, for those of us that remember the movie. It's a good movie, by the way. To the amendment. Yes, sir. <clears throat> on the way about 4 a.m., my vehicle broke down on the interstate. I proceeded to push my vehicle into an exit ramp when a car stopped behind me. This man got out and asked if I needed help. He offered to pull my vehicle to a service station just off the ramp. When he got there, the station was closed, so he offered to take me to the all-night donut shop until the station opened. I said I would just stay with my vehicle. He said it was not a very good part of town. He would feel better if I went to the store. He said it would be safer. At that point, he said he, was, he had six sisters and would want someone to help them if they were broken down. So I believed him, and I got into his vehicle. I asked where the store was located. He gave me the directions to the store, and off we went. After we had driven about a mile, he asked me how old I was. Then I knew I was in trouble. I reached down and took out my 38 Special and just held it down right between my legs. As we reached the intersection, he made a wrong turn. I said, you went the wrong way. Sir, he didn't respond. He just continued to drive. We reached another intersection. He took a left and the pavement ended. I said, just stop and I will walk back to my vehicle. He slammed on the brakes, grabbed my blouse, pulled me over to him and said, not until I have me some, I'll spell it, S-E-X. Domestic violence against women. Actually, it was the previous. I should have read this on the previous amendment. For those of us that are paying attention, that applied more on the previous amendment than this amendment. Talk about wanting to help women. Boy, these amendments sure would help them. <clears throat> now, he grabbed my blouse and pulled me over to him and said, not until I have me some you know what? I raised my hand with a 38 and said, get out of the car. He said, you have a gun? Then I screamed, get out of the car. After he got out of the car, I took his heart back to the interstate and went past my vehicle looking for something that was open. I can't tell you how far I drove, but probably not more than a mile or two. Now I'm going to stop right there. What if that woman wouldn't have had a gun? What if she would have had to wait three days for a gun and couldn't get a gun? What if you didn't pass this amendment and she was a victim of this because you didn't want to do this and this was Colorado? What would have happened to that woman? I think being raped might have been the least of her problems. The least of her problems. Except for one thing. It's called a firearm, an equalizer. There's women in this chamber that understand that. Representative Holtorf, yes, remember sir. what we were talking about, about describing whether or not people understand things. Please proceed. Yes, sir. Thank you for your leadership. <clears throat> when I found a store, I asked the lady in the store to call the police for me. And then the state patrol got there and heard my story. He said, you should have shot the son of a bleep. I didn't have to have a concealed weapons permit, but never went anywhere without my gun. When the cop took my handgun, I told him I did not have a permit to carry, but I would pay fine for having it because I was alive. Thank God I was alive and paying the fine was a small price to pay for having my life and not having been raped. After everything was finished and I was released to leave, he unloaded my gun and handed it back to me and then said, be careful with this, ma'am. I said, yes, sir, and thanked him. As I departed the police station, I reloaded my gun and placed it back in my bag. 
Shortly after that incident, I got my first concealed permit. I have been well armed and legal for the last 24 years. The moral of my story is this, and these are not my words, these are the words of a woman. If I had not had protection, I would not be here today to share this story with you. Oh, by the way, I found out later that the man had raped someone two weeks earlier and was just out on bail. These are real stories about that cashless bail and all this other mess we do in this state. He went on to court and got 12 years for rape and intended rape against me. I still don't feel justice was served. Now I'm going to finish talking at the request of my leader. If I haven't made my point, ladies and gentlemen, there is no way I ever will. This is serious stuff. If you don't think that firearms don't protect women, if you don't understand the importance of these amendments, Holtorf. then we have a problem. Representative Amable. I ask for a no vote on this amendment. Seeing no, seeing no further question, I'm sorry, I hear you. Seeing no further discussion, a division has been requested. The question before us is the adoption of Amendment L-41. A division has been requested. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please be seated. All those in favor of Amendment L-41, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count is taken. You may be seated. All those opposed, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count is taken. You may be seated. Amendment L-41 is lost. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment L-020 to House Bill 1219 and ask that it be displayed. The amendment is properly before us. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The sale of a firearm to a protected person as defined in section 13-14-101 for whose benefit a protection order was issued while the protection order is in effect. I'm going to read this unless all of you have memorized this statute. 
Protected person means the person or persons identified in a protection order as the person or persons for whose benefit the protection order was issued. Protection order means any order that prohibits the restrained person from contacting, harassing, injuring, intimidating, molesting, threatening, touching, stalking, or sexually assaulting or abusing any protected person or from entering or remaining on premises, or from coming within a specific distance of a protected person or premises, or from taking, transferring, concealing, harming, disposing of, or threatening harm to an animal owned, possessed, leased, kept, or held by a protected person, or any other provision to protect the protected person from imminent danger to life or health that is issued by a court of this state or a municipal court, and that is issued pursuant to we have to protect women that have protection orders in order to save their life. Thank you. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's really important to understand that what is being discussed in this amendment, a protection order, you don't, you don't get one of those out of a gumball machine. You don't get a protection order on the back of a cocktail napkin. This is something that's issued by a judge who, has, who you have gone before and made a request because someone is threatening you. The judge, similarly, does not grant a protection order lightly. So why is this important? Why is it important that you be able to obtain a firearm as quickly as possible because you have gotten a protection order and a lot of times the, peop the, the person who is being restrained from your proximity ignores it. Just like a domestic violence situation, these people are not always calm, cool, and collected. They're angry and they want revenge. I stand before you asking for an I vote on this amendment. Representative Armagast. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I too stand in agreement with this amendment. As we all know, a protection order is a piece of paper. If anyone has ever had to use a protection order, if you actually felt like you were safe and you carried it around in your pocket, like it was going to protect you from any, anyone doing you harm, I'm sad to be the one to inform you that that's not the case. A piece of paper is not going to protect you. This is something that can protect you in court. This is something that can protect you by being able to contact law enforcement if there's a violation of this. But again, being a former sheriff's deputy in a rural area with the sheriff's office, knowing that your response could be up to an hour and a half or more away from you, this will not protect you you are going to have, God knows what happened to you in that period of time, unless you are protected. But if you have to wait three days or five days or 365 days to get that firearm that you need to protect yourself, that, that piece of paper is not going to protect you from, you need a firearm. You need to be able to get that immediately to protect yourself. I'm in support of this bill for the people that need it more than they need a piece of paper that's going to protect them. Thank you. Representative Winter. Support of the amendment, not the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm also in support of this amendment. Um, recently I had some constituents reach out to me from Pueblo County, and I actually had an interview the, the day we were sworn in. It was about a woman that she had numerous protection orders against her boyfriend, husband, and uh, he found her and murdered her in a big lots, in Pueblo, Colorado. So I think it's important, I mean, this just happened within the last year. I think it's important that we look at amendments like this. Like I said earlier, I hate to stand down here and have to fight for amendments like this when we look at one of our God-given unalienable rights. But I, I rise in support of this amendment, and I ask you to think about it. Thank you. Representative Amable. Uh, we ask for a no vote on this amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the question, did I hear a division? Okay, a division has been requested.
Okay. The question before us is the adoption of Amendment L20. A division has been requested. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please be seated. All those in favor of Amendment L20, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count is taken. You may be seated. All those opposed, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count is taken. You may be seated. Amendment L20 is lost. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to call for a brief recess. The committee will stand in a brief recess.
The committee will come back to order. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Move that the committee rise, report progress, beg leave to sit again at 12.05 a.m. on Friday, March 10th. Uh, Madam Majority Leader. Oh, wait, never mind. I apologize. You're exactly right. Sorry. You have heard the motion. Seeing no objection, the committee will rise report and ask leave to sit again at 12.05 a.m. on Friday, March 10th. The House will come back to order. Mr. Schiebel, please read the report. Madam Speaker, your committee of the whole reports as follows. It has risen, reports progress, and begs leave to sit again at 12.05 a.m. on Friday, March 10th. The committee will sit again at 12.05 a.m. on Friday, March 10th. Mr. Schiebel, reports of committees of reference. Committee on Business Affairs and Labor, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1196 as amended and Senate Bill 78 be referred to the Committee of Whole with favorable recommendation. Committee on Education, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1191 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. House Bill 1211 be postponed indefinitely. Committee on Energy and Environment, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bills 1161 as amended and 1210 as amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Committee on Finance, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1054 be postponed indefinitely. House Bill 1186 be referred favorably to the Committee on Appropriations. Committee on Judiciary, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bills 1178 as amended, 1199 as amended, and 1206 as amended be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. Printing report. The chief clerk reports Printing following. report will be printed in the journal. Delivery of bills to the governor. The chief clerk Delivery of, of bills to the governor will be printed in the journal. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to lay over the balance of the calendar until Friday, March 10th. Seeing no objection, the balance of the calendar will be laid over until Friday, March 10th. <laughs> Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move that the House stand in adjournment until Friday, March 10th at 12.05 a.m. Seeing no objection, the House will stand in adjournment until Friday, March 10th at 12.05 a.m.